Hello and welcome to the Recommender course. In this one, I'm going to show you how to build a recommendation engine using Django, Celery, and machine learning. Now we're going to go into the nitty gritty of all of those things in the walkthrough and requirements in the next video. In this one, I just really want to talk about what it is that we want from an application. Right. So when you have your users on there, you want them to actually use it and gain a lot of value from this. So early days of building web applications, it was all about like saving things and storing stuff in a database, retrieving that information. Now, what we're starting to see is a shift towards also recommending and curating things automatically based off of a user's preference. Now, that brings us to this course. This is using collaborative filtering. What collaborative filtering does is essentially say, hey, all of these users rated things the same way you did, or they watched as much of these videos as you might have. And then the pieces that are missing, like if they've rated a few more videos that you haven't rated, it's going to go ahead and predict that fact that you might like it as well. So if you think about this in terms of like your friend group or your peers at school or at the office, either way, there are a few people that you can go to and say, hey, what do you think of this? And the reason you can do that is because you have some common bond into the way you think about things. I mean, there's a lot of features that go into what that could possibly be. And what machine learning tries to do is figure out what all of those features are and then give recommendations to anything that it is that you're looking at, right? So in this case, we're going to be building it where it's about movies and rating movies and getting some automated recommendations for that. But the important part for us is really how do we orchestrate this whole thing? The way we actually do recommendations in the future is going to improve over time. Right now, what we are concerned about is how do we even get it working on a real web application that we could put into production? That's the biggest question that we want to answer in this series. So my name is Justin Mitchell. I'm going to be taking you through this step by step. If you have any questions, please let me know. In the very next video, we're going to go through a walkthrough of what it is that we're going to be building specifically and all of the experience that you might need and all that. Thanks so much for checking it out and look forward to seeing you in the course. So now let's go ahead and talk about the requirements and then go through a quick walkthrough of the final project that you'll end up building. Now, first and foremost, I assume that you have some Python experience, like you know how to make classes and functions, and you could probably do some basic math, string substitution. That's like the minimum that you would want. Now, if you don't have that, check out my 30 days of Python course, um, but really just like the first 15 days of that, just, just some of the basic fundamentals of Python. Next, having some Django experience is highly recommended because I don't go through everything related to what you need in the basics of Django, although I go through a lot of it. So even if you don't have that much Django experience, I think you should be okay. So like your first Django web project, that course is one that I recommend uh, or try Django 3.2, either one. Using Celery, which is a worker process that we'll end up doing. This is kind of in tandem with Django. They sort of work hand in hand together. Uh, Celery is a Python application that will allow us to run our different workloads whenever we need to. So having experience in that could be helpful, but it's not required. Using the course Time and Tasks 2 really goes into it in a lot more detail than we do here. Although what, we, what you'll see here is a very practical imp implementation of using Celery. So with that in mind, um, there's a few other ones that you might consider, like try pandas, like learning a little bit about Python pandas and doing uh, some data frame manipulation with that. Um, and then other machine learning classes that we have, like try Keras and the Hello World of Machine Learning probably could be helpful as well. So that's it for the requirements that you really need to get this one going. Um, as far as the actual walkthrough, let's actually take a look at it running. So here it is here. It has a very basic template on here called Bootstrap. I go over just a little bit of it to get it usable like this. Um, but one of the big things about this is we use Bootstrap in tandem with a library called HTMX. So HTMX is fantastic. Um, it allows you to have dynamic HTML and write no JavaScript. 
So typically, or traditionally, if you had a button like this, so pick a rating uh, and you wanted it to be four, traditionally, that would be done with a lot of JavaScript. Maybe not too much JavaScript, and if you're good at JavaScript, it wouldn't take very long, um, but we don't touch JavaScript at all, and we're able to have this dynamic rating system. Now, the other part of this, which is really cool, is if you go into movies, also sorting things. Uh, we'll definitely go over this as well. So this sorting happens through HTMX and, of course, Django, right? So the Django project com if you're not already familiar with Django itself. Um, and the idea here is giving a very dynamic interface for our users to really just be able to just rate things because we want to make it easy for them to rate things. And also after they get done rating things, easy to see things that they have rated, right? So if you come in here and we just pick one, saw, never saw it. <laughs> so I'm gonna go ahead and rate it. And then if I do a quick refresh in here, I get a whole new set of items that are being suggested to me. Now, the vast majority of things in here I have never heard of, and I think it's because there's so many movies and the data set we end up using is just grabbing all of these movies in here. So that's where this data comes from. I didn't make this stuff up. It's actual movies that were released somewhere out there. Raiders of the Lost Ark, I know that one. I'm gonna give it a big five. And then Batman Begins, another one. I saw that just a second ago. Looks like I lost it. Okay. Um, and so that is, just generally speaking, some of the features that are part of the user interface. Now, we also have this thing called an infinite review, which is still using HTMX, but it's also very, very Django heavy. And it just gives us random things that we can just continue to review. So if I change one, uh, I can just go through and review things. Uh, you could you could imagine this being fairly useful for a variety of other things that you might want to actually have a user going through, like if they're swiping through things. In this case, we're just doing a rating, of course. And then also popular, going off of popular views, which happens to be, again, from the data set that we'll end up using. Um, so to start out, we actually generate a lot of fake data, and that's, that's something that we'll end up doing. And we also have some basic authentication stuff in here as well. Um, because the core of this is to build the recommendation engine of this. So before I jump into the celery portion of this, I will say all of the code is on GitHub. This will be linked in a lot of places, but if you just go to cfe.sh slash GitHub and look for the recommended recommender course, this is what you'll find. I also have a getting started guide for this entire project that you can just do right now. So if you want to just clone this or download it and go through this guide, uh, by all means do that and you know, start off with um, actually building out the project itself. If you are gonna go off of this guide, just skip the getting the checkout start part because this, uh, the latter part of this is really for um, actually building the entire project. Uh, nevertheless, uh, so that's the code. And now let's actually take a look at, at like sort of what Celery allows us to do. Um, so inside of Celery, we can have these periodic tasks, right? So I can do a daily model inference. So this is gonna train the model every day, uh, or rather give the predictions from the model every day. Um, and it's done through this schedule right here. This is a cron schedule, and it looks like it happens at 4.30 a.m. every single day based off of that cron tab schedule. Uh, but of course, we have other kinds of intervals that we can set. Like in this case, it's every 1,800 seconds. It's gonna go ahead and you know update the movie rating average. So this, of course, is the rating average that you see right here. This is an average that's calculated and then stored in our database. I also show you how to calculate it and then just display the calculated version every single time. So I show you the inefficient way of just calculating it and also the efficient way on how to do it as well, uh, which I think is great. So Celery is this worker process. So if we take a look at it on our terminal, we have one run server running and then one celery process running. So the celery process will continuously run. It will, it will always be going. And the nice thing about it is the data itself is actually stored using a Redis database or a Redis data store. This of course is just for celery. What that means is the Django project can actually insert data into the Redis data store. And then if celery is not running, it can actually 
come back online and run all of those old things, right? So um, it's definitely a queue, a, like a, a nice long list of things that we actually put into the Redis database that Celery will start to pick up. And this is a huge thing for our recommendation engine because of the training portion, right? So when we wanna actually train a model, the actual end model that will do the predictions for us, we wanna do that on some sort of interval. Now, what we have here is everything's done locally on a CPU, but what you could do is have it trained externally on a GPU, so it's a, a different kind of machine learning model. And all of this is set up to be able to switch out to different models as you see fit. And also, if you get third-party APIs that eventually do this, this will be really ready for that as well. Because doing machine learning well takes a village. It does take some time to get really, really good results. Um, so we end up using a lot of great third-party, like third-party developed packages out there uh, to really make this all happen. But the idea here is we wanna be forward thinking and be able to adapt to uh, you know, machine learning models and how they change. And we definitely end up doing that in this series. So Celery is really the glue that kind of brings this all together for us uh, because the actual model itself, the actual prediction and inference itself um, is, is fairly straightforward. So first of all, we are gonna extract the ratings. We kind of load in the ratings um, or we add this data loader to be able to use the ratings, which is what we see here when we go to train it. Uh, this is the whole training process right here. And then we export the most recent model, we save it, and then we actually use that on Celery. So Celery does also batch inference as well. We don't do the inference in Django. You could do it in Django, but the thing is, when we say do it in Django, uh, that usually means do it in the request response cycle. So I want you to imagine for a moment, if I was in this light of day here and I went to rate it, let's say I, ran, I rated it a three, Imagine if that trained a brand new model. And then I go to Rosemary's Baby, never seen it, heard it's frightening, and I change that to one. Again, it's gonna, tr it's gonna train a whole new model. That's not efficient at all. In theory, you could do this, but it's not a good idea for a number of reasons. One of them being how long it takes to actually train a good model on a lot of data, right? That's why we actually offload it to a worker process to do it other time, right? So Django itself is really just, loading in a trained model and then running that trained model. And that trained model can be all kinds of models. It does not have to be anything related to recommender, uh, but it's it's called batch inference. It's doing this batch training. Uh, and that's a big part of this as well. So batch training and then batch predictions or batch inference. But the thing is what I did, this is, this is not in the video, but it is something that is available on the GitHub. Um, I don't show you how to do this specifically, but I show you how to do a lot of other things just like this, so you can absolutely adopt this as you see fit. Uh, but what we've got here is a command that I can use to actually do the training, right? So right now this is an asynchronous command. So what it did was it offloaded it to my Celery process and that's what's happening here. And if you've done machine learning at all, you'll know Epoch's going this fast is mind blowing. That's because this is a relatively simple machine learning model, although very effective. Now, of course, if I were to train this again by just running python-manage.py train, it will train a brand new model for me, uh, which is which is fantastic, I think. And if we look in here, we see all of these new models, right? So I run it again. It will continue to add new models in here um, as, it, as it builds out new models. So we're actually seeing also a timeline of models being changed and uploaded and all that. Now, right now it's working on a local CDN is what I'm calling it. But if you actually went a step further and used something like Django storages to upload it to AWS S3 or many, many other storage options, um, this would actually work. It, it works the same, same way. Um, so, and, and, I mean, that's why you also have another reason to have it on the worker process is to when you do train these models, you, they actually go up in live and um, live somewhere that's, that's useful. So that's the training portion. The actual suggestion portion is this command right here. So we got Python manage.py recommend and then so on. Um, now, before I go into that, like I said, these aren't actually in the series itself, but rather the things that build up them are. So this function right here, absolutely in the series, we talk a lot about it. This train function also in the series, we talk a lot about it. And these commands are very, very straightforward. Um, you will definitely understand this by the end on how to build this yourself. And like I said, the reference is on GitHub, so you can try that out. 
Uh, but what this does is it'll actually make a bunch of recommendations. So use that previously trained model, the most recently previously trained model, the one that ends up being here on latest. And then it'll make these predictions and then it'll store it in our database. So if we go into the Django admin and we go down to suggestions, these are all of the suggestions that it's making for us. So it's making them for other users. And if we search, we can search for our specific user and it's gonna be our specific user's recommendations in here. And right now there's only 1300 out of all of the possible movies for this particular user. Now those will start to be added as we, you know, big, do bigger training. And also we have more things that need to be actually recommended to this user. Um, so that's something else that's pretty cool about it. And you'll, you'll learn that as well. Um, but the general idea here is having the ability to just fundamentally make this whole system. Now I'm, I'm like cruising through it. So there's definitely a lot to it. And I go through every aspect of this with a few exceptions, but as far as the actual functionality is concerned, I go through all of it and you'll even know how to rate things randomly and stuff like that. So if we look at our ratings here, this ratings model, something else that's really cool about it is just looking at any of them, right? So if you just clicked on one, let's grab Reservoir Dogs, for example, we've got a CFE user here, that's my user. And I have this thing for content type. So what this particular rating model is showing me that I can actually rate any kind of Django model. It doesn't have to be movies. You can rate a rating, you can rate a suggestion, you could rate a session, you could rate a user. This is very, very flexible and allows us to do all sorts of cool things. And then we've got a drop down rating for like what actual value we would end up rating this, this particular thing. So this could also just be like or dislike, or you could think of these values as different kinds of reactions. Like we see on a lot of social uh, sites these days, like Slack, for example, you can do emoji reactions. You could just change this to being that exact same thing. And that's something else you'll definitely learn in this one as well. Um, so there's definitely a lot to it and there's a lot worth going into. Um, it's definitely as comprehensive of a course as it can be while still being like very tightly narrow to building the recommendation engine. I didn't want to go through everything possible because then this would be like a 35 hour to 70 hour course um, because we would have to cover just so many things uh, beyond this that you might want to look into yourself. Uh, but anyways, that's the uh, walkthrough of this. I realized it's a little bit on the longer side, but um, hopefully it gives you like a, a really good sense as to what you're getting into uh, prior to jumping into this. Uh, it is in depth and I do recommend um, that you take the time to like really understand what's going on or do the opposite and just go as fast as you can and then just redo it. I've I, so many students have told me that that process of going as fast as you can and then redoing it really puts things into context, especially when it's as dense of a project as this one is. So let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. Um, this one is like, I think we have a foundation here that's going to last for some time, regardless of the Django version or the Python version you end up using. Um, so, uh, unless Django changes dramatically over the next few years, which I don't imagine it's going to, or Celery changes dramatically over the next few years. Again, these are fundamental tools. So everything that we cover in here should, should last well into, I would say 2028, maybe even 2029. But of course there's going to be a bunch of tools that come out between then and, and now. Uh, which is 2023. Uh, but anyways, so yeah, again, if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, let's get into the next one. All right, so where do you get help? First and foremost, write a comment underneath the video that you have a question about, or just keep it to the course itself, right? So if you have a question in general, you can ask it on this particular video. If you have a question about a specific video, if you get caught up in a specific video, let us know in that video. Now I will say before you ask questions, a lot of times it's a really good idea to research what an answer might be. Now, to me, going and looking at the code often solves a lot of the challenges that you might end up having. So if you go to cfe.sh slash GitHub, go under the repositories that are in there, look for the recommender repository, of course, that's for this class, and go into the code here, right? So there's all kinds of things that you could do to really just clear up what's going on with your project. Now, specifically for this course, you can actually go to the start or the end of any given lesson and actually see what the code looks like at that time. So let's say for instance, you just finished lesson 12, you would just go to 12 dash end, and this is what that code looks like. So there's hopefully very little nuance into what the code actually is 
and what you would end up using. Um, so main is gonna be the final end all be all. And then there's another one for start, which is where you'll likely start when, when it's mentioned in the video. Um, so that's where you can get a lot of clarification I think, and it also helps you be able to jump around if you watch it later. Now, of course, I'm also experimenting with this discussions tab on a lot of my courses for any given repo. So feel free to make a discussion here. I'm very curious to see how these discussions play out in the long run, if they'll end up being fruitful. We will find out and we will know over time. So that's it for getting help. Of course, if you have any other questions or anything like that, let me know in the comments. Otherwise, let's get going. Now let's go ahead and set up our project. Now, of course, what I'm gonna be doing is cloning this repo right here using Git. Then I'm gonna go ahead and create a virtual environment in Python. Then we'll use that to install our requirements. And then of course, creating this project in Django and then adding it into VS Code. All of these things are fairly straightforward and all of them are in the readme with the exception of creating the Django project. Now I'm also gonna be testing out Redis to make sure it's working with Docker. That's pretty much all we'll be doing in this one. So feel free to skip ahead if you know what I'm talking about here. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about and all that's confusing, this might be a little bit too advanced of a course for you. And you might consider one of our more beginner Django courses. But if you're ready to keep going, let's go ahead and do that. Now, what I'm gonna be doing, of course, is cloning this link right here. So be sure to copy it if you don't already have it copied. And then we're gonna go ahead and create a directory that we wanna save it in. So to do this, I'm gonna do make dir tilde slash dev slash projects, and then I'll cd into tilde slash dev slash projects. Now, this these two commands actually work on Windows and Mac, and assuming that you're in either terminal or PowerShell, I also assume that you kind of already knew that. Let's go ahead and clone this project with git clone, that project name, hit enter. And if I list out in here, I see recommender, no surprise there. We're gonna cd into recommender. And I'm gonna go ahead and do git checkout start. Now this is on purpose because this is the exact code that I want all of us to have. It's got the requirements file in here, our VS Code code workspace file, as well as a Docker compose file. The key things are really only the requirements and Docker Compose, and really just all of us setting this up the exact same way. So the first thing I wanna do now is use Python 3.8-m VEMV VEMV. So I'm creating the virtual environment with Python 3.8. Of course, if you're on Windows, you're probably gonna to have to do something more like Python 3.10 or 3.8 or whatever version of Python that's older than 3.8, and you would do something more like that. Okay, cool. So with the virtual environment activate, or actually there, let's go ahead and activate it with source VEMV and bin slash activate. And then we'll go ahead and do the python n pip install dash r requirements.txt. We should probably also install pip itself or upgrade pip itself because it'll probably tell us to do that anyway. So we might as well do it. Okay, so while that's running, I'm also gonna go ahead and open up VS Code. So in my case, I actually have the recommender project right here already, but I'm gonna go ahead and open up VS Code for the temporary one that I'm working off of, which is what we're all doing right here. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up a folder and I'm gonna navigate into dev, projects, recommender, and I'll go ahead and open this up, okay? So this opens up that new window for me and I wanna cl click on the recommender code workspace and I'll go ahead and open this on up. And there we go, we've got a virtual environment. I'm on the start branch still. So what, in other words, I actually haven't changed anything related to Git just yet. And so if I do git remote dash V, I can see that I'm still connected to the remote there, which is actually not what I wanna have, but we'll solve that in a moment. For now, what I wanna do is activate my virtual environment. Again, depending on your system and run pip freeze. At this point, I should have Django installed and notice it's 4.0.7. Now this is because of Django Celery results. I would actually prefer to use a newer version of Django, but Django Celery results requires a older version of Django. This is so we can actually track 
all of the things related to our worker processes that will come much later. But of course, we need to set it up now. And the reason I have requirements like this is because I would imagine sooner or later, Django Celery results will support Django 4.1 and then whenever 4.2 is out and so on. So this was one of the biggest reasons to actually all of us working on the exact same project. Okay, cool. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and start my Django project. First, I'm going to make the directory SRC. I'm going to navigate into that directory and then we'll do Django-admin start project CFE home period. So I'm going to make the project inside of SRC and I'm calling my project name CFE home so that at any course in the future, CFE home is going to be where that settings module is as well as URLs and WSGI. That's just to simplify things for us now and in the future, by all means, feel free to change that to whatever project name you want to call it, like recommender. But it also makes it less confusing between the project root where all of the code is and the actual Django project. Uh, it's less, a lot less confusing there because then I could just say, hey, go into the CFE home folder instead of go into the recommender folder. A um, little bit more spe uh, specificity is nice and can go a long way. Okay, so the last thing that I want to do as far as the code is concerned is I want to actually make my own repository here. So going back into GitHub, already signed in, I'm going to go ahead and go to new repository. This one, I'm going to call it CFE-recommender. I recommend that you do the same, and it will be very clear in just a moment as to why. Then make sure that it's public. This is so that we can all review it. Leave all of the other things blank. I'm assuming that maybe some of you already know this and some of you aren't that familiar with Git. If you're not that familiar with Git, it's totally okay. I'm not going to be using it a lot in terms of the course itself, but I will show you a really easy technique on how to use Git for your own purposes. So we're going to go ahead and create this repository now. And so the only thing that really matters to us is this remote right here. So what I want to do is back into VS Code, I actually want to remove my Git repository that's in here. To do this, we're going to do rm-rf and .git. Okay, Windows users use it a little bit different. I think it's just remove dir.git, and that will remove it as well. So once you do that and do git status again, we, well, we don't actually have a directory in here because I'm in the wrong directory. So let's go back again and remove that git directory here. And now if I do git status, I should have nothing. Okay, cool. So this is the important part. I was on the start branch. I only have this code. I basically only have this starter code, if you will. And so now what I'm gonna do is run git init and then git commit dash m or rather git add dash dash all and then git commit dash m and then my project, save that. And then I'll go ahead and add in that remote that I should have copied right here. Paste that in here. Go ahead and run a git push you hit enter, oftentimes you'll see this. So let's go ahead and set the upstream as that as the default. So you can just run git push. This pushes into the main branch instead of the start branch. Now this is on your own repository. Now this is critical. I think it's really important for you to start working off of your own project once you start building bigger ones. And yes, this project, the recommender project is a lot bigger. It's a much bigger project than some of the basic ones that I have that are out there. So now that you have this project, let's go ahead and go back into the Coding for Entrepreneurs recommender. And I want you to go into discussions here, click on share your project or look for share your project and actually click on it. And hey, here's my project code and go ahead and add in the link there. There are shortcuts for the markdown. Then you can go ahead and preview it and just hit comment. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because I am going to spot check some of your actual projects randomly and give suggestions. This will happen, well, much later after you write this comment because I want to give you time to learn the project itself. That is actually why I hope that you actually put your, you know, project in this discuss discussion. Now, the reason we call it CFE-recommender is so that we can all search for these things. I can search in all of GitHub for CFE-recommender, and there is, well, the one I just created. But hopefully by the time you're watching this, we'll see a lot more of them out there, and we'll be able to actually review what other techniques some of us are doing and other kinds of projects that we're doing. Now, granted, I do think that most of us will have the same code, but every once in a while, you never know, you might actually learn something new 
from somebody else because I really do hope at some point you start to divert to make your own recommendation engine and not the one I have. Great. Okay, so for the vast majority of us, we can actually go to the next part. Now, if you have Docker installed, then you can just test the Docker uh, file or Docker compose.yaml here. We will do this again, uh, but the point is that my Redis URL will be Redis local host and 60, uh, 6380, just like that, instead of the standard 6379. And the way I do that is by running Docker Compose up and then in detach mode. So feel free to do that if you want. Uh, but at this point, I now have my project set up. It's ready for our next step. So yeah, let's go ahead and actually start faking data now. Now this course is all about leveraging Django as a machine learning pipeline orchestration tool. The first thing is getting the actual data from our actual users. Now this is something Django already does really well, right? So you can sign up users, you can have them vote on things, you can give get preferences, they can share posts, they can do all sorts of things there. Django already does that really, really well. Now preparing the data, there's a number of techniques to get us ready for training within just Django, and then maybe using a tool like Pandas, Python Pandas, to do even more preparation. And then finally, we're gonna go ahead and train a model from that data. This is not gonna be done with Django, uh, exactly, but it's going to be done using Django and Celery. Both things will help orchestrate this to actually use something like Keras or PyTorch or many other machine learning algorithm, you know, trainers that can actually train the model itself. Django and Celery, again, are going to be used to orchestrate that process. And then finally, we're going to use that model on new data, again, using Django and Celery. But of course, the big thing about this pipeline is we have a problem, and that is the cold start problem. We actually don't have data yet, right? So with no data, how are we supposed to prepare it and train it? Well, it's impossible. So what we want to do here is I actually want to generate a bunch of fake data. So we'll start with a Django management command to create fake user data. And it's not fake in the sense of like, how test data is destroyed, it's gonna be actual saved data in our database that we will actually use for our fake ratings and then finally for our fake training. So all of this data is gonna be roughly fake with the exception of the actual thing that we'll be you know, uh, rating on, which is gonna be movies. So the actual movies will be real, but everything else will be pretty much fake. So that's gonna be how we approach the cold start problem. Now, as soon as we start getting users, if we do this part correctly, then guess what? We won't actually have as bad of a cold start problem, although it still will be there because we're doing something that's very collaborative called collaborative filtering, which by its nature actually has that cold start problem sort of built into it. So there are a number of techniques that we'll talk about. The course itself is much more about this than necessarily having a great model itself, um, at least solving completely solving the cold start problem because I honestly don't know how you would solve the cold start problem uh, unless of course you use a pre-existing model that's out there, which you totally could, um, but using that pre-existing model isn't gonna be on your user data anyway, so still having that cold start problem. I'm happy to explain that a little bit more, but this is sort of the idea as to what we're gonna be doing here. So now let's go ahead and actually start coding. Now we're gonna go ahead and generate fake user data. So to do this, we're gonna jump into VS Code. We're gonna open up the terminal, make sure your virtual environment is activated. We'll navigate into SRC. The first thing I wanna do is make migration. So Python manage.py migrate. I also wanna create my super user with create super user. And we'll go ahead and do that. It doesn't really matter what the password is because you could always just delete the database. In fact, the entire project itself I should be able to delete the database and essentially do everything all over again from scratch from an empty database. That's the point of this and using fake data. So with this in mind, I now have a database and a super user. I'm gonna go ahead and create a utility function to actually create fake profiles. So inside of CFE home, I'll go ahead and do utils.py. And I wanna import one package first and that's from faker, we're gonna import the faker class. And we wanna just do fake equals to faker. 
Now to create a fake profile, it's simply just fake.profile. It's really that simple. So if we jump into the Python manage.py shell and paste these things in, we actually get a lot of data in here from just the fake profile. This is the only data I'll end up using. Now you could also use it to generate passwords. You can do all sorts of cool things with this. I actually don't care at all if these users have passwords because they're not real, right? So if I was generating a fake username for a real person, then maybe I would care about it. Uh, but in this case, it's not. Okay, so what I wanna do then, of course, is have some sort of way to iterate multiple times to actually build this same data. In other words, I wanna have a four underscore in range of some count, let's just say 10. And in this case, I wanna print out that same fake profile. So I'll go ahead and save it and I'll run it. Actually, let's go ahead and just do two for illustration purposes. And so the very first one is we've got a email of jerry82 at Hotmail and then email of james79 at Yahoo. And if we run that again, I'll paste it in again, there's a chance that it might be almost the same data, if not exactly the same data. So one of the ways to get around this is by using faker.seed and having some sort of random integer in here. Okay, so without using the shell too much, let's actually just start using this whole package and build out our utility function. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define a utility function called get fake profiles. Okay, and we'll pass in accounts, let's say for instance, like 10. Now we'll end up using a lot more than 10, but having 10 as the default is I think a nice number. So then the range itself can come in here and we'll just run the range just like that. And so now I'll go ahead and just say profile equals to fake dot profile. And then my actual user data, this is where we'll have an individual user data and we'll go ahead and say username and that's profile dot get username. And then we'll go ahead and do email and profile dot get email. And then I'll pass in a Django specific thing called is active and just say true. You don't have to pass this in, but this is also where you could potentially make a password. And I'll just go ahead and give you some code that you could use for that password. You could just do make password and make password is a built-in function that you could use in Django to then make this fake password if you wanted to do that. I am not gonna do that at this point, but I will leave it just like this. Okay, so now I've got this data. I'm gonna go ahead and say user data being an empty list here. I'll go ahead and append this data and then we'll just go ahead and return it. So we'll return that user data here. Now I'll jump into the Python manage.py shell again. And now from CFE home.utils, we're just gonna go ahead and import everything. And we should be able to do this make user profiles now. And it should give us profiles with usernames and so on. Now you notice that email is none, right? So it's actually not email. That's not the key value, but rather it is mail. There is probably a way to get email in some sort of generation function with Faker, but we'll just use mail. The other thing is perhaps you wanna actually put their name on here. So the other part we could do is say if name in profile, then we can set the first name and the last name. Now these are the standard field names for the Django user model, right? The only reason I would actually set these is just to, you know, make the data just that much more clear that it is essentially a fake user. But realistically, all we really need is probably just the usernames and we should be okay just with that because after we use this data, it's gonna create a row, an actual instance in the database that we can use. So I don't even need this name part, but I like doing it. So I'm gonna go ahead and do F name and L name equaling to profile.get name and then dot split of a space in there. And I'll go ahead and do up to two, two values here. So if we scrolled back into the names itself, we could come in here and we see name Julian Davis. That's of course a fake name, uh, but I'm just splitting that up to being first name and last name. 
just like that. Great, okay, so now I, of course, I can just exit out of here and we'll try that again. I'll press up a few times and run it. And now I've got usernames, emails, active, first name, last name, and so on. Cool, just a really easy way to generate some fake data that we can use. Now, of course, what I wanna do is run Python manage.py load or loader and then users and maybe like a count of 10. That's the actual command I wanna run now. So to do this, we need to make a custom Django management command. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and create a custom Django management command to add our fake user data. So to do this, I need to create an app first. So we'll go ahead and do Python manage.py, start app, profiles, and inside of CFE home, inside of settings, we'll go into installed apps here, and we'll go ahead and add in our profiles here, and I'll just call these internal apps. Save that. Close out settings, go back into profiles. We're gonna go ahead and create our management command now. Now, if you're not familiar with what I mean by a management command, you can just type out python manage.py, hit enter. These are all of the built-in management commands. So we're just gonna create a custom one. Notice that most of them are under apps themselves with the exception, of course, the standard Django management commands but auth, these two are under the auth app and so on. So that's actually what we wanna do now. And the only reason I'm putting it into a app called profiles is because I'm basically adding user data and I'm just not using the term users essentially. So inside of profiles here, we're gonna go ahead and create a new folder called management. Inside of there, we're gonna go ahead and create a folder called commands. We need to turn these into Python modules. So I'll just, copy and, or we'll basically hit option and drag this on over or control and drag it on over depending on what system you're on. And that will allow me to copy those init files so that now I can run python manage.py and I can see potentially, oh, nope, profiles isn't showing up. So in my commands, let's go ahead and do loader.py and run python manage.py now. Now I see that loader is a management command that I could use if I just type it out like that. Now, of course, it's actually not a valid command yet, which is what we need to make. So to do this, it's simple. It's from django.core.management.base. We're gonna import the base command, and then we'll go ahead and declare our class of command and base command. So why is it called command versus loader? Well, this is just how Django works. It's gonna look inside of the loader module for the base command of command. So the name that you give the module itself is gonna be the name that you type out on python manage.py, that's it. Then we're gonna go ahead and create a function called handle, which takes in self and then args, and then you can also do options. That's typically what you'll see is options. So I'll go ahead and say, hello, I'll print out hello world, and then let's go ahead and take a look at what those options are. So now I'll go ahead and run python manage.py loader, hit enter, and now I see all of the built-in options that I already have for my base command, right? So I've got verbosity, settings, Python path, and so on. If I needed those options available to me, you could do that, and they just come in by default. So what this means though is what I want is I wanna be, have the ability to actually create users here. So that means I wanna import the user model. Now to do this, we run from django.contrib.auth. We're gonna import the command get user model, and then we'll declare the user here as in get user model. Now this is primarily for custom auth, as in it's in preparation if you create a custom user model. So this is the recommended way to grab the user inside of Django, whether or not you have a custom user model, if you weren't already aware. So now that we've got this, what I can also do is, let's go ahead and print out how many users I have. So I'm gonna go ahead and use an F string for this and just say, hello, there are, and then this is gonna be user.objects.count, and we'll go ahead and say users. And let's go ahead and verify this command is working now. Let's go ahead and open up the terminal, press up, and there we go. Hello, there are one users, or however many users you've generated to this point. 
And of course, the whole point of this loader is to load in a bunch of random fake users. So to do this, I'm gonna go ahead and do from CFE home, we're gonna import the utilities module and I'll save it as, or import it as CFE home utils. And then in here, we're just gonna use this to generate a bunch of profiles, right? And so the profiles I wanna be able to generate are, well, get fake profiles. And then as you might remember, we have the count of whatever we want the count to be. Now for me, I actually want the count to be arbitrary to the arguments that I am actually gonna pass. So if I do loader and 100, I want it to actually pass in 100 users or create 100 users. So to do this, I'm gonna go ahead and do define add arguments. And this takes in self and parser. And then we just add in parser.add argument. This time I'm gonna call it count or the main name for it is gonna be count. And then the number of arguments here is going to be question mark. And then the default is gonna be 10. And then the type of argument it is, is going to be an integer. So this allows me to come down here and say count equals to options.get of count. And it's based off of whatever that value ends up being, which could be some sort of number or nothing. It could just be zero, which would default to 10 then. And I can come in here and do that count. Great. So now from these profiles, what I could do is I could, let me just break down this explorer here. Of course, I can iterate through each one of those profiles. So I can do for profile in profiles and start to do something here. Now, if you're really familiar with Django, you would know you could do user.objects.create and then unpack these profiles. Now, the reason I know I can unpack them is because the get fake profiles function actually formats the dictionary that comes back. This dictionary is the exact same format that the user model needs, right? So if you were doing something very similar to this for another kind of model, you just need to make sure that the dictionary values in here actually correspond to the field name values in the model you're trying to create. But of course, this is actually not incredibly efficient, especially when you start having a lot of profiles. So what we want to do instead is use a different kind of method called bulk create. So instead we're going to do user.objects.bulk create down here of some sort of list of user instances. So the way we do this is by doing a new users list. And then inside of each iteration, we'll go ahead and append an instance of the user class, but not one that's already in the database. So if I get rid of objects.create, this is an instance of that class, but it's not in the database until I put it through bulk create. So I'm gonna go ahead and come down here, pass that in. I'm also gonna add in a flag called ignore conflicts being true. This is in case we have duplicate values in here, which will almost certainly happen if you add enough users in. Eventually you'll have too many, in which case, of course, you would want to avoid that or at least let the bulk create continue going. And so I can go ahead and say new users or rather, let's go ahead and say users bulk and I'll put that equal here. And then I'll just print out the uh, new users created the length of new users bulk. Okay. So that's it. So now that I've got this, let's try it out. I'm going to open up the terminal. We'll add in with 100 users, 100 new users created. And we could just keep this process going. And of course, I could also do something like parser.add argument and show dash total. And we'll go ahead and give it an action now of store true and then set the default being false. This essentially gives a true or false flag then. And then down here we'll do show underscore true because you can't do dashes in Python. They become underscores. So that also means that options.get show underscore total. That should be the variable name too actually. Uh, it comes up in here as well. And so then I'll just say if total print out total users and then user.objects.all. And we use an f string there, or rather dot count. 
Okay, so we save that and I'll just say new users, just like that. Great, let's try it again. And this time it shows new users. And then if I do user or show total, now it shows both of those things. Cool. So notice that it's not 500, even though I've added roughly 500, or at least it seems like I should have. And this, of course, is that ignore conflicts thing in action. It's actually now creating those users. Now, you can actually end up creating a lot of users this way. Uh, but of course, doing like 120,000 users is not efficient. What would be better is if we actually did a batch of each one of these things. So it's not necessarily going to do all 120,000, but rather doing it in batches of like 10,000 maybe or 1,000. Um, but that's not something I need to cover at this time. So if you want to add, let's say 10,000, we could see how long that takes. It probably will only take like five to 20 seconds, maybe even a minute. But it, it's not really the point because you're only going to really run this one time um, when you're building out this whole thing, right? So the other part of this too is... Yeah, so it took, what, maybe a minute. Um, the other part of this, too, is that we want this entire project, we want to be able to delete this database at any time. We might still want to create a super user, which can happen also at any time. But I want to be able to actually create a bunch of users at any time and then load in all of the other data. So a bunch of ratings as well as loading in our movies. So now that's actually what I want to do is I want to be able to actually load in all of the movies, the actual data set that we're going to generate a bunch of fake ratings for. Uh, but at this point, this is a simple, easy way to generate a bunch of fake user profiles. For some of you, this is a bunch of brand new things and it's really cool that you could do this. For others, this might be a little bit of review with the exception of maybe using fake profiles. But even that, um, let's go ahead and actually take a look at the actual movie model now. All right, so let's go ahead and drill down a little bit on this get data portion of the Django orchestration tool or the goal of this series. Now, first off, what is the data we want, right? So definitely want to get our user data. In fact, we've already done that. What do I want from the users? Well, I actually want ratings from the users. And what do I want them to rate? Some sort of data set, right? We'll talk about that in a second. Now, the reason we want the data set first is because, well, we need to generate our fake users. We've already done that. Then we'll need to generate fake ratings on something. So we need that something in here. And of course, that something is going to be movies. But in general, that doesn't have to be movies in order for us to use the collaborative filtering. That is the machine learning algorithm that we're going to be creating is a collaborative filtering algorithm. So essentially, when a new user signs up for our service, we'll have them rate a couple movies. From that, our AI algorithm will use collaborative filtering based off of all of our other users' ratings to recommend things to you. And over time, it's going to get better and better and better as more and more people rate more and more things, including the ones that you just don't want to see, right? So if it recommends something that you don't like, You'll say that and then it will update and all that with this pipeline. That's kind of the point. So this is what we need to do now is our actual data set. Now, there's a lot of different ways to get this data set. We could scrape it from the Internet. Somewhere out there is a database of movies that are being displayed on a website, maybe like IMDb. But I want to be a little bit more general for the data set itself. We could use an API service, right? So uh, third-party services where our software can, uh, software to software chatting, right? Basically to get the data. Now this would probably be the best bet in the long run because of, well, the source of data, especially for movies, but not every project is gonna make that the, the long run one. Another one would be user generated content. This one is much harder and actually leads into the cold start problem as well, right? So if you think about it, if you were trying to make YouTube, for example, well, it's going to be hard to recommend good content if you just started it and you have 10 users, right? So that's one thing. Uh, so user generated content is usually much, much harder. Now, where we're actually going to get the data is from open source data sets. And in our case, it's from Kaggle.com and it's called the movies data set. 
So really what I want to do is download the movie's data set so we can actually start to model our data based off of it. I'll give you the fields that we're going to model off of in just a moment. But at this point, I want you to go to the link in the description or just do a good quick Google search for the movie's data set and Kaggle and download this one. It's 235 megabytes. It's pretty big. But one thing you'll notice is it has ratings and users. These things we're going to ignore. We're just going to go off of the actual movies themselves. Now, the reason I'm ignoring it is because, well, it has little to do with other kinds of ratings and users. In other words, going back into here, what if I wanted this to be about food? Well, now this data set no longer works for us at all. So if we trained a model on this data set, it falls apart. So my goal is to allow you to be like, oh, I want food or math problems, or you want to say like, you know, travel destinations or whatever. You can change how that data set is on your own project. And that's really the point to me is this being your own project. So I'm using this movie's data set really just to have a bunch of actual data that gives us all a baseline to work off of. That's pretty much it. So I'm assuming that you've already downloaded this or have started downloading this. Once you do, this is what we'll end up seeing. I'm actually gonna work with this data on the next one, but for now, we'll just leave it as a download and I'll go ahead and create the actual movies app. So let's go ahead into the terminal here and I'll do Python manage.py start app and movies. And then we'll go ahead and jump in to that app. So in the SRC folder, of course, movies model, we'll do class movie and it's models.model. Now I've actually already found out what the fields are. The fields I'm gonna use are title, overview, and release date. Now, if you actually look at the data set, even on, you know, online, what you'll see is, well, there's a lot of other stuff that's going on here. You've got budget, you've got genres with, well, it looks like nested lists in here. You've got a homepage even, an ID. Perhaps you wanna use that ID, perhaps not. IMDB ID as well, interesting. So you can actually use the IMDB webpage or maybe even the API to get their data as well. You've got original title, you've got all sorts of stuff in here uh, related to the project itself. And so we actually will end up manipulating this data uh, on based on you know however we see fit. So the columns here that I'm using are original title and overview. There also might be a title field um, and I also might use the ID field and the release date. I believe that's in here as well somewhere. Uh, but those are just the general idea that I wanna use. So I'll do models.char field, max length of 120. And we'll go ahead and say unique equals to true. Um, so in some cases, you know, this is probably not a great idea saying unique equals to true. It'd probably be better to have unique together as in like the title and release date for this data set. Um, but I'm not too worried if there's conflicts from old movies that have the same name. I'll just go off of this because again, it's a bunch of fake data. So models uh, and then overview models dot text field. And then we'll go ahead and our, do our release date being models dot date field. I'm gonna go ahead and allow this one to be blank and null. And then we'll do auto now being false and auto now add being false as well. So one other thing that I want in here that is Django specific would be the timestamp. So actually when I put this in here and it's gonna be models.datetime field and we're gonna go ahead and do auto now add being true. Now I'm most likely gonna update this model some more, not just have this, um, like I might actually do some aggregation calculations so that a model or a movie that's being displayed might show its latest rating or something along those lines. Uh, but that's something we'll do after we actually start doing the ratings. So now that I have this model, let's go ahead into our settings and let's go ahead and bring it in and movies. There we go. And let's run our migrations. So Python manage.py make migrations and Python manage.py migrate. Okay, great. So now what we need to do, of course, is load the data in, which means that we're gonna have to modify things just a little bit to ensure that we even can load the data in. 
And, you know, if we need to change a field name, we also might want to do that too. So not only are we going to load the data in, but we'll also review it a little bit as well. Now we're going to go ahead and load in our data set that we just downloaded. So if we look at the download itself, here is that data set. It is massive. So it's definitely something we are not going to want to put in to our Git repo. So inside of the SRC folder, I'm going to go ahead and do data. And then I'm going to drag this on over here. Notice there's a plus sign. So it's actually going to copy that in for me. Now, I actually don't want this to be displayed right here. So I'll go ahead and hit exit and exit out of that. Next, I'm going to go ahead and copy the path itself. So let's go ahead and come in here with it not selected. Go ahead and copy relative path. Go into your git ignore file and paste that in there. That means that it won't be tracked by git, of course. Okay, so the next thing is I'm gonna jump into my CFE Home Utilities here, and I wanna import a couple things here. The first thing I'm gonna import is from CSV. Next thing is gonna be from django.conf. We're gonna import settings. So what I wanna do is I wanna declare this data directory, and that is gonna be possible thanks to the base directory right here. So I can use pathlib for this. So in here, I'll go ahead and say data dir equals to settings.base dir and then slash data. But it actually stands to reason that this should be in settings right underneath base dir. And that's what I'll do. Okay. So now instead of that, I will actually use the movies metadata dir or movies metadata CSV file based off of settings.baster now, and it's gonna be movies underscore metadata.csv. Okay, so let's get rid of that. And so now I wanna actually take a look at this movies metadata. So there's a lot of different ways on how we can do this. I'm gonna be using the built-in Python CSV package just because it's probably the easiest one to do. So I'm gonna define load movie data. It's gonna take in some sort of hard limit so I can prevent it from reading all of the data all at once. And so I can actually review it. So with that in mind, I'll also do from pprint import pprint. This will become very clear in a moment. Now what I'll do is with open the CSV file path, I'm gonna do new line equals to an empty string just like that. And we'll do as CSV file. And then I want to use the csv.dict reader of the csv file okay so this gives me a actual dictionary value with the items that are in here and then i'll do for i and row in enumerate and the reader itself now this of course is so if i is greater than the limit then i'll break it or realistically it should be i plus one because the iteration will start at zero and then I can go ahead and p print the row itself. Okay, I'm gonna leave the limit in as one just so I can actually see this first one and that's it. And so I already have a way to sort of load this movie data that's back in my profiles in the management command under commands. I can go into the loader here and now I can actually have a new handler for this data. But I already have the utils here just like that. So if I wanted to say movies equals to CFE home underscore utils dot, well, load movie data limit equaling to the count, right? Pretty nice. And so what I actually wanna do is add in a couple new parsers in here. And the first one is gonna be just simply movies. The second one will be simply users. Okay. So this movies actually will change to being movie data set. And then I will go ahead and grab a few options here. And we'll go ahead and say movies. Or maybe load movies based off of the option for movies and fake users. Or let's say generate users. And that one's going to be users now. And so the first one, we'll go ahead and say if load movies. Then we'll put that in. And the next one being if generate users, then we'll use all of that old stuff. Great. 
So with this in mind, let's go ahead and try it out now with Python manage.py loader, dash dash movies, hit enter, and we get this problem here. Looks like I didn't save the data dir in here, so let's make sure I save my settings. Now it's modified with that yellow color. Run it again, and there we go. So this is why I used pprint, is so I can actually see all of this data. And we might actually take a look at it in terms of should I actually add additional fields to my model? And maybe you will, right? So a couple of good examples are maybe adult. Maybe you wanna you know, signify whether or not it's an adult film, maybe what collection it belongs to, the budget, and so on, right? So a lot of these things are maybe attributes that you might take into consideration of things that you might wanna store. Um, I am not gonna do that. I'm just gonna make it really simple and store the ID, the title, and then the overview. That's it, right? I'm not really concerned about everything else. Now, again, we have the option to add it later, especially if we use the ID that's being used in here. It might be best to use the IMDB ID, but I'm just gonna go off of the ID that they have here. Again, actually modeling this data and thinking about all of the things that you might wanna use is gonna be different per project, so that's why I'm not spending that much time on it per data set project especially. Okay, so with this in mind, I now have this movie data set here, but I actually don't want the entire data set. I only want part of it. And of course, by that, I mean actually limiting what's in this data set. I do want all of the movies. So to do this, we're gonna jump back into the utilities feature here. And I wanna go through row by row and eliminate most of the data. So now I'm gonna go ahead and change this to being simply data set and it's gonna be a empty list, and then we'll go ahead and return that data set after the for loop. The first thing I wanna grab is the ID. I'm gonna go ahead and do row.get and the ID. I wanna ensure that this is an integer because I'm gonna actually set this to the model ID inside of Django. So I'll just go ahead and do something like this, and we'll go ahead and just pass it in as none. And then we'll go ahead and do data and ID is equal to that ID, just like that. Next, of course, is gonna be our title. And this one's really simple, it's just row.get and title. The overview, also very simple, simply overview, row.get and overview. Then we're gonna go ahead and grab the release date. Now this is another one that's a little bit tricky. So you could think it's row.get and simply release date. But unfortunately what's gonna happen with this data, if we take a look, the release date may or not be in the correct format or maybe there is no release date, in which case I can't just set a Django model to something like that's not a valid date time object. So if we come back in here, here is the release date. I'm actually changing the field type. We could store it as a string if we wanted to, but I actually want it as a date. So I actually need to modify it a little bit. Going back into the loader here, or rather the util function, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna import date time, and then we'll go ahead and do define validate the date string and this is gonna be just simply the date text. And then I'm gonna add in a try block here of date time dot date time, str p time, the actual text itself, so date text. And then it's gonna be percent %y, capital Y, percent lowercase m, dash percent %d. That will give us this format right here. And of course, if that doesn't actually work, it'll run an exception. Then if there is an exception, we'll return none. Otherwise, we will return that date text. We could return the daytime object, but it's not necessary because it's gonna be stored that way. We are just validating it, that's it. And so down here, I will go ahead and say the release date is equal to, well, validate the date string. And this is gonna be row.get release and date. And then we'll go ahead and set this here. I'm gonna break that down a little bit. 
Let's just make sure that that's the name of the function. Looking good. Okay, so the data itself, after that's all done, we'll go ahead and do data set.append that data. Great. So now that we've got that, let's go back into the loader here. This time when we go ahead and import from movies.models, we'll go ahead and import the movie class. Cut this out, paste here. And then the actual movie item. So movies new equals two. Well, we could do a list comprehension here. And it's just simply movie. And I'll go ahead and unpack it. So unpack X and then for X in movie data set. And then we'll go ahead and just do movie.objects.create and movies new. Ignore conflicts again, being true. And there we go. I can also say movies bulk, just like I did before. And I'll print out, you know, the new movies. And that's going to be the length of that. And then again, if show total, I will do the same thing I did with users. Total movies. Okay. And there we go. So let's give it a shot. Come back in here, loader movies. I actually do not want the print statement any longer. Having that print statement will make it take a lot longer. So, and then I'll do show total. This should give me roughly 10. Uh, but of course I got an error, positional argument, two were given. I think I know why, is I did create, not bulk create. There we go. Try that again. Created 11 movies, try it again, 11 movies. Now, what's actually gonna happen if we bring these movies into the admin and just review them real quick. So we'll do from.models import the movie admin.site.register of the movie. Well, actually we could already see what's happening is it's not actually adding additional movies in here. It's just loading the first 10 or so. So let's go ahead and run the server and we can verify this in the admin as well. And let's go to the local, local host, 8,000, go into the admin, log in as that super user you hopefully already created, go into movies, and there we go. So I only have 11 movies, and they're based off of these IDs. They're not based off of Django IDs, but rather the data set file itself IDs. And so that's, of course, not the thing I want to do, right? Instead, with my loader, I'm going to go ahead and add in a specific count. In this case, I'm going to add in 46,000, hit enter. That will give me all my movies. I'll let it load for a moment because it will take some time. Uh, but that should give me roughly all of my movies. Granted, it's missing about 3,000 because of the ID likely. Um, but that's it. Pretty cool. All right, so now it's time to move into the ratings app itself. So let's go ahead and start this one with Python manage.py, start app and ratings. Now, right away, I'll go into CFE Home Settings and bring in the Ratings app into my installed apps here. We'll save that and close it. Now, what I'm gonna do is create the rating model. Now, the first thing that I know I'll need is from Django.conf. We're gonna go ahead and import settings because I need reference to the user model itself. So auth user model. And this, of course, is simply a string of auth.user, which makes this specific model more flexible when or if I actually create a custom user model if you weren't already aware. So what I wanna do here is add a class of rating, and it's gonna be models.model. .model. And I wanna allow my user to have a lot of different ratings. So I'll go ahead and say user equals to models .foreign key user and then on delete being models.cascade. As in, if I delete this user, all of their ratings go with them. Okay, so here's the idea behind this foreign key. And it's important to understand why I'm gonna design ratings in the way I will in a moment. So when you got a user object, let's say for instance, I did object equals a user to objects dot first, right? That's a user object, okay? So with this, I have a reverse relationship to this rating model 
which means I can say user ratings equals to user user object and then dot rating set dot all. Conversely, if I grabbed a rating, so I'll go ahead and say rating object equals to rating dot objects dot first. I can grab that user model and do rating object dot user. And then yet again, I can use user ratings again. This is the foreign key relationship. That means that they are closely tied together. I can switch back and forth between them and it's pretty nice. When I say I can switch back and, back and forth, I mean directly in the code, I can switch back and forth. This user object is the same as a user object that you would get from a standard user.objects lookup. So that is a normal foreign key. Now what we're gonna be doing that's slightly different is called a generic foreign key. So I'm gonna declare something called content type, object ID, and content object. Okay, so uh, content type. Now the user model itself has a content type. The movie model has a content type. In fact, any model that you create has a content type. So I'm gonna go ahead and reference that content type as a foreign key, much like I just did with the user one. So to do that, we're gonna go ahead and bring in from django.contrib, then dot content types dot models. We're gonna import the content type model. And so again, I'll use a foreign key. So models dot foreign key of that. And yet again, if it is deleted, if that specific model is deleted from my project, I wanna make sure I delete all those ratings as well. The object ID, well, the object ID is gonna be related to how I'm designing all of my Django models, which if you think about it is just an ID field. So models.positive integer field, roughly speaking, is how all of these models IDs work by default. Okay, so I'll bring that in. Now, this will not work if you have a UUID field as your primary key, right? It just won't work, just to be aware of. But the conditions I have right now are really close to giving a very similar relationship. However, I'll be able to change the content type on demand. We'll see this in action in the Django admin shortly. Anyway, so going back, content object, I'll actually call it content object. I want to actually assign these two fields to the content object. So now I'm gonna go ahead and do roughly the same import, but now it's just dot fields. We're gonna import the generic foreign key. I'll grab this, paste it down here. The first field we need to declare is the name of the field for the content type and then object ID. Now you don't have to call it these names, right? So you could call it C type and then down here you'd call it C type and so on. But I go off of, of the documentation, especially with generic foreign keys. I think this is a perfect way to do it. Um, I haven't seen a better implementation of generic foreign keys than what the Django documentation has. Okay, so this is a baseline generic foreign key. Now, before I go any further and add more fields to this rating, I can also do these reverse relationships to a degree on other models. So where I will want to have it is in movies.py. I will want to have a sort of loose relationship and we'll see this going forward, but we'll go ahead and do from django.contrib.contenttypes.fields again. This time we're gonna import the generic relation. And what I'm gonna do is I'll keep it commented out, but I'll leave it in as rating equals to the generic relation. And we'll come back to filling that one out. So the idea behind this rating model though, is of course to allow a user to assign some value. So value equals to models dot integer field. And I'm gonna allow it to be null. I'm also gonna allow it to be blank, mainly because I want to allow the user to remove their rating or allow the user more specifically to just not have a rating, but perhaps I accidentally created one for them in my view or somewhere else. Point being, I wanna allow this to be in blank. I also wanna have other choices. So now I'll go ahead and do a new class called a rating choice, and it's gonna just be models.integer choices now. 
And what we'll do is one equals to one and two equals to two and then so on. And then I'll also have an empty field in here as well for something else. So one to five, those are my rating choices. So back in this value here, I'll go ahead and add in choices being rating choice dot choices. Okay, cool. So now we've got roughly speaking our model. There's one more thing I wanna add in here and that's timestamp. And this of course is just to know when the rating occurs. So models.date time field. And I'll go ahead and do auto now add being true. Now, there is the possibility that you're gonna to wanna to update these ratings over time. What I'm gonna do is actually just add a new rating when I create a new rating. So if I change my rating, if you will, for any given user, it's just gonna add a new instance, a new row, so I can really just see the timestamp itself. So I'll go ahead and add in active equals to models.boolean field and default being, well, true. Okay, so this is now my rating model, right? The, the only new thing here, hopefully, is this generic foreign key. And so let's actually take a look as to why that works. First and foremost, let's do python manage.py make migrations, and then python manage.py migrate. And now what I wanna do is jump into the admin, but first let's go ahead and register it. And I'll do the from.models, I'm gonna import the rating model and then class rating admin, admin dot model admin. Raw ID fields are gonna be equal to the user, especially if you created a bunch of users. And then the read only field is gonna be that generic foreign key. So we'll go ahead and call that the content object. And then now we'll go ahead and do admin dot site dot register the rating and the rating admin. Okay, so we save this and our migrations have already run. Let's go ahead and see if the server is running. If I left it on, I did. Let's go ahead and open up the admin now and we'll have a look. Log in, go into a rating and let's go ahead and create our first rating. Okay, so naturally with a rating like this, I can absolutely build this into a front end of some kind, but we're gonna go ahead and just stick with the bare bones here. First off, I can select a user. I'm gonna go ahead and select my CFE user, which happens to have an ID of one. I'm gonna go ahead and rate it to three. Then I'm gonna go ahead and just grab content object of movie, and I'm just gonna write some gibberish in here. I'll hit save and continue. Gibberish as in the actual object ID is not a real one, which we'll see in a second. So I save that, and it looks like my read only fields did not register. Let me refresh there and I've got a zero content object. There is no real content object here. Uh, but what if I actually selected user and one and hit save and continue? Hey, what do you know? The content object is now, well, myself. And I only rated it a three, it should be a five, right? You should rate yourself really high, hopefully. But the point is, this is now incredibly flexible, right? I now have a single rating on this user, or of course, if I change it to my movies, perhaps it'll rate a proper movie, in this case it did not. Um, but this is why we use generic foreign keys is for that flexibility across all the different models. But of course, I still want that reverse relationship. So in my movies, I still want to be able to see, you know, just at least see what it is that I'm looking at as far as ratings are concerned for any given movie. So the way we do this, I've already alluded to, but we'll take a look at how to implement it now. In our models, we've got this rating generic collect, uh, you know, relation here. It's actually gonna be plural. And then we'll go ahead and do from ratings.models. We're gonna import rating. I'm gonna go ahead and uncomment this out and add in our rating here. So far, not a whole lot, but what's important here is this is gonna be a query set. It's not an individual object, it's a query set because it's a generic foreign key reverse relationship. Um, this will be this uh, very similar to like saying, user.rating set.all, right, in the other one. That will give you a query set. So this does as well, which means I can do all sorts of calculations on this. So we can do something like calculate, uh, let's say ratings count, and we can return self.ratings.count. And that is a query set right here. 
So that means, of course, I can run dot count on it, or to make it more clear that it's query set dot all dot count, and this will give me a count. And we can verify this by going into the admin for the movie, and we'll do movie admin here, and then admin dot model admin, and I'll go ahead and do list display, being let's leave in the str method as it currently is, and also add in calculate ratings. I can also add this in as read only fields. Also as calculate ratings count. Let's just bring in that admin here and we'll save it. Refresh. What do you know? I've got calculated ratings count on there and on here. So let's actually use this movie ID here and rate it. So back into my ratings, I have a rating object already. Let's just grab that one and I'm gonna go ahead and give it a four. Hit save and continue. Notice I've got my movie object in here. Let's go back to that movie object in here just like that. And what do you know? Ratings count is now one. Now this of course is not where the magic happens exactly. What would be better is if we actually were able to calculate the ratings average, right? That would be much, much better than just the count as in what is this movie's average rating? So that's actually one of the key things with generic foreign keys is these two items could be applied to now any of your models and thus making your ratings that much more flexible and also going back into our goals, making the ability to swap between different kinds of data sets and thus different kinds of collaborative filtering that much more flexible as well. All of the things that we want to really build a pipeline orchestration tool for machine learning with Django. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and calculate this ratings average we're gonna do the actual functionality for it. Now you probably could do it inside of the movie app itself, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to do it in there. It makes a lot more sense to do it in the rating model itself. So first thing that we need to do is we need to do a class of rating manager, and this is gonna be models.manager. And then we also need a class of rating query set, which is models.query set. So we're gonna define a rating query set in here and we'll call it rating just like this. And it's gonna be simply self.aggregate. And we'll go ahead and say average equals to some sort of average. And then we'll get what that average ends up being. And within our model manager here, we're gonna go ahead and define get and query set. And it's gonna return the rating query set of self.model and using self.db as in the you know standard database that you have, the first database or the only database setting that you have. Next, we're gonna go ahead and define rating here as well. This time it's gonna be return self.get and query set, and then just simply rating, which is gonna call this method right here, thanks to this setup. Okay, so how do we actually aggregate an average? How do we calculate an average? Well, it's actually pretty straightforward. We just come in here and do from django.db.models. We're gonna import AVG, just like that. This is a database function that we can use and I can call it here and then pass in some sort of field name here. In this case, the field name is value. And the reason I know I can call average here is because of how the aggregate function works. What it'll end up doing is creating a dictionary called average and it will give me back whatever that value is, like let's say 1.2, for example. So calling self that uh, aggregate will give me this. And then if I just call that key value, I can grab it. And the reason I know that key value is in there is because I declared it right here. So if I did AVG, I would call it AVG and so on. Okay, cool. Um, so that's actually how I calculate the rating. Pretty straight, Pretty straightforward if you ask me. The last thing of course, is I need to add in objects and I need to change my default manager to simply this rating manager so that now I can do rating.objects.rating and then also rating.objects.all.rating. These are two different actual functions themselves, but those are the things that I'll be able to do now. Now you might call this average, you might call it something different, right? So if you called it AVG, I actually think that makes a lot more sense as far as what it's actually doing, which is returning the average. 
So let's leave it in as that because rating dot rating doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But now that we've got this, let's go ahead and jump back into our movies model where that calculate ratings average was. Now I should be able to just do AVG just like that. We save it. It's going to get the average rating for the entire query set, right? So this, these two things should be identical as in ratings like that and like that. Great. So we save it now and let's make sure our server is running. Sure enough, it is. Let's jump into our movie itself. We have only see the calculate ratings count here. So let's go back into the admin and we'll go ahead and do calculate ratings, ABG or average. Is that what we called it? Yes, it is. Refresh it here. And what do you know? 4.0. Let's go ahead and create another average or let's create another rating in here. So inside of my ratings, let's go ahead and add another one. Let's grab an arbitrary user here. We're going to rate this a one object ID, the movie, save and continue. There's our movie object. If I refresh in here now, 2.5. So the rating just went down. Okay. So there's a couple of things to consider here that are really important. And that is, do we actually want the function of calculating the count and ratings to happen every single time? As in, when you go to the admin, should it actually be calculating these things? Well, the answer is no. What we're going to want to do is we're going to want to calculate these ratings and these averages on some sort of schedule. Like this alone is actually worth it in learning how to use Celery, which is the worker process that we'll implement very soon. Um, but the idea being that we actually have AVG uh, rating being models dot decimal field. And then we do uh, decimal places equals to two max digits. Let's say, I don't know, 12. That's going to be a lot of ratings. So uh, definitely would not be 12. It would be more like five. Yeah. So the maximum it will be is 5.00. The minimum it would be is 0.00. .00. So it's probably more like four, but we can leave it in as like that. I'll go ahead and say uh, blank equals to true and null equals to true. And then I'll also go ahead and say rating count. And same sort of thing, but actually need an integer field now. It does not need to be decimal places because you can't have half of a rating. I'll actually reverse these to being rating count and then rating average. So that if I wanted to have a maximum or a minimum, I could also put that in there as well. So just two more fields that I would actually have. And then I also want to have, you know, maybe the last calculated, like the last time I actually calculated these ratings. You know, perhaps I want to keep track of that so that I'm not, you know, updating the ratings that often. So we'll go ahead and say rating update or let's say last updated equals to models dot date time field and auto now being false auto now add being false blank being true and null being true. Okay. So now what I want to do, of course, is I actually want to calculate these things. So then I'll do define and simply calculate rating. And I'll also add in save being true and maybe even force being true. Those might be good options to have in here, but I'll leave force out for now. But the idea being that the average rating or let's do rating ABG is going to be equal to this calculation. So basically self dot calculate and then the rating count being self dot calculate ratings count just like that. So now I would just set self dot rating count equaling to the rating count self dot rating average equaling to the rating average. And then what do you know? We also want to have self dot and rating last updated equaling to time zone dot now. And then if save self dot save, and then we'll return maybe the average rating. 
time zone. We, to grab that one, we'll just do from Django.utils import time zone. Just like that, great. So now I have a way to calculate these ratings fairly regularly. And well, it's actually not that complicated to do, but the thing is I actually would need to do it on a, on a somewhat regular basis or at least related to some sort of time, right? So I'll go ahead and do define, you know, rating average admin or let's do rating average display. And this way, if it's been a long time, I wanna be able to show or actually calculate the ratings themselves. So which, in other words, I would actually run, you know, self.calculate rating. So what I wanna do then is I'm gonna import date time and basically say now equals to time zone dot now. And I wanna just check if now you know, minus daytime dot time delta. Let's just do minutes equals to one. If it's, if now is less than that. So if now is greater than that, that idea here, then we'll go ahead and run or return back just the original rating. Okay. Or rather this should be based off of just like that. And if not self.rating last updated, return self.calculate rating. Something along those lines, right? So now I can actually come back into the admin and calculate that ratings average. And let's go ahead and see if it works. If I refresh in here, I get no such column. All right, that's okay. Let's go ahead and make migrations now. So python manage.py, make migrations and python manage.py migrate. And now I refresh in here. Um, so now it should actually calculate it when I actually refresh in here uh, based on the fact that it didn't have any. And then if I do last updated, this should be like, let's say 39, I'll hit save and continue, right? So save and continue. And then if I refresh again, it actually did change it because it was a while ago. Uh, but if I refresh again and again and again, it won't rechange until actually a, a minute goes by based off of, you know, this value right here. So basically then I would actually come in and say um, the rating, you know, calc uh, time being however long I want it to be. And then I would actually set that up in there. You know, maybe you do it as minutes, maybe you do it as days, um, more than likely, if you are having ratings change a lot, uh, then you might actually do midi, uh, minutes or you wouldn't even have this rating average display. You'd have a actual worker task that's pretty much constantly updating these ratings all across the board based off of their last time that they're updated because uh, it will certainly make a difference um, based on all of the different rating things in there. So if I refresh in here, there we go. It finally did change because the minute went by and now we've got that rating average being updated. And of course, if I actually went in here and let's go ahead and update this to a four, you know, eventually, basically by refreshing in here, eventually this is absolutely gonna change that rating. Um, so I realized I sort of went a little fast on these things, but a number of items related here are actually pretty straightforward. Calculating the ratings and doing those aggregate functions might be new to you. Um, if they're not, then that's okay. But the general idea is now when I actually go to any particular movie, assuming that it was updated somewhat recently, I would actually see the rating count and I wouldn't have to call any sort of aggregate function, which is gonna become incredibly important when we have a lot of data, which is what we still need to make. So let's actually refresh in here. Let's see what the average is and not quite a minute. And there it goes, just changed average right there. Great. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and generate movie ratings. We're gonna generate the fake ratings based off of our fake users, but yet our real movies. Now to do this, I'm gonna go in my ratings folder here and we're gonna create a management command inside of there. Of course, we're gonna go ahead and create commands. And then I will create a module in there and we'll call this fake underscore ratings dot pi. 
And of course, we need to have our init methods in management as well as in commands. And then I'll just go ahead and scroll up into profiles, management and commands loader. And I'm going to grab a bunch of these things right here and bring it back into my fake ratings. Okay, great. So first and foremost, we will need our user model. So I'll keep that in here and I'll also keep an count and show total. All right. And now I'll go ahead and define handle. It takes in self, args and options. Great. Much like we've already seen multiple times now. I'm going to go ahead and copy count and show total and we'll bring that in here. There we go. Okay, so my default now for ratings, I'm gonna go ahead and add in a, another item in here, and that is the number of users that I wanna have. So we'll go ahead and say users, and this time it's no longer gonna be an action, but I will set the default to being, let's say a thousand users and the type being int. Okay, so we want a thousand users, and we'll go ahead and say user count equals to options dot get and users. Let's go ahead and print out all things. So count show total and user count. Save that and we'll run python manage.py fake underscore ratings. And then I'll go ahead and add in 100 users being 500 and show dash total hit enter. And there we go. Great. So it's all working in the sense of how I want to go about doing this. So the how to do this, I'm actually going to create in here as a task. So I'll go ahead and do inside of my ratings folder. We're going to go ahead and do tasks.py. Now you could call it a utility, but I actually might want to offset this because these are fake ratings. That is, I want to eventually make it into an actual method that I'll call using celery. So I'm gonna go ahead and keep it into tasks. Now, the first thing I wanna do is import random. I'm also gonna go ahead and import movies. So the movie model itself. I also wanna go ahead and do from django.contrib.auth. We're gonna import the get user model. And then of course the model itself for rating and rating choice. Now we'll go ahead and declare our user with user equals to get user model, uh, of course. Great. Okay, so what is it that I'm trying to do here? Well, I'm gonna generate fake reviews. And how many do I want? Of course, I'll go ahead and say 10. How many users do I want? Again, I'll say 10. And that's pretty, pretty good right there, okay. So I've got my user count and my actual rating count, if you will. Now, more than likely, I'll probably do 100. I want more ratings than I do users. So the first thing that I want to do here is I want to declare the users I'm going to use. So I'm going to go ahead and say user underscore s equals to user dot objects dot first. And then user underscore e equals to user dot objects dot last. Now, the reason I'm doing this is for their IDs. I wanna get random IDs based off of the range that's available for these users. Now, for example, the very first user is gonna have an ID of one. The very last user, well, we don't actually know what the ID is. It could be 4,310,000, 4, right? We wanna get a random sample in here. So to do this, I'm gonna go ahead and say random user IDs equals to random.sample and then we'll go ahead and add in the range of user s.id and user e.id and then add in the count of how many I actually want right so this is going to give us a random sample that's in there which is pseudo random it's not perfectly random but it's random enough to get actual user IDs here. And then I can go ahead and say users equals to user.objects.filter and then ID in, well, this random user IDs. Now I have a random set of query set data related to our user. Now, of course, this is not the only way to do something like this. Hey, another way, maybe an easier way 
would be to do something like this, users equals to user.objects.all, then order by random, and then basically go up to the number of users that you want. I actually like this method just a little bit differently uh, because it actually generates a bunch of user IDs in here versus just a random query set or a pseudo random query set. So again, I want the random user IDs for a number of reasons, but I like having a bunch of user IDs in here that maybe we want to reuse them, or maybe I want to save whatever that batch is at some point in the future of these random user IDs. Again, this is just generating fake data, so it's not something we need to spend too much time thinking about. So the next thing, of course, is the actual amount of movies that I want. The movies one is going to be basically the same as what I was doing with the users, which is going to be movies and movie.objects.all. And then we'll go ahead and order by random, and that will come up to that count. So that is the actual amount of movies that I'll end up wanting to use. Now, the other thing about this is perhaps at some point I will actually want to, um, you know, go by at null average. And I'm going to go ahead and say it's false for now. But if I say if null average, then basically what I want to do is do this same thing, but instead filter out the rating average uh, being null. That the only reason to do that, of course, is to then kind of specify the specific movies that may or may not have or may have not been updated recently, right? So this right here. So if that's null, then of course the rating average is null. There's nothing in there. And so maybe I want to switch that up. Okay, cool. So back into my tasks here, I now have my movies query set. I have my users. So now what I want is a number of ratings. So I actually want one rating per user per movie, or rather one rating per movie itself. So to do this, I'm gonna go ahead and get the number of ratings based off of movies.count. Now this should be the same number as 100, but I'm gonna go off of the query set because this is what I'll actually be iterating. So if for some reason the count is off, well, then we'll know inside of here. This will just be a double check for that. Now what I want is the possible ratings, like as in the choices that we want. In this case, I actually want a rating. I don't want none. If you remember back to when we actually generated the rating choice field, this right here, this is none. This is one through five. If I didn't have this, I would not have a none value, but I actually do want to have a none value in there. So I'm gonna go ahead and ignore that none value. So to do this, I will actually change this from possible ratings um, to being just rating choices. And this is gonna be x for x in rating choice dot values if x is not none. So that, that will just give us one, two, three, four, five, and so on. But of course, it's very flexible if you end up changing your rating values, or if you change it to true or false or something like that, this will give us all of those actual choices. So the next thing is, finally, we're gonna go ahead and say my user ratings equals to, well, another list comprehension of random.choice. This is gonna be my rating choices. And then I'll do four underscore in range zero to the number of ratings, and there we go, or in ratings, there we go. Okay, so what this is gonna give us is a big list of ratings that are based off of the amount of movies that I have. Now, this is not the place where I have to do this. I could actually do random choice inside of the iteration that I'll do in a moment, which is gonna be simply for movie in movies, the, we're gonna go ahead and create a rating object with rating.objects.create. The first thing I need to do is my content object, and this is gonna be set equal to movie. Now, this is a really, really neat shorthand to setting the content object 
in a generic foreign key. So that's this value right here. If you remember in the admin, I had to select the content type and the object ID. So I'll show you how to do that in a moment as well. But back into our task, this is going to be our rating object. Then we're going to go ahead and set a, our value being, well, one of these ratings here. So I'll just pop it off. And the reason I know I can pop it off is because the number of ratings will match the number of iterations in this movie, um, or at least it should. Next, of course, is going to be our user. This time I'll do random.choice of my users, whatever's up here. Okay, so this will create that rating object. And then I will go ahead and leave it like that. We'll actually leave this out for a moment. Cool. So there is a bunch of random ratings on how I'm going to make it. Now you might be wondering why is it that I have objects.create instead of doing bulk create. Now the reason for that, the reason I have create is because I actually want to delete all ratings when they come through based off of the content object and the user. In other words, if I'm the same user rating the same movie all over again, I'm going to introduce a signal after that rating is created to delete all of the old ones. So we'll do that in just a moment after we implement the task itself. So what I want to do here is say new rating equals to just an empty list here. And I'll go ahead and do new rating or we'll, we'll put back the rating object equaling to that. And we'll do new rating dot append and rating object dot ID. And then we'll go ahead and return that new rating or rather let's call it new ratings. Great. Okay. So now that I have this generate fake reviews function, I'm going to go ahead and bring it into my handler here. So let's go ahead and do from the ratings dot tasks. We're going to import the task itself and we'll go ahead and generate those fake reviews and the number of ratings or rather the new ratings. It's going to be whatever's in here. So the count is equal to count and users equals to user count. And we'll go ahead and say if show total, then we'll go ahead and print out the total of final ratings. And actually I'll print out the new ratings, the length of Let's go ahead and put the F string in here. So there's going to be the length of our new ratings. And then the total would be based off of the movies ratings altogether. I don't need these. I'll go ahead and bring in from ratings.models import rating. And if show total, we'll go ahead and do QS equals to rating.objects.all. And then we'll go ahead and do total ratings and qs.count and there we go. Okay, a lot of stuff that you might already be well aware of how to do, but let's go ahead and give it a shot now. And I'll press up, hit enter, and there we go. So total new ratings is a hundred and now I have 102 ratings total. I do it again and again and again. Okay. And so now I actually have a task that I can run on a regular basis to start building up these ratings as if users actually were building up these ratings. So of course I still have to Im implement celery to do a lot of these things. I also need to do is actually handle the post rating creation. I need to be able to delete the old ones. If a user is duplicating the exact same rating all over again, which inevitably will happen. Okay, so let's do a little housekeeping with the Django admin in the rating. I'll go ahead and do list display here, and I'm gonna set it equal to content object, and then the user, and then maybe the value. So the actual rating itself, uh, just like that. Okay, so I refresh in here, and I've got my movie object, the user, and so on. Um, of course, the movie object, we also want to see what that value would end up looking like. So let's go ahead and scroll up to the movies themselves in models. And I'm just going to go ahead and define the str method in here. And we're going to go ahead and return 
let's do self.title. So let's turn that into an F string here. And then I'll put in parentheses self.release date and just like that. If not self.release date, then we'll go ahead and return just self.title. And we might as well wrap that into a string as well. So then I'll do self.release date dot year. That makes it maybe a little bit nicer of a look. And there we go. Okay, so now I can actually see the movies themselves if they are movies. So um, what I wanna do now is I wanna grab any of them. It doesn't really matter. I don't know any of these movies off the top of my head from what we've got here, but I'm gonna go ahead and grab one, The Happening, I've heard of this. I'm gonna grab this one with this particular content object ID. I'll go ahead and add another one. I'm gonna use the single user, go ahead and do five, grab movies and same content or that object ID. And we'll do this exact same thing again with a different rating and hit save. Okay, so what I wanna see here is I want this to be organized by when it was actually rated or the timestamp itself. So something else as far as that is concerned, we would come into the rating and do class meta and then do ordering being negative timestamp as in the newest ones first. And then we'll run Python and manage.py, make migrations, and Python manage.py migrate. Okay, server should still be running, and it is. So let's go back into that admin. And there we go. So we've got the happening twice, right? And of course, one other thing that I would want to see in the admin is probably whether or not the value is active. We save that and we refresh in here. And there we go, so we've got active. So the problem with this is, well, very clear hopefully. I did the same exact content object, I rated it twice, and both of them are considered active. I don't want this, I want one of them to be active, as in the most recent one to be active, um, as in the most recent actual rating. So what will end up happening in our rating model as it's designed is I'll eventually have a lot of redundant rating as in I'll have old rating objects. So I'm gonna show you two approaches to handling when you rate the same thing twice. Both of them are gonna be handled through signals. So back into the rating model, we're gonna go ahead and bring in from django.db.models.signals, we're gonna import the post save signal. The post save is signal is critical for this because it gives us a flag for whether or not the instance was just created. Now we can override the save method on a rating model itself, but I'm gonna go with the signals for this one. So I'm gonna define, and this is gonna be my rating post save. It's gonna take in sender, instance, created, and then we'll do args and keyword args here. And basically, if it was created, that assumes that a couple things. Also, I'll go ahead and say pass, and then we'll wrap this into the post save signal. So post save dot connect and the receiver function, and then the sender being the model itself. Okay, so if it is created, what we wanna do is we wanna get the instance ID. So we'll go ahead and do just underscore ID equals to instance dot ID. And then what I wanna do is check if the instance is active. So that's what I'm doing in this case, right? So the initial case is what I actually set up here. And then I'll talk about what else you might do, which is really, uh, really simple as well. Okay, so if it is active, then we're gonna go ahead and do a query set of rating.objects.filter. So now we wanna filter it by the content type being instance.content type, okay? And we're gonna have another filter in here, so I'll add another line. And that's gonna be object ID equals to instance.object ID. And then user equals to instance.user. Great. So this, of course, is gonna get all of those objects. So what I wanna do is exclude the ID equaling to that underscore ID. Since I'm using active right now, I could also exclude the active being false. 
with this query set, I would just then do QS.update and active being false. That will turn all of the other recently you know, created contents or ratings for any given object into considered to be inactive models. Now, the same thing that you might wanna do if you weren't using active, you could just do QS.delete and completely delete that query set so you're not having too many like data logs of these different ratings. Now, the reason I actually don't wanna delete it is perhaps what I wanna see is individual user rating over time as that might be a whole nother model I wanna look into. As in, what if I rated it a five and then for some reason, three years later, I decided to change it to a three. That is information that's fairly interesting. And of course, if I deleted all these objects, then I wouldn't actually know about them. Whereas active is, well, just another place to do this. And I could also add in one more like field in here, which would be the active update timestamp and auto now being false, auto now add being false that is, and then null being true and blank being true. And so that I could also then come in here and say the active time update being to like something like timezone.now, assuming that I have that imported. So let's go ahead and do from django.utils import timezone. And so now I've got a couple of things that I think are pretty interesting. Whoops, did I not do it right? Oop, not tem zone, but time zone. There we go. And so now I can actually update how my ratings end up looking uh, for a number of reasons. So let's go ahead and do the make migrations and then migrate. Okay, great. So what this means then, of course, if I actually created new instances, let's go ahead and clear this out and press up a few times. So if I create new ratings, what I will see is potentially that signal being called, right? So, well, it will be called every time, but what's gonna happen here is it's gonna look for this query set and it's likely not going to exist. So maybe we'll also add in if qs.exists, then we'll go ahead and try that update. Um, but realistically, the reason in my tasks I have this create call is so that this signal definitely gets created. When you do bulk create, it doesn't necessarily run these kinds of signals, as in it also doesn't necessarily run the save method either. It's just a different operation for the database. Bulk create is certainly more efficient, but what we need to make sure that we're doing is removing duplicates. Now, there probably is a fairly straightforward way, although I couldn't find it, but a fairly straightforward way to basically filter all these things down for duplicates, like looking for duplicates after the fact. I personally don't wanna do that because this is just fake data. If I was using this in production on an actual application with real actual users, this is much more likely something I would do, whether it's in a signal itself or just overriding the save method. This is the way I would think about it myself. So that's another reason to do it here. Now, if we go back into the task, what I wanted to show you was one more way to actually create this data, because it is important to know that content object might not always be available. So to actually do this, we are gonna go ahead and grab the content type model, bring it into our task. And then all I'm gonna do down here is movie underscore C type equals to the content type dot objects dot get for model. And then we just grab the model itself. This will give me the content type for that model. And so now down here, I could add in content type equals to that content type and then object ID equals to movie.id. So in other words, I could actually have just a list of random movie IDs and go off of that to generate this content as well, which means that I could actually go off of the IDs directly from the file that we loaded those IDs in from if I wanted to do it that direction. Uh, but again, the content object is fine, so I'm gonna go ahead and use that one. I just wanted you to know 
there are two different ways to do that, and I wanted to show you how. Cool. Um, and so let's go ahead and see this in action now, going back into the admin. And what I want to do is I want to grab that original data. And of course, I got rid of it. So let's go ahead and add a filter now in the rating admin. And we'll go ahead and do uh, search fields. And we'll go ahead and do user username. Okay. And in here, I'll go ahead and type in my username there. And now I see all of the objects that I actually rated for this particular user. The happening was the one I wanted to duplicate here. I'll go ahead and add another one, add this user, give it a rating, go ahead and grab the movie, give it the same ID. This stuff I don't need to have in there. I'll go ahead and hit save and continue. And it deleted it. <laughs> so it actually removed that from being active, which is interesting. So let's go back. I must have something wrong in the signal itself. Let's go back to that search. Yeah, so it actually took all of them off. So let's go back into our signal here. So we've got our content type, object ID, instance, and then excluding that user. And here's the problem. We want to exclude active being true, <laughs> not active being false. Okay, let's try it again. So come back into the happening, save and add another, and we'll go ahead and do this now. Rate this a four, save and continue. And we refresh in here, and now we've got that active going. Great, okay. So this now, of course, shouldn't actually change the timestamp for later ones, right? So uh, if it exists, then we'll go ahead and say active is false. Actually, I could query this down even further and say QS equals to QS dot exclude. This is gonna be this timestamp is null being false. And so that actually allows me to only update everything when the timestamp is, well, false. Okay, cool. Or rather the timestamp has not been set yet so that I'm not resetting it every single time over time. Okay, so let's double, let's verify that with this one. So that one said 140, and we'll go ahead and do user, or it had 40 at the end, I don't remember the, maybe it was 1140, uh, but let's go ahead and hit save. We go down to here, and it still says 140, great. Didn't change it, but of course, oh, let's go back a couple, of course, the other one should be changed to 141. Great. Okay, so that solves a number of problems related to individual ratings for this, you know, generic foreign key that we have here. Now, even if it wasn't a generic foreign key, we would still have to think about how to handle old ratings and whether or not we wanted to keep them. The simplest thing is just to delete them, but the best thing I think is to track their changes over time. All right, so now we need to create two functions for calculating our movie ratings because realistically using this rating average display, this is not something I'm gonna use all that often. Instead, I'm gonna to want to regularly calculate these rating averages, specifically the rating averages, not necessarily the count or even when it was updated, but definitely the, uh, the averages themselves. So to do this, I'm just gonna go ahead and call this method of calculate rating on these models, on model instances. So the first thing I wanna do is open up a new module here called tasks.py. I'll do from.models, we're gonna go ahead and import our movie model. And I'm gonna define calculate movie rating, and I'll just go ahead and say all. Now the reason I have it, well, backwards, it's just it's a lot easier to read this way because I'm also gonna say uh, calculate movie rating and needs updating, something like that. Okay, so all is gonna be simple. It's gonna be query set of movie.objects.all. And then I'll go ahead and do for object or obj in qs, obj dot, well, what, what do we wanna do? Calculate this rating. And then we'll go ahead and say save being true. Great. So. This is really nice. I'm gonna go ahead and call this a task 
So I'll say task underscore calculate movie rating all and task underscore calculate movie rating needs updating. So when I say needs updating, what I want to do is some sort of recent update here. So I want to change this query set. Now, typically speaking, you could write the query set changes right in here and actually filter them. But I'm going to actually put it into the model itself because, well, this is actually how I would do it, which is declare a new class, so I'll movie manager, and there's going to be models.manager. And I'll go ahead and say pass for now. With that manager, I'll go ahead and add it in as objects like that. Then I'll go ahead and create class movie query set and this is models dot query set and I'll go ahead and set needs updating as the query set that I want in here. So this is going to self dot filter. What it's going to filter for is rating last updated is null being true. Definitely want that. But I also want another one. I actually want two of them. So I'll go ahead and do from Django dot db dot models. We're going to import Q. What Q lookups allow you to do is add an either or condition here. So this being one of them and the other one being last updated. Well, how many days ago do I want to specify when this was done? So in other words, I have my time zone here. Now I can go and say now equals to time zone dot now. And then how long ago does it need to be updated? Let's go ahead and say that days ago equals to now minus date time dot date time or rather time delta and there's going to be days and we'll go ahead and say three days okay so if it's newer than three days then we'll update it if it's null then we'll update it meaning then if it's greater than or equal to three days ago that last rating we want to update it so this might be something else that I actually change the calc time to is going to be three days calc time in days and we'll go ahead and put that there and then down in this one the rating average here will also put this in days as well. So both of them sort of fall align with the exact same sort of updating. So this need updating then I'm going to go ahead and add it into my movie manager. First thing is we're going to override the get query set method, the default one, pass in args and keyword args. And then we'll go ahead and return the movie query set self dot model and using self dot underscore DB. And then I'll go ahead and just add in this function as well called needs updating. And then I'll return get query or self dot get query set and then needs updating. Great. So again, if it's older than days ago, greater than or equal to days ago, that's actually incorrect. It should be less than or equal to because it's in the past, which means it's less numbers, if you will, less date, older date. This should be a different kind of query in my opinion, but that's what it is. Okay, which you'll play around with, of course, and obviously, it's easy to get them confused. Anyways, so now we have a new task here. So I actually have two things in here that I can do, and this is needs updating. All right, so now these are basically, uh, well, one is a query set, one's the other one. So I'm actually going to define the task as calculate movie ratings. And I'll go ahead and say all being false, and that's it. So basically, I want to default to it needs updating. And I'll go ahead and say if all, then the query set is quite literally all of them. And that's it. That's actually the function I want. So that I can just toggle between those two things, those two different states. Um, great. So now that I've got this, let's go ahead and make it into a management command. I'm going to go ahead and do that by grabbing the fake ratings. I'll copy the whole thing. Inside of movies, we'll go ahead and do our management and then our commands. And then the file itself, calculate ratings, paste that whole thing in there. And of course, now it's going to be from movies.tasks. We probably don't even need the rating itself unless we want the value of how many things were rated. 
uh, which of what I'm not going to do. Count, I don't need. I don't need to show the total. I don't need any arguments, actually, other than maybe all. So I'll go ahead and say, instead of show total, I'll go ahead and do all. Get rid of these. And so now, we'll just do all, all, the default being false. And we'll go ahead and run this calculate ratings total. And let's make sure what the argument is, which of course is all. So all being all. There we go. And now, of course, I need my init functions inside, or init modules rather, inside of each one of these folders. So in commands and management. Okay, so now I can do Python and manage.py. And we'll go ahead and do calculate ratings, hit enter. Maybe it'd be calculate averages, um, but it will take a little time before it actually does all of them, uh, but it will actually do them. And we would be able to check this out, uh, assuming that our movie admin was changed just a little bit. So let's go into our movie admin and we'll go ahead and do list display. I wanna add in the ratings last updated here. And then I also want to have the rating average instead of calculate it. And then the read only field can still be this and as well as the average itself and maybe the rating count also in there as well. So we save those refresh in here and there we go. So last updated and I should see, start seeing a lot more that were recently updated. Um, and it's all going to be based off of, well, in this case, it's a lot of them because they all haven't been updated in a really long time. So perhaps I want to have a limit in here actually, and I'll go ahead and say count being uh, none. And then essentially if count is not none, then I'll go ahead and do, or rather if the count is an is instance, is instance, and we'll go ahead and say count of int, then I'll say QS equals to QS up to whatever that count is. That's probably a little better. And so now in here, let's bring back the count that we had. So I'll just go ahead and copy the fake ratings one right here. And we'll give a default of, let's say 10,000. Otherwise it will take a long time. 10,000 will probably still take a long time as well. So let's actually bring this down to maybe a thousand. And then again, going count equals to options.get and count. And we'll pass this in here now. So count equaling to count. And let's close that off, run it again. So this time a thousand should actually come through there, uh, which again, will take a long time. So this is another reason why we absolutely want to delay this to another time, but I still want it to run somewhat regularly. And so if I change the count, let's change it to, you know, a hundred and hit enter. This of course is gonna be super fast, but this is gonna allow me to just pop off a hundred at a time, okay? And so the other thing about our task here is perhaps the needs updating isn't what I'm always gonna want, right? Perhaps in my actual you know command line here, it's just gonna be a hundred. And so what I actually want to do is order the query sets, all of them uh, by, so qs.order by, the reverse of the rating count, rating last updated, or rather not the reverse, but the oldest ones showing up first. So ordering it in this way will then allow that the older ones are showing up and those are the ones I'm actually calculating uh, if there are definitely ones there. Oh yes, and I need to do that. You can't actually order it before you take a, or after you take a slice as this error is showing us. So there we go. Now we have a new task that we want our project to consistently run. This is a good basis for now implementing Celery. We have two different tasks that we wanna run regularly in development. One we wanna run regularly in production, which would be just calculating or recalculating these averages. So the other part about these calculated ratings here, uh, at least the task itself, is inside of our ratings, inside of the models themselves, 
we actually do have ratings in here and we also have a content object that's coming through in here. So this is a good place to think about in terms of if I do create a new rating, perhaps every once in a while, I'm gonna to want to update the rating for the actual content object itself. As in, as soon as a new rating comes in, then we attempt to calculate that rating, right? So if I come back into my model here, we've got this as the content object itself. That is something that we might wanna consider also. Uh, now, before I do that, I want to implement the celery functionality, and then we'll talk about when I do the actual receiver function for any given rating on how I calculate it from there. Now we're gonna go ahead and implement Celery. Now I think of Celery as a completely separate application from Django because it really just runs on its own. It needs to have its own process and it also needs to have its own data store. Now Django integrates with it really, really nicely, but if you think of Celery as a separate process, hopefully it makes it a little bit easier to understand how to actually work with it in terms of Django. So we actually already have a couple really good use cases. And if we go into movies and tasks.py, we've got this function to calculate ratings. Now, calculating ratings often will take a long time. Now, there are ways to make this more efficient, but overall, they can take a long time. So the key thing here is we want to be able to calculate these ratings on a regular schedule. Now, this is also true if even we are calculating the ratings after a user rates it. Now, the reason being is even if a user rates it, if there's 10,000 ratings to something, we are not gonna wanna calculate that immediately and we're also not gonna use Django to calculate it. We would wanna use Celery to calculate it. And again, Celery and Django are just running Python functions in this case. So let's go ahead and see what I mean by both of these things, by implementing Celery and then seeing how we can use Celery to run these functions. So inside of my main Django configuration folder, I'm gonna go ahead and add in celery.py. And this is standard. It's standard practice to take whatever your main Django configuration folder is and add the celery configuration in here. This is actually not configuration. This is actually declaration for celery. The configuration objects themselves will come from settings.py based off of how we declare our Celery app, which is what we'll do right now. So first and foremost, let's go ahead and import OS. Then we're gonna go ahead and do from Celery. We're gonna import the class Celery. So the Celery package and so on. Then we'll go ahead and declare our Celery app as the variable, just simply Celery. And that's pretty much it. We now have our Celery app. Now there's additional configuration I need to add, but this in its core is a Celery application. Now, in order for me to run this Celery application, I need to make sure that my project is aware of it. So inside of the init method here, we'll go ahead and do from.celery. We're gonna import the app as celery underscore app. And then we'll do declare the all tuple and put in the Celery app in here. And there we go. Okay, so at this point, I actually have a Celery application. It doesn't do a whole lot, but it is there. So in my actual uh, you know, virtual environment, in the SRC folder, I can actually run Celery and dash capital A as in app, and then the CFE home here. Now again, the reason I can call CFE home is because of this init method is looking for this Celery module and more specifically for the app. I hit enter and there we go. We actually have a way to do it. So if I call worker on here, which is something we will do, it gives me this error, can't connect to things. Uh, no surprise there. Okay, so I'm gonna go hit Control C several times to close it down. We will see that error again and talk about it in a moment. Um, so what I wanna do is I wanna allow Celery to know about Django and vice versa. I want them to be able to work with each other. So one of the ways you do this is by first off setting the default environment for the default configuration itself. So the default Django module. Now, the quickest and easiest way to grab this is in the WSGI file. It's right here. It's literally copying that same thing out. So wherever your WSGI file is, you can just go ahead and paste that. Now in my case, and hopefully in your case, you are using CFE Home as your main Django project configuration folder where settings.py is. But if you're not, just be aware 
that this is just using python.notation to find that. In other words, CFE home is the folder, that's this right here, settings.py is the Django settings module, thus the Django settings module is the environment variable for that. No big shocker here. Next, what we want to do is we want to have Celery being configured from that same settings module, and we'll do app dot and config from object. This is going to be in django.conf colon settings. So this is the way to get into the Django settings as well, also from just Django standard, right? So if your project was different, it, let's say your project, you did the name of ABC, everything else is roughly the same. The only difference is going to be your default Django settings module. That's it. Now this inside of the Celery app, I also declare the same name for the project itself. That's optional, but something that's really nice. Okay, so with this configuration, what I can also do is declare a namespace to being something like Celery. You can call it whatever you'd like, but it will come in handy in just a little bit. This means in settings.py is where I'll actually configure the additional settings for Celery. I don't have to do it this way, but it's really nice with Django. So then all of the Django related things, all of those settings are in settings.py, not in individual modules like it could be. So the next thing is we'll just go ahead and do app.auto discover tasks. This will come in handy in just a moment. I'll explain that as well in the next video when we start using Celery tasks. But the next thing, of course, is actually doing this configuration. So at this point, if I save it and I just run Celery again with Celery-A, CFE Home, and Worker, hit Enter, I get roughly the same thing, but this time it's, it's still giving me this incorrect value here. So I actually want to set that value to a Redis server. So going into my settings now, I'm going to use my Celery settings. So underneath this root URL conf, I'll go ahead and do Celery underscore. The Celery setting I want to set here is the broker URL. And in this case, I'm going to set it equal to Redis colon slash slash localhost. And I'll give it some gibberish, which is one, two, three, four. The reason that's gibberish is because basically nobody uses one, two, three, four as default for Redis. We save this and now when I run it, it's actually gonna use this Celery broker URL instead of what it had as the default, which it's showing right here. So that namespace thing actually makes a difference here. I'm gonna go ahead and clear it out. So if I come back in and change the namespace to, you know, worker, for example, save that and let's go ahead and run it again. This time it goes back to the default. That's because I changed that namespace. So in settings.py, I would also have to change this namespace to worker. I hit control C a few times, run it again. And yet again, it's giving us back to what the proper namespace is. So control C, close that out and clear it out. Now I wanna leave it in as celery. It's actually the default is to leave it in as celery. That's what most people do. Unless of course you have a lot of different celery workers, which you totally could. That is definitely outside the context of what we're trying to do here. So let's go ahead and leave them both in as Celery. Now I will say another way to declare the actual settings is using app.conf. And then in our case, it was broker URL. You can absolutely set it like this as well. Although the Django settings might override that. And this is the method that you would use if you were not using Django. If you are using Django, definitely use the Django settings configuration for that. But if you ever see something like app.conf.brokerurl, you can have it in as celery, you know, broker URL. That's kind of the point. So another one that you might see is app and then .conf .result backend. And in some cases you'll do Django DB. In my case, I'm gonna go ahead and put in that exact thing. So coming under here, celery and result backend being equal to Django dash DB. And then I'll go ahead and add in another one, which is the beat scheduler. And I'll just copy and paste this one. So we've got celery dot schedulers dot database scheduler. Uh, this one can actually go to the top. We save that. And now when I try to run Celery, I'm going to get another error, basically saying that, hey, Celery results is not in installed apps. So let's go ahead and grab that one. 
and bring it up to installed apps. So external app, or rather external apps and internal apps. So now it's installed apps. What do we do when we install a new app? We do migrate. And so it migrates all of these things related to celery results. Let's go ahead and run this again. This time I don't have errors other than trying to connect to Redis, which we'll still solve. Great. Next, I'm gonna go ahead and just have the beat server run real quick. We'll talk about that in a little bit too. Um, and so the beat server itself, I get another error about, well, Django beat. So that's another thing I need to add in, which is not actually that surprising either. It's just Django celery beat. And this is gonna be our scheduler. And this saves our task results, as we'll see. Great. So I added another thing. Let's go ahead and migrate it. And there we go. So I can run celery-a CFE home and beat. That is another way to run the beat server. This time I should still have an issue with connecting to, to Redis, uh, but this is actually going off of my scheduler here within my Django database, which is fantastic. So that means in my Django database, I can actually start scheduling tasks once we have them fully up and running. So the last thing is, of course, that pesky Redis instance here. So I hope that you have Redis installed. If you don't have Redis installed on your machine, go into the repository for Recommender and take a look at all of the helpful guides related to installing Redis. If for some reason you're having a really hard time installing it on your local machine, just use the cloud-based Redis server. That will solve so many issues for you. So if you do use the cloud-based one, you would just put in your cloud IP along with the default Redis instance port, which would be 6379. That's how you would do it. Now I'm gonna stick with local host because I actually have it running through Docker. I also have it running on my machine otherwise. So I do want to change how I configure this as well. So to do this change, we are gonna go ahead and come into SRC here and just do dot env. Inside of here, I'm gonna go ahead and declare my celery broker Redis URL. And in my case, I'll set it equal to Redis colon slash slash local host. And then it's gonna be in my case, 6380. Now, the reason I know it's 6380 and it might also be 6380 for you is because of Docker Compose. Right, so I have Docker Compose in here at 6380, which yields out something like that. And if I do Docker PS, I can also see that the port is 6380 and using 000, I can use local host as well. So that is actually how I know that that's the environment variable. Now, of course, if I'm gonna write my environment variables or start that process, I'm gonna go ahead and add in debug. And I'll also add in my secret key these are things that you will want to put in to your environment variables because, well, if we're going to set up one, we might as well set up a couple. So going back into settings, I'm now going to import from decouple. We're going to import the package called config. So decouple or Python decouple is a way to load in environment variables. I've also used python.env. That's another one that's pretty cool. I really like Python config for this reason. In this debug, I can grab the environment variable of debug, or if we want to make things a little bit more specific, I can do something more like that. And then I wanna set the default value, and I'm gonna go ahead and set the default at zero, and then I'm gonna go ahead and cast it down to a Boolean value. So all this means is gonna actually end up being true or false in here. And this is a really clean and easy way to do that. So this is working off of that .env file, which we can go back and forth on and change. The secret key, hey, we might as well do the same thing. So I'll go ahead and pop this out as well. Copy in here and put it in as my secret key. Back into my settings, I'll go ahead and just do config and secret key, default being none, right? So if I don't actually have a secret key set, I should probably have it as none. Cool. So with that configuration, coming back down to my broker URL, this is gonna be my default. So I'll go ahead and do config and default being that Redis URL, 
which of course is typically the default. And then my environment variable, I called celery broker, broker Redis URL. So I can actually come in here and use that just like that. Now, if I try to use my celery worker and my beat server, I can do celery dash A, capital A that is CFE home worker and dash dash beat, which will actually start both the scheduler and the worker process. And notice it's saying settings debug leads to a memory leak. That's okay. But it's also showing me that it's actually connected to 6380. Very good. So that's setting up Celery. Of course, we need to implement a lot of the features of Celery now, but getting to this process of actually just setting it up, I think is an important discussion and why we spent a good amount of time on doing so. Now, you might actually look at the Celery docs and be like, hey, um, it's actually pretty easy to do all of this stuff. I think it is pretty easy to do all this stuff. But I think the explanation behind a lot of the rationale on using a number of things related to Celery is important to know as well. So let's go ahead and implement some tasks now within Celery. Now in the repo, we have this Celery reference.md or markdown file specifically so you can see how to do some of the basic things related to Celery. What we're going to do in this one is we're going to convert some of our task functions into proper Celery tasks. And we'll go ahead and test these things out. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to actually run my celery beat and worker all in one instance. Then I want to go ahead and jump into, let's jump into the first one, which is going to be our movies tasks.py. And we're going to go ahead and run off of this one. So the idea here is we first need to import from celery. We're going to import a shared task decorator. Using this decorator allows me to use a few methods on this function itself. So the methods go as this, and this is in the reference as well. Uh, but the idea here is we can now use the function itself. So the standard function call, right? So like that, we can also use something called delay. This will turn it into celery. So these are celery tasks. And then finally, we will do something called apply and async. So apply async is nice for several reasons. One is we actually convert our keyword arguments into a dictionary instead of into uh, actual keyword arguments still. And the reason for this is something along the lines of passing in another argument called countdown and we can actually delay this from running for like 30 seconds. Now, of course, inside of the function itself could have a you know time uh, dot sleep if we wanted to, but really apply async is how I use Celery pretty much all across the board. So that is one way on how we could just trigger this from running. Now there is another way, and that is if we use our shared task and give it a name, I'm going to give it the same name as the function itself. So task calculate movie ratings. So what we could also do is inside of our celery.py right underneath here, underneath here, I can do app.conf.beat underscore schedule. And I can declare a beat schedule by default. So for example, I want to run all movie ratings, let's say every 30 minutes. So to do this, I'll go ahead and give it a name first or a key value pair. So I'll go ahead and call this run um, the movie rating average every 30. This is going to be the key value. Next in here is our task name itself, which we just gave it one. It's this name right here. So if I didn't have that in there, if I didn't have that task name, then I would have to use the dot notation, which would be movies.tasks, and then the actual function name itself. But since I gave it a name, I can use that. That's going to be the task that we will end up calling. Then we can add in a schedule here. And what is the schedule that I want this to run? And I said every 30 minutes. So the schedule by default will be in seconds. So 60 seconds, of course, is well, 60 seconds, that is one minute. So we can go ahead and do 30 minutes like that. So this is 30 minutes. Okay. And then I can also pass in that same sort of idea, keyword args. 
And so this, I can then say, well, let's go back into it. I've got a count in here, which I could limit the number, or I could just say all. I'm gonna go ahead and say all being true. Save it, and there we go. So now I have a beat schedule. I'm gonna go ahead and close down my celery worker, and I'm gonna run it again. Notice that info's on there. If I run it again now, uh, what I would end up getting is a shared task. Takes no profession. Oh, yeah, so we wanna say the name equals to that. <laughs> That's why it's incorrect. So let's go ahead and try that again. And now we've got the name in here. So this is now a named value for that particular task. And it's gonna run every 30 minutes now. Well, let's actually run it every 30 seconds so we can see the results. Let me close this out and run it again. And now it's gonna run every 30 seconds. So what we should see is after 30 seconds happens, it's gonna go ahead and execute it. Notice that it says the schedule changed. So it actually did notice that the previous schedule of 30 minutes it has changed to now just simply 30 seconds. Um, and so what we'll see in a short amount of time is that it actually receives a new value for this to even run. So one other aspect of this is to verify that this app is also in the admin schedule. So if we actually pull up the admin itself and log in, navigate down to my new section of periodic tasks, I wanna click on periodic task. And what do you know? There is the name of my task, run movie rating every 30. Now it gives me that interval schedule of 30 seconds. So it's literally going based off of that. So coming back in here, it now shows me that the task was received. So every 30 seconds is gonna receive that task and run it. Now it doesn't happen immediately as we saw, but it will now run every 30 seconds, which of course, if I actually wanna run all of the ratings every 30 seconds, that is gonna overload our worker pretty quickly. So I'm gonna go ahead and change it back to being every 30 minutes and we'll close this out. And I will actually run it again because I do wanna show you how to trigger the tasks manually. So while that shuts down, I'm gonna go ahead and come back into my tasks here. I've got these movie task ratings. I'm gonna go ahead and import the function now. So Python, and we'll go ahead and do manage.py shell. Oops, let's navigate into the SRC folder and run that again. So now we're going to from movies.tasks, we're gonna import that function. And again, we could call it just like that. That runs basically the default. I can also call it as delay. Again, runs the default. This time it shows me an async result, which going back into my celery process, eventually this will need to terminate. Now the reason it hasn't terminated yet is because it's still running a few tasks. And so it won't necessarily get the new tasks yet, but it will be running down all of those other tasks. So the cool thing about celery is I can actually run another instance of it. So let's, uh, oh, it, I'm already in the SRC folder, so I'll go ahead and run Celery. Let me just break this down. We'll do Celery-A, CFE home, worker-L, as in log level, info, and then I'll go ahead and do beat, hit enter. This creates another instance of that. And what it does do is it grabs those tasks that I created, right? So the, the single task that I made with just delay, this will now grab it while the other one is still shutting down because it's still running some other tasks. So this is why it's a distributed worker queue, a distributed task queue, is I can actually run Celery multiple times and it will work off of the same Redis instance and then they'll, they'll be able to run all of these different tasks. It's really, really cool in this case. Now, of course, I also wanted to see that apply async. So apply async here and do countdown of maybe 10 seconds, I run that. And so it, it does receive that task, but it's not gonna execute it for 10 seconds. It's not gonna attempt to execute it for at least 10 seconds. Um, now it's not always perfect, depending on how much demand is happening on the load of the worker process itself, but it does work pretty well. So this is all to say that in my celery.py here, I actually did create a schedule that then gets integrated to the Django admin. So in the Django admin, if I were to change the schedule, 
like it already did for me, uh, that's okay. You absolutely can change it in here and it should change. But the next time you reboot Celery, it's most likely going to go back. Now I'm getting this database is locked here because, well, for several reasons, one of them being that um, this calculating task thing is just absolutely crushing the database right now. So it's definitely not something that we're going to want to do too much. I actually ran it two times, which, which is why the database is just absolutely getting demolished and why it is uh, currently locked and why it's not able to run anything else. In fact, these tasks that I ran also might be failing. It might actually not be doing anything in the database itself. So we can actually review these tasks by going into task results and see all of the various tasks that are happening in here, assuming that they may or may not be running. In this case, it is, which is cool. Uh, so the apply async is running. Uh, it just so happens that, well, it just is running only for certain tasks, not necessarily the Django admin. So uh, that's actually really, really nice. And we can use all of these tasks, we can declare any sort of task that we want to be a function inside of Celery using this shared task decorator. So the other ones, of course, are going to be these ratings here. I'm going to come in and I want to generate fake reviews for the ratings. And oops, let's go ahead and copy that again, paste in here. And again, I'll go ahead and share task name being the generate fake reviews task. Now, I often name these things the same, but of course, if you end up naming the things the same, then you won't be able to reuse it, right? So if I had another task in somewhere in my uh, entire project called generate fake reviews, we'd have some conflicts there and that's something we wanna avoid whenever possible. Okay, so now what I can do is of course, I can actually generate these fake reviews in a couple different ways. So the first thing that I would need to do is refresh my worker process. Now, the reason I need to refresh that is because I named a new task. So I need to restart the worker process itself to identify that these new tasks have changed. This is true even if I just give it a new name, right? So if I shut it down and then restart it, I will see the way to actually call this task, right? And this harkens back to when we were talking about inside of here of running this beat schedule. Now, I don't have to declare this beat schedule in here. In fact, I usually don't have a beat schedule hard-coded in the Django project at all. Instead, what I do is I will name my tasks. I will absolutely restart my worker process and my beat server. And then I will actually come into the Django admin. And this is where I declare my periodic tasks. And I give them a name. So I'm going to go ahead and say uh, fake review and generator. And then the task itself is going to be generate fake reviews. And then my interval schedule on whatever I want it to be. In my case, I'll do 30. Down here, I can add in keyword arguments and positional arguments. And this is one of the thing with that celery reference that we talked about of the actual async and whatnot in there, right? So the async functions coming down here. That's this right here. So keyword args is roughly the same thing, but of course they have to be actual arguments for that function itself for it to work. So in this case, I need to know what the fake review generator arguments actually are. So going back into that, here are the actual arguments. So I could just use count and users. So in this case in here, I'll come back down and I'll do count and we'll do, let's do a thousand and then users. Let's also do a, uh, let's do 500. And so this is gonna happen every 30 seconds. So we'd save and continue. Still the database is locked. So we might have to uh, refresh and run it again. This time it actually did save it. And if we come back into our arguments, let's just verify those are on there. We've got our interval schedule. It is enabled. Uh, so this should actually start running uh, as far as our periodic tasks are concerned. If we look in our worker process, we see that the schedule has changed. So it might take a moment before the schedule starts enacting. Uh, and it also might be consumed by the other one, uh, the other running task. But those are all done now, which is great. So that finally did finish all of those tasks. Um, and now we just have the single one running. And there we go. So now it's actually running there. And it looks like it's printing out or showing that print statement that we have 
uh, somewhere in there, or in this case, it's actually returning back the new ratings. So what's happening here, since I have info being verbose or the actual log level being verbose, I actually do see the results coming back. That's why we saw that. Okay, so I can also grab the ID here. So this is the task ID and go into task results and look for that scene, that same task ID come in here. There's the success and here's the result data. So those are all of the new ratings according to this function right here. So of course we could change this to where it doesn't return anything if we wanted to, or it just returns the variable or you know some sort of print statement on how many actually were created and all that. Um, I'll let you switch that as you need or as you see fit. Uh, but now it's gonna just continue to build more and more ratings, which is great. That is really, really important. And then every 30 minutes or so, we will have the actual uh, calculation of these ratings happening as well. And if we go back into Celery, this is gonna do all of them, which is probably not what I want. I actually probably want to limit them down to a certain number, like maybe a thousand, like we're doing with a bunch of other ones, or let's do the count being down to uh, 10,000 or 20,000. Okay, so that's a lot of ratings that are gonna end up happening uh, in any given time. And so now with that count changing, I'm gonna go ahead and close down my worker, my beat server itself. The beat server will still um, be able to accept new tasks because Celery is going to read from Redis and Redis is where it's gonna be getting those new tasks from in some cases. Um, so at this point now, we can actually have this running always and i actually will so going forward um, in this entire series i will have the celery beat server running uh, just next to where we're going to be doing all of our various django commands um, in here cool so we now have a hopefully a much better understanding of how to use celery how to actually implement some of the functions and really it's incredibly simple it's just adding the decorator of shared task so we can execute any given function with Celery. And how we have it all set up gives us the ability to use all of the Django models and all of the Django features. If we didn't have it set up in the way we did, we wouldn't be able to use the Django database or the Django features um, as we have been using, which is also, I think, pretty compelling as well. So yeah, that's it for this one. If you have any questions, let me know. Let's, otherwise, let's keep going. Now we're going to go back and be a little Django specific in the sense that we are going to be creating some views so I can actually look at this content so I can actually rate things as if I was a user. So to do this, it's going to be a couple things. We're going to make the views and then we're going to go ahead and make the template and then we'll take a look at it with URLs. So first and foremost in views.py for movies, this is where we're going to work. We're going to go ahead and do from django.views. We're going to import the generic module and they'll do from dot models. And we're going to go ahead and import our movie and that'll do class movie list view, which is going to be generic dot list view. And then we'll set in our query set here being movie dot objects dot all. We'll change that in a moment. The template name, we'll go ahead and just do movies list.html. This is how I prefer to write out these template names. You can use the default if you'd like. And if you're not familiar with class-based views, they are really simple. I'm not gonna really need to do a whole lot more to this and we'll talk about that in a second. Next, we're gonna go ahead and do the movie detail view, which of course is also a detail view. And this is gonna be just simply detail. So the key thing with these two views, more specifically the list view, is well how i end up looking at it like what ends up coming back on this query set now we have a lot of movies so i'm also going to add in paginate by and some arbitrary number in this case i'll just say 100 so it'll allow me to add pagination into my template itself so now that i've got these views we want to think of these views as function based views still so i'll go ahead and do movie list view and it's going to be the class as view, just like that. And so we could do this same thing down here with our movie detail view, just like that. 
So these generic views, these class-based views, really just shortcut how to write out a function-based view. Basically, they'll give us the same sort of availability in each template every time I use the generic. So the context variable in here is going to be object, and the primary context variable in here is going to be object list. Right? So we've got a list in here and an object, a single object in here, and that's gonna be looked up through an ID or a slug. Now we're gonna be using ID. Great, and this is a stored ID in our Django database, of course. Now that we've got that, let's go ahead and grab urls.py just for the structure. So inside of movies back in there, we'll go ahead and do urls.py. We'll paste this in and I wanna do from dot, dot import views. The base view is gonna be just an empty string this is going to be views dot, well, movie list view, just like that. And then our path for the actual detail view is going to be movie and detail view. And we wanna pass in either the ID or we're gonna go ahead and pass in the slug. So in this case, I'm gonna do the ID. Now I always forget which direction these two things go. So I always just put one in and see if that ends up working. And we'll see that in just a moment. Next up in our URLs, our main configuration URLs, I'll go ahead and add in just simply path. I'll leave it in as an empty path and we'll go ahead and do uh, include and it's gonna be movies.urls. Okay, and so I wanna add in the include here. There we go. Okay, so as we see here, we've got an exception. ID colon int is invalid. So I actually have it inverted. This should be int and ID. Now the reason I always forget which direction it goes has everything to do with the fact that when you're typing, so if I did my view here and I passed in the argument, if you used typed definitions, it's this direction. So this is just the reverse of that, which is a little nonsensical to me, but nevertheless, we now have a dynamic path here. I will put a trailing slash. Okay, so I actually maybe wanna put these URLs just at movies. So we'll just go ahead and change this to being just simply movies. So let's go ahead and take a look at that URL, go to slash movies, and of course I've got no template existing. So here's the default template name and here's the one that we wanna create. So with this in mind, I'm gonna go ahead and create templates inside of my app. I could totally make site-wide templates and in fact, maybe I should. So let's go back into settings and we'll navigate down to our templates here. And I'm just gonna use base dir slash templates. So in SRC now, I'll go ahead and create templates. And what I really want is base.html. This is what I almost always start with with my templates. I'm gonna go into getbootstrap.com just for some styling things. You don't have to use Bootstrap, but I'm going to. And I'm gonna navigate into the Bootstrap example that has HTML, CSS, and JavaScript already in there that we can just use instead of just their blank HTML document. So with this in mind, I'll go ahead and call this a recommender. And instead of hello world, I'll go ahead and do block content and then in block. Great, so maybe we'll improve the styling a bit later, but for now, inside of my templates, I'll go ahead and add in movies and we'll create list.html. This of course is going to extend the base.html. And then we'll go ahead and add in our blocks. So block content and end block. Okay, so to do our iterations here, I'm actually going to go back into Bootstrap, go into examples, and I just wanna see something that might be a good example album right here looks like a good example as to how I want to view each individual uh, movie, if you will. At first, I won't have any thumbnails, but I will at least emulate what's going on here. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy that. I wanna go up to the row level. So I'll go ahead and edit as HTML. This might give me way too much examples of data, but I'll go ahead and copy it anyway. And I'm gonna paste it in here. Okay, great. So here is a bunch of HTML data. Hopefully you already know a bit about HTML so you'd be able to you know, navigate through this. 
the main row part is what we're going to be blocking down. And then I just want one of these columns. So this right here, I'll go ahead and cut out. And then I will delete all of the other ones that are in there because we just simply don't need them. So now I've got the row. And then if I paste that column back in, I now have that column. So going back into our templates here, I now see, hey, there is a thumbnail. So this is just generally speaking, the idea that we want to work off of. So now I'll go ahead and do for uh, object in object list. And this will allow me to iterate through this whole thing. So the title, we'll do object at title and not in caps, but lowercase. And we'll go ahead and leave that thumbnail in there. The body text, we'll go ahead and put in object at overview, save that, refresh. And it looks like we forgot to close off this for loop here. So outside of the div, I'll go ahead and do an in four. Every once in a while, it might be a good idea to add in a note like end row and end column, right? So that's this column here. But now that I've refreshed that, I've got my thumbnail and it looks like I've got some things here. So maybe title is not the correct one, but rather maybe it's object.name. I will have to double check what that is because it's not coming in. Oh, there's why. This is a placeholder image title. So I'll go ahead and just come down here, add an h3 and do object.title. And I'll get rid of this placeholder thing because we don't need that. We might put an image in later. Okay, great. So there are all of these movies now. And of course, these buttons here, uh, we will have actually relevant. So the view button, I'll change into a href and we'll give the href being, well, it's really just object.get absolute URL. I'll go ahead and get rid of this. Then I'm gonna go ahead and do object.rating underscore average. And then in there, I'll do object, two curly brackets, object.rating underscore count. Save that, refresh in here. And I've got none. So if there is a none value, we want to not show those. So then I'll just go ahead and say, if object.rating average, and if, great. The view, the get absolute URL part, we're gonna go into our model and I'm gonna define get absolute URL and we're just gonna return movies slash self.id. Save that, refresh in here and still showing none. So let's go back into that template again. So if object rating is not none, perhaps that will be, there we go. So now I can actually view the detail. I'll have to fix that one in a moment. Um, but the idea here is we are now seeing a bunch of these elements here. Now, what I actually want though, is when I do view these, I actually want them to be ordered a little bit different. So I'll go ahead and say order by, and we'll just go ahead and say average, or rather rating underscore AVG, save that and refresh. And that should refresh our average for this query set. And we actually want to have this reversed. So where the highest number comes up for first and there we go. So we do have a bunch of things that have been rated and this is now showing us, well, we're getting a lot closer to actually being able to make this a little bit useful. So going back into this view here, I realized I said ID, I actually should have said primary key. So in the URL itself, for the movie detail view, this is still an integer and it should be PK, not ID. So I'll go ahead and refresh that. And now again, it's saying template does not exist. No surprise there. So in movies list, I'll go ahead and just copy it. I'm gonna rename this to being detail. And instead of it being an object list, I'll just get rid of that for loop and still keep that column going and save it like that. Refresh and there we go. So with this in mind, notice that I used the exact same thing over and over. So realistically, I probably don't need this right here showing up. In other words, we can say if object.get absolute 
URL in request.path, um, well, then we won't show that. So realistically, if it's not in request.path, then we won't show that button. And now I can refresh in here, and what do you know? So now it actually gives me the little bit of dynamic reviewing of some of this data. Uh, it's really hilarious that Mars Attacks is <laughs> rate, rated at five. Um, but the other thing about this, inside of my movies here, I'm gonna go ahead and add in a snippet, and this is going to be my card. So my movie card. And the card itself is going to be what exists inside of the column here. So I'll go ahead and cut this whole thing out. And now I've got that column. I'm gonna put this in the card. And then in here, we'll just go ahead and say include movies snippet and card.html with object equaling to object. So I think it's really important to include the variables that you want to include here. And so there we go. And this same idea, we're gonna go ahead and put into the list as well. We will keep the column value the same, but now we've got that snippet also object.object. .object. And if you said instance here, you would just change this to be an instance and so forth. Great, so now that we've got this, I can now have the card showing up. Let's go ahead and make sure that everything is saved up. Refresh, and there we go. Okay, so this is quite a bit better of a display. Now, one of the things that I would probably want are images for this, especially with movies, right? Those, those thumbnail images that they have, the poster images that they have are fantastic. But what I really wanted, the purpose of getting to this point is to now allow me to eventually rate this, right? So if I come back into the card here, what I can do then is eventually add in some sort of like select group and do our option for my rating, right? So one, two, three, four, and so on, right? And we will definitely add this into being dynamic, not what it is right now, uh, but eventually I wanna have that option in there. That's kind of the key with this. And we'll do form-control. And so we want this rating to actually work with something like, well, asynchronous loading on the front end. So when I come in here and I change it at any time, it automatically updates the back end and all of that would show up according uh, to this particular request for this particular user. And then all of the rating things would update as well. Yeah, perhaps we would have the rating next to the actual number itself. Um, maybe it'd be actually over there instead, which is certainly an option as well. And we'll probably have to change the classes just slightly here by adding in a div and coming down here. And let's take a look now. And there we go. So now we've got the rating right up there. Yeah, so I'll have to play around with that. But overall now we have a better look at what the user interface will get closer to being like for our users for rating movies. And then at some point, the homepage would just have a bunch of recommended movies for you to rate as well. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and implement Django all off for absolute basic authentication so that we can actually have our users be able to log in and view things. Now, of course, we could go into a lot more detail with Django all off. We could also have, you know, third party login with like Facebook or Twitter or something like that. But I really just want some sort of login that's not the admin. So I'm gonna start by actually using Django all off. Now to do this, I'm actually gonna go into my requirements here. So inside of requirements.txt, I'll just go ahead and add in Django dash all off as a new dependency. And then I'll install it with Python dash M and then dot dot slash or rather pip install dash R dot dot slash requirements.txt. And so that I can actually install all off and all that. And while that's running, I'll go ahead and start with the configuration process. So in settings.py, we're gonna go into installed apps. And in external apps, I'll go ahead and add in uh, a couple things. Actually, first the internal app of django.contrib.sites. And since I'm using the sites framework, which is one of the requirements for all off, I'm also gonna set up my site ID uh, being to the default one, which is one, okay? 
Next up, we're going to go ahead and add in all auth as a external app, as well as all auth dot accounts. There we go. And with that, let's go ahead and run Python manage.py make migrations and python manage.py migrate and there we go okay good and next thing we're going to go ahead underneath site id i'll go ahead and add in login url to accounts login i could obviously change that at some point in the future the login redirect url is going to be just the home page then we'll go ahead and do account authentication and method only being the username. Now I'm not setting up email at this point, so I should only be able to log in with the username and not necessarily have to confirm my email, which also means that I'll do account underscore email verification being none. Okay, so email verification, of course, would be if I actually had an email uh, notification provider. So for transactional emails, then I would actually have email verification definitely turned on. Okay, so with this in mind, let's go back into our urls.py here. And I'm gonna create a new path for accounts. And this is going to include all auth.urls. Go ahead and save that. And we'll go back into our project here. Go into accounts, login. And it's redirecting me because I'm already logged in. So let's do accounts log out. And I'll go ahead and log out. And now accounts log in. And so I've got social account is not a registered tag. So this of course is because I didn't actually allow social authentication to work with Django all auth. Now I can add it, right? So if I go into installation and see the installed apps, if I just add it, it should get rid of that problem. So coming back into our settings here and bringing this in, save it and run make migrations and migrate, right? So now it's prepared to add social accounts if I needed them and now going back into my template syntax error, it goes away. Now, what I actually want is to potentially modify these templates. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time here, but what I will do is show you where you could copy them. So in VENV, we are gonna go ahead and jump in to lib, site packages, all off, templates. And so in here, we've got all of the all off templates that you might wanna use. So such as login or log out, or well, basically any of these. So one of the things that you could do is just bring it on over, use the plus sign, so option and click, or option and uh, you know, drag, and then if you are on a Windows, it'd be control click, but basically you just wanna copy it on over here, and now we could come in and change these items here. So if I didn't want to say sign in, for example, I could say login here, save it and refresh, and there, now it says login. And then I sign up first here, I should be able to sign up without an email as it says it's optional. So if I do ABC123, skip the email, add in a password, I should be able to sign up and it takes me to that arbitrary homepage now. And I should be logged in as that user. But let's go ahead and actually implement that. So I'll break down these accounts here and go to base.html. I'm gonna go ahead and add in a nav bar now. So back into Bootstrap, let's go ahead and navigate back to docs and go into our components. I just wanna find the nav bar here. And inside of this, I'll go ahead and copy this first nav bar here. And then I will go ahead inside of my templates, I'm gonna do navbar.html, paste this in here. And I just want to delete several things, but the first thing I wanna do is delete the form I'm gonna go ahead and delete pretty much this entire list except for home. Okay, and then I'll call this navbar recommender. Great. Okay, so now uh, on base.html, I'll go ahead and do include and navbar.html. Okay, so I save that and come back into my recommender. 
Looks like it's not coming through yet. So let's make sure we save nav bar as well. Oh, there we go. So I just needed to scroll up a bit. And so now I've got this going. The next thing would be just to have at the end of this to have a button maybe for my account. And I want to show the user's name here. Now, all auth actually has a cool convenient method for this. So we'll go ahead and do load account. This account library or template filter will allow me to do something like this where it's user and display and the user. So I save that and refresh. There's that username, pretty nice. And so naturally what I can do here is change it to an A tag and I can say class equals to BTN and BTN outline primary. Of course, those are bootstrap classes and I'll do href equals to, let's say accounts. Save that and there we go. I'll just make it a logout button basically. So I'll do accounts logout, save that and refresh. And so now I could just sign out with that user. Okay, great. So of course I want that nav bar uh, everywhere. So let's go ahead and grab it again, go into account, go into account base. And what do you know? I've got all sorts of stuff going on here. This one I could just hit include nav bar at the very top here. And it just subtly changes how this whole thing's going to be. Except the problem is, of course, I'm not using base.html at all. So there's a lot of different things on how I could go about doing this. But what I want to do is, well, basically grab all of the extra things that I might want. So copying this over into base.html. We'll put it underneath block content, just like in this one. And then I'll also scroll up a bit and we will use if messages. I will add this in as well. This time I'm going to go ahead and put it in its own template. So we'll go ahead and do messages.html, paste that in. And then we'll go ahead and include that, of course. So back into my other template, we'll go ahead and include messages.html. Great. And the next thing would be this head tank here. Scroll up a bit. Hopefully none of this is new to you. Uh, if it is, then we are speeding through it and you should probably check out another one of my tutorials. So now I'm going to go ahead and just get rid of all of that and just do extends based on HTML. Up oh, and save it like that. And there we go, much better. So that's it for all off. Uh, we can always improve it, but that's it for now. We have a glaring weakness in our task calculate movie ratings. And that is every single rating is going to go row by row. This is incredibly inefficient. That's because database tables, especially SQL tables, have the ability to aggregate data. It has the ability to group data as well. And so doing this row by row calculation makes no sense given that we understand this about SQL, or at least we understand it now. In fact, we've already seen this to some degree. So if we actually reverse engineer this calculate rating function, going back into the model itself, we see that these two options right here are actually how we get that data. And of course, both of these things fr come from the query set. We have a feature that's built into the Django query sets for count. And then we also have one for average, right? We created the average one. So to look at the average one, we come back in here and we see this average. This aggregates out all values in a query set and you know averages them, which generally speaking is fine, but it's not fine in our case. What we need to be able to do is take all of these ratings for any given content type and object ID and then update that thing, right? So that's actually what we want to discover now is how do we actually create a task to do so. And this is now going to be a ratings task. We're going to go ahead and remove it from the model inside of movies altogether. So this task right here, I'm going to go ahead and comment out, just completely remove it. Or actually, let's go ahead and delete it altogether. We no longer need any of these things. So I'm going to go ahead and copy the name of it to do a quick search so we can delete that task from our beat schedule as well. Uh, we might actually reuse this with our new one, uh, but I'll go ahead and remove that. And then we'll come back in here 
And if you the if you recall, we had this actual calculate movie ratings management function as well, which we will also get rid of. Uh, we can actually still use this management function uh, somewhere else. Okay, so for now, what we'll do is go back into our ratings task file. Okay, and this is where I will start to build out the new task. So we'll call this task update movie ratings. Okay, so what are the things that we need here? Well, first off, we're going to need a bunch of ratings. So I'll go ahead and say the averages, or let's just call this ratings. And there's going to be rating dot objects dot all. Okay, so we've already seen this one. But now what I can do is I can add in values. And I can say something like object ID. Now this is actually really interesting because this will give me all of the object IDs inside of ratings. Then what I could do is actually annotate this data. And now I can actually pass in the average as well. And so if I do AVG and the value, this is very similar to what we saw before, but now it's actually going to be grouped based off of the object ID. So let's actually take a look at what that is like. So first off, we'll do from Django dot uh, db models. We'll go ahead and import the average and I'll also import count. So if I go ahead and do that and I'll actually even jump into the Python shell too. So we can see all of this in the shell before we implement it. So now I got that coming through. We'll also go ahead and import from ratings models. We're going to import our rating model so that I can just take a look really quickly at that data. And if we look at maybe one of them, the very first one, we can see the data that's coming through here now. So I've got my object ID and my average. Now, if you remember the ratings, that actual model itself is a generic foreign key, which means that I could have ratings on other kinds of objects. And those other kinds of objects, like the other kind of model, might have the same object ID. So this is not great. So what I want to do then is press up. And we're going to now add in content type in here too. So I'll do comma and content type. And I hit enter. And now what it's doing is sort of grouping these two together and then getting whatever the average is for those two items together. But actually what I don't need to do is that specifically. I could just narrow the ratings down based off of movies. And we've already seen this. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to import the content type model from django.contrib content type models. We can probably find it right inside of that model right there. Then I'm going to go ahead and say C type equals to content type and now objects. So what we want is get for model and I want the movie model. I don't have the movie model right now. So we'll go ahead and do from movies dot objects import movie and then or movie from movies the models import movie and then we'll go ahead and now get that content type and there it is right there okay so if i scroll up a bit to the rating now what i can do is instead of annotating with the content type i could just filter all of the ratings down by the content type filter it to content type being that c type right there we hit enter and now these are all only movie ratings, uh, which is what this does. And then I group them all together here. So the reason this of course is important because now I will just have a bunch of ratings that correspond to specific object IDs and specific movies. So this gives me a new basis for my you know, movie rating idea here. So let's go ahead and make sure the content type is Im imported here and sure enough it is. So I'm going to go ahead and do C type equals to content type dot objects dot get for model. And of course, we already have that movie model imported here. There it is right there. And now we'll go ahead and filter this down and do content type equals to C type. OK, and so I'm going to go ahead and add in the count as well. So count being the count of, well, I'm going to go ahead and use object ID. Okay, so now this gives me all of the ratings for movies all combined together, right? So what I can do now is iterate through these and then update my movie objects based off of that. So I'll go ahead and do, well, 
this is actually not a rating, but maybe like some aggregate values. So I'll go ahead and say ag ratings because it's not actually a rating. We do have a rating in here or the average. So now we'll go ahead and do four, you know, ag rate in ag ratings or something along those lines. Um, now I'll go ahead and create something related to the movie query set. So I'll go ahead and do movie objects filter and then the ID equals to, well, let's go ahead and grab the ID from the ag rating. So ag or the ag rate of object ID. This of course is now that movie ID. So I can filter down based off of that. And with a filter, what I can do is use update. Update will of course allow me to do our rating AVG. We can do our rating count. We can also do our rating last updated. All three of those things I can do now with this data. And so the next thing of course would be our rating AVG, which is ag rate and rating. Then our rating count, again, ag rate and count. And now here we go. So we can use that, we can use that. And then the updated will be timezone.now. And I'm gonna go ahead and grab that time zone. So from Django.utils, uh, we're gonna import time zone. And let's rearrange these things just a little bit. Okay, cool. So now I have a really nice ability to run all of this. Now, one might assume like, hey, maybe this should be inside of model managers. It probably should. Um, I don't know exactly when I would use this again, to be honest, but I'm gonna leave it in here. Now, one of the biggest differences, of course, is using annotate instead of aggregate because I'm not aggregating all of the data, I'm only annotating some of the data. Uh, that's a little tricky and it's just something that you'll have to play around with, uh, but it's nice that you can actually use it in a very similar fashion either way. So now that we've got this, let's go ahead and take a look at how quickly this actually runs. So what I'm also gonna do is import time here, and I'm also gonna import date time. Now this is so I can actually log how long these things take. So I'll go ahead and do start time being time dot time, and then the end time is gonna be after that. So we'll go ahead and do end time equals to, well, time dot time minus start time. And then my delta is gonna be basically the date time dot time delta and seconds of the integer of the end time. This is actually the total time, not really the end time, but it's taking the current time and subtracting the start time. And so now I can just say print it, the uh, rating update took uh, delta, and this would be in you know minutes and whatnot. So I'll go ahead and add in the total time and put an S right next to that as in seconds. And there we go. Okay, so now that we've got this, I'll go ahead and add it in as a shared task again. Now I don't need to have it as a shared task yet because I just want to test how long it's going to take. So let's go ahead and save everything and I'll exit out of the shell so I can import this. So now from ratings.tasks, we're going to import that task and we'll go ahead and run it. And so I get this error here. So it looks like I did rating when it should be average. There we go. So let's go ahead and try that again and import and then run. And what it should take is maybe like one to three minutes. It's not gonna take nearly as long as it could. And there might be a way to improve this looping process as well, because it still will be looping through a lot of these movies themselves. Um, but what it's not doing is, well, aggregating the data anymore. The data is already prepared for us. And then it's just updating these fields versus before we were going through all of the movies, then aggregating the data, then updating the fields. It just took a lot longer and it would continue to take a lot longer. So with this in mind, I'm actually gonna rename this one and I'll give it a name of, let's give it the task update movie ratings. I'll go ahead and save that. Calculate ratings now is gonna be from uh, ratings.tasks. We're gonna import that rating here. 
I probably don't need anything related to this because I actually am just going to calculate or run all of the rating updates. So it's really just simple now because it doesn't make any sense to not have all of them updated if it really just doesn't take that long. Uh, next thing we would do is inside of Celery, I'll bring back this right here. And this is going to be, uh, let's call it run. We can actually leave it in as run movie ratings and we could do it every 30 minutes because it only takes about a minute. We can leave that in. That's fine. Um, so task update movie ratings, movie rating average, and we don't need any keyword arguments anymore, but we can keep that same schedule. Great. So let's go ahead and exit out of this now. And I want to restart Celery to make sure it's aware of these things. And I'll go ahead and run that. Now, every once in a while, when you are working with Celery, you might get a bunch of errors happening because of changing tasks names like this. So that is when you will run like Docker Compose down dash V and actually just destroy the Redis instance altogether and then just bring it back up with dash D. And this is how you get better at using all of these things and then refining it to make it really, really good. Um, of course, that does cause issues. It could cause issues with your current in-process data itself. Uh, but overall now, we have a much faster and much more efficient way to have our data show up. So now if we go into our movies, we should have, well, pretty much everything with some sort of rating. Now, that's that's also dependent on how many times we've ran ratings, right? So I've I've run a number of tasks in here. I don't think you've had that many tasks, but notice that I've got these failures in here. These failures are a result of me testing things out and then also destroying Redis and all that. Uh, but it did recover, so we are seeing that in here as well. And I already have a ton of ratings too. So the other thing is how efficient this was. I have over half a million ratings and it only took you know a minute or so to actually do all of those ratings, right? So a little bit over a minute, 76 seconds to rate and update everything from all those ratings. So that's where the efficiency of a SQL database will come in handy in a big way to then be able to actually calculate our ratings. And so that comes back to the display. And what we want to do now is actually allow a user to rate things. And so when we do allow a user to rate things, we could still use this same sort of concept. So coming back into our task here, if we look at it, so we could absolutely use it in the similar fashion that instead of using, you know, all of the object IDs here, right, I can actually filter it down just a little bit more. So what I could do then is say object ID being none. And then if there is an object ID, I just change how the ag ratings are. So if object ID is not none, then instead of this, I'll go ahead and do my uh, rating QS. And it's going to be rating objects at filter. And of course, we can leave this filter in right here. Then I'll bring my aggregation down a bit. And if the object ID is none, then I'll go ahead and filter it down again. And now it's going to be object ID equaling to object ID. And now we use this rating QS for what values I actually want to get. And this is now a, another way to actually handle this. I can now individually update object IDs based off of any given rating. So if I wanted to use a post save on the rating itself, this would be potentially a way to do it. That's not how I'm going to do it because of circular imports and just adding maybe too much complexity to the task itself. Circular imports happen when you try to go into, of course, if I went into models.py here and then tried to do from tasks import the task name itself so that I could run it where I don't need to run it, which would be, you know, inside of the post save here. Now, a big part of the reason I don't need it there is, well, specifically because I'm going to be running this every 30 minutes and it only takes about a minute. And also, once you get big enough data, 
you're definitely not going to want to be running this every single time a new rating comes in. You'll want to do it in a bulk process like what we have here. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and add in rating choices for any given, well, movie object in this case, but I want the actual choices, right? So the choices that are in models.py, I want these choices in there. So one of the intuitions you might have in doing this is by augmenting our view, as in adding new context to our view. So if we look at this, we've got this function called get context data. This is actually how you would enrich the context on a list view directly, right? So I'd add it into this context. Now, as you might be aware, the list view already adds in the query set in here. So if we printed out what that context would be, we would see all of the default context that comes in with this view, which is why we call the default method from that class. So uh, that's one thing if you're not familiar with class-based views that well. Uh, and of course, if you're on a function-based view, you would basically just be adding in those rating choices here. Uh, and of course, it'd be coming off of that rating choice uh, integer choices from the model itself. But I'm not going to do that. That is good intuition, but then I have to repeat it over and over and over again. There is a much better way, especially for something like this, that is, well, just a bunch of choices. It doesn't need that much data to it. So how this is done is already really well aware to us and maybe something you've already used a lot. So if you go into your settings and navigate down into your templates here, we've got all of these context processors. So this is actually what we're gonna be adding in is the proper context processors for the template, which will allow me to do really cool stuff. So if I go into my actual template itself, I'm gonna go into movies and the card snippet here. I'm gonna go ahead at the very top, I'm just gonna render out rating choices. Just like that, that will actually show me my rating choices once I create this context processor. So at this point, of course, it doesn't do anything. So let's go ahead and change that. By going into ratings, we're gonna create a new module called context underscore processors.py. Now, the only reason I call it that is if you look in settings, literally every single one of these context processors is in there, okay? So that's why I'm calling it that. Next, we're gonna define a function. In my case, I'll just call the function what I want the variable to be, which is rating choices. But that's actually not where we define the variable. The variable is defined in what this returns, which is the actual you know, key value pair, in this case, rating choices. So these rating choices are responsible for this context processor or this variable. And so if I called this, you know, you know, get rating choices, that would be okay, or enrich rating choices, this variable would still render out to that. Pretty cool. But I'm gonna leave it in as rating choices because I really don't need it to be different. And as you see here, I have access to the request itself, so I could change things based off of the user if I was so interested. I am not interested, I just need the rating choices. So we'll go ahead and now do from.models import the rating choice. And I'm gonna go ahead and render this out, dot values, and there we go. So right off the bat, one thing I will not recommend that you do with context processors is run a lot of model lookups. So lookups in the database, because these will be rendered on every single template, even if you don't want it to. And so rating choice values are, well, they're hard-coded values. They're not in the database at all, so it's not gonna be hitting your database thus slowing things down and doing all sorts of havoc on there. So now that we've got this rating choices, we can save everything. And also in settings.py, at the bottom of my context processors, I need to add in ratings.context processors, and then the name of the function, which I called it rating choices. And we save that. So save all across the board. Now, if I refresh in here, I should see those values in there. Pretty cool, so that's custom context processors. I think it's actually pretty straightforward on how it works. So the next thing is, will gonna be these the select item here, the actual choices that we have available. And of course, rating choices is a list. So dot values gives me all of the values or the options for those rating choices. It does not give me what I would display there, but in this case, it doesn't matter. There are ways to, to change that. So if I went back into my context processors and did choices, 
saved at and refreshed, this would give me those choices, right? So it, it would actually allow me to iterate through and have multiple items on there. Uh, this is a little bit more tricky to work with uh, for a number of reasons, as we'll see shortly. But anyways, just dot values is super easy. It gives me the actual values of all of those different choices. So now back into our, uh, you know, our card itself, the actual template, we can actually iterate through each one of these choices. So what I can do now is for choice in rating choices, and then I'll do end four, and I'll put this in as an option. So we'll go ahead and put render out the choice label. I'll also give the option to the value, okay? And we save that. Now I can render out all of these choices. Now, of course, none is an option in here. And perhaps you want to leave none in there. And there's a couple of things that we could think about with this. And we'll say if choice is none, then we'll go ahead and say, you know, pick a choice. And then I can do else. And then actually render out the choice. And, and if. That is certainly one option. And pick a choice might be a value that you'll end up using, right? Or better yet, we can use that same if statement. So I'll come in here and copy it. And now what I could do is if it is none, I could have an empty option. So let's go ahead and paste this in here. And I'll go ahead and get rid of all this and say pick a rating and then the value being empty and just saying disabled and selected. Get rid of this. And then down here is gonna be back to simply the choice. And we'll put it around this end if statement. Save that. And now I have this as just a, you know, a blanked out thing um, that I can now pick a rating of some kind. Pretty cool. So what I wanna do now is of course, get rid of this rating choices being rendered out. We don't need that. Uh, but I also do wanna add in one quick little element so I can test this out a little bit more and that is getting the object ID. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because I want to be able to rate this item really quickly in my admin. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab the item name and we'll go ahead and add a rating. I'll grab that user I made at the beginning. I'll grab my content type of movies and I'll go ahead and add this one and we'll add a rating of let's say four. Right, we hit save and continue and now we should be able to render this out. So of course, this is the next portion in this. So this actually takes a number of steps and that's something we'll talk about. Uh, so how do we actually get this data in general? Well, this is actually where we'll come back into the view and this is where I will actually enrich the views. So if I actually need my individual users rating, then I will actually enrich it. And we're gonna do this with a multi-step process in the next part. So now what I wanna do is enrich any given view with the user's actual ratings, right? So this dropdown then could actually be preset or pre-filled to the thing that you actually rated it. And now this is actually a little bit tricky for several reasons, but the main one being that it's gonna be unique per every user that goes here, right? It's not gonna be, we're not all gonna look at the same exact value. Because up until this point, we all look at the same data and it's okay. But this one single thing makes this a little bit more challenging. So the first thing that I wanna do is go into the list view and I wanna put my ratings in here, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and say something like context and you know my ratings equals to something, right? So that's actually what we wanna solve for. So to do this, it's actually pretty straightforward. First off, we grab in the request, right? So the request is self.request like that. Then we grab in the user, request.user. And then we wanna check if this user is authenticated. So the thing here is that we wanna worry about is whether or not the user is authenticated, but also the fact that, well, if they're not authenticated, it's okay that their ratings don't show up. So to get their ratings, it's actually also very simple user dot, well, rating set dot all. This of course is because of the user foreign key relationship to the rating model, which we could verify with this right here. We just use the name of the model underscore set 
and we get this as a query set. This of course is gonna give me literally every rating under the sun for this user. That of course is not efficient. So what I can do is filter it down by the object ID and we could say in some sort of list, right? So what is that list gonna be? Well, let's go ahead and do object IDs uh, or object, yeah, let's just call it object IDs like that. We'll leave it in as an empty list. And we need to of course fill out this value. Now this object IDs is actually really easy to get and it's based off of a template value that we've already seen. So if we go back into list.html, we've got a template context argument here as object list. So I can actually use that same thing. And obviously we could print out the context value itself and view it. So if I print out context in there, you will see the object list itself. And the nice thing about this object list is it's actually a little bit different than the query set. So I'm gonna go ahead and add it up here. There we go. So the reason it's different than the query set is because of this paginate by. This object list will be exactly as big as paginate by or less than that, depending on how many items are actually in the available query set. So if there's only 10 items in there, that object list will only have 10. But in our case, our query set is huge. It has like 45,000 items in the database. So we need to paginate it. Otherwise this would be massive. So once we actually get that, what I wanna do is I just get the ID. So x.id for x in that object list. That's just a list comprehension of all of those IDs in this object list. And so I can actually filter this down by that. Now, of course you might remember, we also did something like this, where it's active being true and then the content type, well, I'm gonna just go ahead and put in seven, but the content type is gonna be related to the movie itself. So I haven't done any ratings yet, so we'll come back and fix that uh, on in a moment. But for now, here's all of those ratings, right? And so if I go into any given card, I can render out these ratings. We save that and I refresh in here. And what I see is of course, a limited query set based off of the ratings. Now the maximum size of this query set will be a hundred based off of the pagination. It's not gonna be bigger than that. And also based off of the filter, of course. But of course the challenge here now is how do I take any given query set here and actually preset a choice, right? So how do I make this being, you know, selected basically? If I refresh in there, it's always gonna be five showing up because that's the last item in the rating choice iteration. So I want this to be related to the rating itself, of course. So the, the way we do this is actually, I think pretty simple once you actually start thinking about it. Okay, so the first thing is, I'm gonna go ahead and say my query set is equal to this value here. And what I wanna show you is something that I think is pretty nice and we'll go ahead and do some sort of ABC one, two, three. Okay, so now I have this dictionary value in here. And if I refresh, I've got this dictionary value. What if I actually just grab one of these, any of these items, just grab that diction, the actual object ID value here and refresh. So now I have a dictionary. Let's uh, make sure it's saved and refreshes. There we go. So now I have a dictionary value that goes off of this object ID. Now, if you're using Jinja 2 templates, which you totally can, Jinja 2 is great for a number of reasons. And of course it was actually inspired by the Django templating engine. If you were using that, what you would be able to do is come into my ratings and then quite literally look up with the object ID index. And if we look at this, hey, what do you know? These are matches and that would actually give me that value. But of course in Django, I can't just parse it like that. So we need to build a filter to allow me to parse it. So back into my actual ratings app itself, this is where we'll put it. We're gonna go ahead and create a new folder in here. Where'd it go? Let's go ahead and create a new folder called template tags. Inside of there, we'll go ahead and make it a module with a init file. And now I'm gonna go ahead and create a new template tag called get dict value or val.py, okay? So what we wanna do here is define a function called get dict value. And it's gonna take in a dictionary and a key. And we wanted to return back <laughs> the dictionary, the dictionary being passed through dot get and key. Right, so generally speaking, that's okay. 
But the problem happens when the key is an integer. We want to also say that key as str equals to true. Now the reason that's a problem is because I already know that the template tag that I did inside of the view here, if we look at this, this is now a string. That's a string right there, it's not an integer. So I just need to be able to make sure that the key is treated as such. So if key as str, then we'll go ahead and say key equals to that same sort of notion, right? So putting it into that string there. So that's pretty cool. Now, the other part of this, of course, is to just check if it is an actual dictionary. So we'll just go ahead and say if not is instance dictionary of dict, and then I'll return not. So basically, if it's not a dictionary, the actual Python dict, then we'll go ahead and return none. Okay, so to actually use this as a template tag, we have to do from django.template.default tags. I'm gonna import register, and then I'll go ahead and do at register.filter. Great, so with that in mind, now what I can do is in my card here, I can come in and we'll go ahead and load get dict value, and then I'll use the pipe of get dict value, and then use a colon here and just pass that object ID. So we save it and we probably have to restart the server because I created a brand new template tag. So let's go ahead and run that server and refresh in here. Hey, 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 what do you know? Cool, so I now have this value that's showing up that I can use in a lot of places. Now, what I'm actually gonna do is, you know, basically say with whatever this value is, I'm gonna set it as my rating, right? That's it. So if I set it as my rating or current rating, let's do current rating actually, um, because that will probably change. And then I'll go ahead and come all the way down because I want this with statement to basically come around the card itself. I'll go ahead and say end with. Okay, so the reason I do that is just so I can put a lot of the logic up here for this particular iteration of item. And so now what I can say is down here is basically say if current rating equals to choice, then I can go ahead and write in selected and put end if. Now don't worry about this red and white stuff and the fact that it's not doing the syntax correctly and that's just because it's not actually valid HTML, but this is not a proper HTML document, it is a Django template. So I can now say if the current rating is equal to the choice, I can refresh in here and what do you know? Pretty nice, okay? So I don't really have to check if it's none or not because well, really if the choice is none, then it's done and the current rating will never be equal to the choice if the choice is not none, if that makes sense. Okay, so of course I have hard coded that one, so I need to unhard code this by going back into the view and think about how do I turn my query set into, well, a dictionary very similar to this. That's actually also very straightforward. So what I'm gonna do is x dot object ID and then change this to being also the string and now I'll go ahead and do x dot value and then we'll do 4x in QS. Okay, so I could leave it in as a string or I could also just use the actual number value itself. This might be a good idea. So I, I'm gonna go ahead and refresh in here and now I see that that rating actually did change. Uh, pretty neat, so it's now actually showing those ratings. Now something I am pretty sure I'm gonna be using is this concept a number of times, right? So what I wanna do then is apply it in my model as a query set itself. So let's go ahead and copy this whole thing and I'll go into my ratings model and above here into the rating query set, I'll define and we're gonna call this something like, you know, as object dict. And I wanna have it pass in object IDs. And I'll have it is an empty list first. And what do we wanna return? Well, if I paste in that stuff I just copied, what I wanna return is something along these lines. So I'll go ahead and get rid of this active filter here. Instead, just have the object IDs coming through. And then I'll go ahead and put self.filter, right? Cause it's just gonna be filtering. This is filtering down another query set. And then what I'm actually gonna return is that dictionary value just like that. Cool.
So now I have this, I can come back into my movie model view. And instead of having this huge thing here, I can just do, well, user.rating set.filter, active being true, and then get or as object dict with the object IDs still being passed in here. That's important. I want to have the object IDs so it does narrow it down. And so now I can get rid of this query set. And that's certainly a lot cleaner, right? It's maybe hard to tell that it's a lot cleaner because of uh, the size there. But if I um, were to you know, minimize it a little bit, I will see that it is quite a bit cleaner. Okay, so let's actually add it onto another list here or another. And I'll go ahead and say my ratings equals to that like that. Okay, cool. So this could also be another filter as well as in the content type for any given movie. So there's a couple of ways on how we could do this. And I could say, I'll just go ahead and say movies. And if I am filtering it down by a movie, I would want it to for sure be active, right? So basically if I'm using whatever is gonna be this model manager, I always want it to be active. So let's go back into my models here. And first off to find, oh, in our rating models actually, first off we're gonna define the movies one, and this is gonna return self.filter and active being true. And then our content type, well, our content type needs to be a movie. So to grab this, we'll go ahead and do C type equals to content type dot objects and then dot get for model. Well, how do we actually grab the model? One of the things I can't do is from, you know, movies dot models import movie. And the reason I can't do that, of course, is because the movie model imports the rating. So that causes a circular import. So coming back in here, instead what I'll do is I will use Django apps. So from Django.apps, we're gonna import apps, just like that. And then we'll navigate down here and say the movie equals to apps.get model. And this takes in the app name and then the model name just like that. And so now I can actually say these two things here. Okay, and of course, if I do movies down here as well, all I need to do is return self dot get query set and dot movies. Now I already know I'm actually gonna reuse that movies quite a few times. The as object dict, I might not, but the movies I will. So like if I wanna see all of my rated movies, now I have the ability to do that and it's definitely gonna filter it down based on how I want it to. The other thing is now that I have this get context data here, I can use it in a detail view. So if I copy this and scroll down a bit, paste in here, I still want my ratings to be a list of some kind, just how it's done. But instead of object list now, it's gonna just be getting the object itself because it's a detail view. And so now I would just do the object IDs as simply object.id still in the brackets, but everything else still works basically the same. So if I refresh in here, this is still showing up. If I go to Tom and Jerry's, what do you know? It's still showing up as well. Pretty, pretty nice, I think. So yes, it is not the only way that you would end up doing this, but I think it's one of the most simple ways to do it is to enrich it with this query set of you know, your ratings as a dictionary value uh, for a number of reasons. And it's just a much more efficient approach than trying to iterate through each one of your ratings, which is something that you might be tempted to do. Uh, but now that we have these ratings available, it's time to actually start getting into the process of storing these ratings when they change. Now, one of the things you might be tempted to do though, is using a template tag to render out individual ratings, as in using something along these lines where you're just passing in the object ID. So for example, I'm not actually gonna do it, but for example, you might go ahead and say, get object rating and maybe pass in the request uh, or maybe just pass in the user and the object ID. And you might think it's clever to use something like this to then do a lookup for rating.objects.get user equals to user and object ID equals to object ID. Now this is not gonna be efficient at all because 
then on a hundred different objects, you will be doing an additional hundred lookups on your database, at least a hundred more lookups. Whereas what I did, this query set lookup will do one additional lookup. It's gonna look up for these items and that's it. Yes, it does actually go through that and turn it into a dictionary, but it is far more, far more effective than trying to use a template tag in rendering out that same data. Now, this is also true if you were to like try and want to go into the back end, look it up, whether or not, um, you know, what the rating is for the user. So even if you had some way of dynamically looking this up with Ajax or JavaScript, that is also, I don't think, recommended uh, because every time then you, when you render it, it will do a lookup. Now, the one thing that actually might be a little bit more effective in terms of loading is maybe for your ratings, you only get the first, let's say 20 in here. And then if you do the first 20, you know, perhaps you will be able to actually grab it. Uh, but of course, the problem with getting only 20 is the ordering of these object IDs. It's not necessarily going to be uh, set up correctly. So let's go actually back up here. You would actually have to do it somewhat up here to get the first ordering of it. Uh, but this also assumes a number of things that could go right. I don't recommend doing that unless you have so much scale that you need uh, to really refine how you're gonna do this query set lookup. Now there's two types of dynamic content I want on my web application. One of them is to automatically save or store the rating that I give any given movie. The other one is to resort how these movies are displayed on any given page. So if I come in to list.html and I had a form like this, for example, I wanna be able to do recent and then everything changes, or I wanna do unpopular and then everything changes and I don't need to refresh the page at all. Now, I can absolutely implement this as a form where I hit submit and all that stuff, but that's old school. We wanna make it as powerful as possible and as dynamic as possible. Now you might be thinking, oh no, I gotta write a bunch of JavaScript to do this. And in a way, this is true. You do need to use JavaScript, but we actually won't have to write any JavaScript thanks to a fantastic package called HTMX. This makes it really, really, well, Django friendly and also non-JavaScript friendly to use dynamic content. And we're also gonna be using Django-HTMX as well to just add a little bit of extensions for Django. Now, first and foremost, let's go ahead and install HTMX on our, you know, our page. So we'll go into htmx.org slash docs. We're gonna go ahead and click on install. I'm gonna go ahead and grab the CDN version. This is just for development. When you go into production, don't use the CDN, actually host it yourself. Uh, that will be something I would definitely cover when I went into production with any of my projects. So the idea here is I wanna go into base.html right underneath the bootstrap one, which is another one I would also want to download and host myself. The reason for that is privacy and performance. If you host it yourself and you host it correctly, you can absolutely make it go just as fast as any other CDN. And then you can also make sure that it is private. The only data that's coming through is to you, not to some other service, uh, which has become increasingly important in this day and age. So what we wanna do now is since I have this script here, I'm also gonna go into requirements.txt and add in the Django-HTMX package. We'll save that and then I'll run python-m pip install dash r dot dot slash requirements dot txt. The only reason I knew it was dot dot is because if I list things out, it's not inside of there, but rather it's down here. Okay, cool. So now that I have that installed, let's go into our settings. So settings.py, we'll go into our external apps here and then Django underscore HTMX. And then I wanna add in the Django HTMX middleware. So in the middleware declaration, we will bring in Django HTMX dot middleware dot HTMX middleware. Now this gives us request dot HTMX, which will become incredibly important. So what I wanna do now is actually implement this feature here. So it actually takes only a couple of steps to make this work, which is fantastic. So the first step is doing hx-get 
and we want to go into something like movies. So the actual path as to where this is being rendered. Now you could probably use something like request.path, but I don't recommend that. I recommend actually hard coding what these would be or using the reversed relationship that you could do, which is just not something I did right now. I'll leave it in as movies. So what this is gonna do is it's gonna do a lookup to movies whenever I change this item. Now, what I wanna do is also change the target. So let me just go ahead and do div ID being, this is gonna be the target list change. Okay, so it's just an arbitrary ID at this point, but I'll go ahead and also add in hx-target and doing hashtag then target list change. So basically the target itself is gonna be related to how you would target it with like CSS. So I'm gonna go ahead and save this and we will refresh on our page here. I'm gonna change this to recent. And what do you know, it actually reloads stuff in here and it does it dynamically. If I scroll down, it will have duplicates in here. So I only showed you the duplicates to just show you how easy it is to change where you're gonna end up doing this. So I now change it into that original row. I refresh in here and change this to, let's say recent. And now it looks funny. It looks really, really funny. Now this of course is because I didn't change anything about the view itself. I just changed a couple things related to HTMX. So to change the view, we are gonna come in here. And the first change I actually wanna make is related to the templates. So inside of the movies here, inside of snippets, I'm gonna go ahead and add in list.html. The original list I'm gonna to change to being simply list view.html. And so list view.html is really gonna render out what's in list.html. So list.html will be just the iteration here, this stuff right here. So in other words, what I want to eventually replace, I'm gonna go ahead and cut out and put into this snippet. So back into the list view then, I'll go ahead and do include, and this is gonna be movie, or movies snippet and list.html. And then we wanna with object list equaling to object list, and perhaps any other context objects we might need uh, for that rendered template. Of course, if I save it now and refresh, um, I wanna make sure that I have the view updated as well. Notice the template does not exist. So now we're gonna go ahead and update the view. So going back into the movies view here, we're gonna change this to list-view. Save it and we'll refresh. Now it's rendering everything as it was, or hopefully it is. Um, so now what I wanna do is change the template based off of whether or not the request is HTMX. So to do this, we're gonna define git template names. This takes in self and we're gonna return the default. And so all I'm gonna return is that single one. Okay. So template names are gonna go in order of looking for a specific template. So let's just change this to two. And if I refresh in here, the template's gonna be invalid. Notice that now that it's only looking for one specific template where a moment ago is looking for two. Now it's just looking for one. Okay, so we save that, refresh in here, and boom, now it's rendering out. So what I wanna do is I wanna change the template that's being rendered based off of the type of request that's happening. So I'll go ahead and say request equals to self.request. And when I say type of request, I mean if the request dot is HTMX, then I'm gonna return a different template. That template, as you might guess, is snippet slash list dot HTML. So we save it now, I refresh in here, and I'm gonna change this to unpopular. Hey, now no errors occurred, and it seems like nothing actually happened, which in many respects, nothing did happen because the query set did not change. But let's go ahead and take a look at the rendered out terminal and take a look at the get request that actually came through. Look at this get request, it actually has unpopular in the get argument itself which is fantastic. So the idea here now is I can actually change the query set based off of that. Um, but overall, what we've got is the ability to switch templates. Now, if you're using a function-based view, this get templates name and changing the template is, well, significantly easier. Uh, but I'm gonna stick with the class-based views because this is exactly how I design these things uh, in this exact way.
Okay, so how do I actually change the query set itself then? Now we're gonna go ahead and define get query set and it's gonna take in self and again, we'll go ahead and bring in the default first and it will return that default. Okay, so if we save that and refresh in here, of course that default comes in. So now what I wanna do is give myself the ability to change the sorting value. Now yet again, I'll go ahead and reference the request. And also what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab the request dot get dot get, grab that sort value, that thing that came through before, which is that keyword argument there into the request itself. And so what I wanna do then is give myself some sorting choices, which I already have, which are these right here. These sorting choices I'll also add into my context. So coming back down in here and do context sorting choices equaling to that. And I'll actually lowercase the context variable to sorting choices. And it's actually going to be, well, related to this for sure. And so coming back into um, my list.html where I actually have, uh, or rather list view.html where I actually have the sort options in here. Um, what I wanna do is iterate through now. So we'll go ahead and say for key value in sorting choices.items, or rather sorting choices.items. Then we'll go ahead and iterate through this. And now I'll go ahead and put this like that. So the key is what we want to display. So we'll do key and I'll pass in the filter of title and then the value being what we actually wanna sort. So I can get rid of all of these old ones now and we'll refresh in here. I still have popular and all that, um, which is cool. Uh, but of course I actually need to use those values. And so going back into our view, now if we get that sort, now I can go ahead and say if sort is not none, then the QS equals to QS.order by whatever that sort is. The default is still gonna be rating average as in the most popular first. And we have the actual sorts that I just came up with, which unpopular is just reversing the rating average. Recent releases is showing the most recent release date. And of course, all of these fields are inside of the movie model itself. So if I refresh in here now and go into unpopular, boom, what do you know? Look at those ratings, really, really low. And then if we go into recent releases, Avatar 2, uh, in this case, the data set is a bit older, but it is showing it. Um, so if I wanted to show the release date, let's go back into our card, just so we have it available um, on there, card, and instead of object ID being in the header, I'll go ahead and put that underneath it. And I'll go ahead and add in the object.release and date, and then dot year. And I'll actually only add that in if object.release date. Okay, and then we'll go ahead and do and if, and I'll just make it small again. And there we go, save that, refresh, and there we go. So we've got 2009, 2008, uh, 2015. So it's actually not sorting uh, the release date when you refresh it, but rather um, when we go ahead and do recent, uh, then we actually can see that sort happening and what the original Avatar 2 release date was, which of course got pushed. Um, but overall now we have uh, some pretty cool uh, HTMX elements. So this is actually doing that dynamic sorting. Now I realized I went really fast on a lot of the HTMX stuff, but the key thing here is HTMX itself, we can just render out a different template. I didn't have to change the context. I didn't have to add any other additional data to it. Instead, I just needed to narrow down what the, the template rendered itself instead of rendering out the entire page. Now I could change the target to render out the entire page, but it's just simply not necessary with HTMX and it does lower the footprint that HTMX does provide. So it actually will lower the footprint in terms of rendering out the object list itself will be much smaller than doing an entire page itself, uh, which is fine and something that you might consider. Now, the other thing that you might also consider is inside of the original request itself is perhaps you wanna add in request.session 
and we'll go ahead and say movie sort order is equal to that sort, right? So then we can go ahead and say default sort equals to request dot uh, request dot session dot get and then the movie sort order the exact same key value here or negative rating AVG and then now I can put this default sort in here and we can go ahead and save that and refresh in here and of course now I can actually keep that sort order up oh, we put the request object too late let's put it up here and let's go ahead and test it out. So we'll go ahead and do recent. It changes to recent. I refresh in here. Uh, it's still recent, but the actual choice is not correct. Of course, because, well, I in my list view, uh, the choice values aren't necessarily going to show the correct one. And so I can now do if request.session and then the actual value itself, which was movie sort order and equals to the value, then we'll go ahead and do selected and and if, save it, refresh, and now we've got recent, unpopular, refresh, unpopular, still showing, and so on. <laughs> like this dynamicness is so, so cool to me uh, for so many different reasons, but also if you've ever tried to do all of this with JavaScript, it is incredibly difficult to do uh, just by itself. Now, it's certainly doable, it's just not this easy. Uh, so that's kind of the key with all of this. And storing the sort value in session is completely optional, of course, but just adding our user friendliness to all of this, and also seeing a little bit of a different approach than what we saw with the rating, of course, right? So the rating, would all of my ratings would not be stored in the request.session for a number of reasons, one of them being uh, the session object cannot be nearly as big as if you had 10,000 ratings, you're not putting that in the session object. But the sort value can only be a few different kinds of sort values. And as soon as you end the session, it's gonna go back to what the default was, but that's okay, the default being popular, right? So this is really, really nice. I have a lot of um, great things to say about HTMX, but now of course, what I wanna do is actually store my data. I wanna store the actual rating itself. So that's what we'll do in the next one. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and turn our select element here into a dynamic rating form. Now, the thing about this is I'm not actually going to have a fallback, like as in if JavaScript is disabled, this form is not gonna work. You totally could create a fallback and you could use a lot of the same things we're doing here. It just adds complexity to something that, well, we're just not gonna do at this point. The first thing that I need to do is come into base.html and add in some HX headers. Now, I wanna use single quotes on the outside of this because what I'm gonna be doing here is passing in headers that JavaScript are gonna read directly or specifically HTMX's JavaScript's gonna read directly. Now, what I wanna have in here is a key called x-csrf token and capital T, lowercase o, k, e, n. And then we'll go ahead and add in our CSRF token in here. And I'll put some double quotes around that. So the point of this is so that our CSRF token works. Now, of course, if you're familiar with the CSRF token in a actual Django form, this renders out a input itself. This just renders out the token that is in that input. So now that we have this, what we can do is go back into our movie card and we can actually use hx-post now. Now, of course, the select item here is pretty limited as to how we want it to work. Moreover, I actually want to remove it out of the movies altogether and move it into a new template. So let's go ahead and do that by creating a ratings folder and a snippet and then we'll go ahead and say rating choices.html. And I'm just gonna go ahead and copy this select item and bring it on over. And so in my card now, I'll just go ahead and include ratings slash snippet slash rating dash choices.html. Great. So there's a couple of things that I will want to add as variables for this include statement. 
So the first one is the object ID. I actually do want object ID being passed for hopefully obvious reasons at this point. I'm also going to pass in my current rating, whatever that might be. So current rating equals to current rating. So at this point, I haven't really changed anything. So if I look back at my um, you know, recommender thing here, I've got nothing that's really changed. Great. So now what I need to do is update my entire element to being a form itself. And then I'm going to go ahead and say if object ID, then I'll go ahead and add in, well, a hidden input. So input and type equals to hidden. And the value is going to be object ID. And the name is also going to be object ID. Great. So our select element also needs a name. And I'm going to go ahead and give this the rating value. The other part is I'm going to go ahead and put a little message in here. So I'll go ahead and do a span class. And I'll just give it a class of success. In fact, we'll change it to a div and success. So I will want a success message here like rating updated, something along those lines. OK, great. So now within this form, I'm going to go ahead and use hx-post, and I want to send it somewhere. I'm going to send it to rate movie, just like that. And then I'm going to go ahead and say my hx trigger is going to be change. So if anything in this form changes, including the select element or any other input, it will automatically trigger a, a post call. Then I'm going to go ahead and do hx-target. This one I'm going to go ahead and do find.success. So that's going to find the internal element of success. If I had a message outside of this form, something like div class of success, or beyond it, then I would use it a little bit differently. Now, the reason I'm using that class is because this rating choices will be rendered multiple times. So I just want to get the closest element here and find space dot success will allow me to do that. It will literally look for a class, the next nearest class inside of this element with success, which is great. So now, of course, I need the proper view here. Before I do, I'll go ahead and render this out, and I'll pick a rating for some of these things. And it seems like the rating is coming through. But of course, if I go into VS Code and look at my Python terminal, I see that I'm getting 404 errors for that. These are also rendered out in the JavaScript console. So if you look at the JavaScript console uh, with Command Option J or Control Alt J, I believe, if you're on a Windows, um, the idea here is we got a 404 error coming through because of course that URL is not found. So let's go ahead and create that URL now. And it's going to be pretty straightforward actually. So inside of ratings, we will go into our view and I'm going to define rate movie and view. And it takes in a request and then we're going to go ahead and render out the request data. So I'll just go ahead and do re print out request.post. Now we already should have a sense as to what is coming through in here, and that's going to be object ID equals to request.post.get object ID, and then the rating value equals to request.post.get and rating value. Both of those things are named for the elements that they have, right? So we've got object ID here and then rating value here. So no surprise here. Now, the next thing is I'm going to go ahead and say if requ not request.htmx, I want to return a certain kind of response. So I'm actually not going to render a template at all here. I'm just going to render a single message. So we'll go ahead and do from Django.http import HTTP response. And so if it's not HTMX, then we'll return a response and say not allowed and just do status of 400. OK, so assuming that it is HTMX, then we can go to the next step, which would be using this actual value. Let me just close down these terminals here. And what I want, of course, is the request.user. And I also want to check if the user is authenticated. OK, and for now, I'll say pass. The message I'll give is simply, well, 
you must log in first. And in fact, I'll go ahead and do ahref and do slash accounts slash login just like that. So you must log in to rate this. Great. So then I'll go ahead and return back the HTTP response of that message with a status of 200. The only reason I have that status of 200 is to render out this message correctly. So let's go ahead and just do this so far. And I will also go ahead and bring it into my URLs, my CFE home URLs. So we'll go ahead and do from ratings import views as ratings views. And then we'll go ahead and add in that path. So path and rate movies and then ratings views dot rate movies. Okay, so there we go. So we now have the view, we now have the function, we've got all sorts of stuff going on in here. So let's go ahead and give this a quick shot and go into our recommender here, close down this console, and I'll pick a rating for any of these and I get four. So it doesn't seem like it's actually working. We still get a 404 page here. It looks like maybe I didn't save the rating itself. So let's try that again. And yet again, it's giving me 404 rate. Ah, it says rate movie, not movies. Okay, so let's go ahead and change that to being rate movie, which should be accurate. So I run this again, and now I get a post method of 403. I've got an invalid CSRF token. So that must mean that I did something with base.html that I shouldn't have. And that's CSRF token, not CRFS token, and so on. Okay, so we tried again, and now with that error, now we see you must log in to rate this. Perfect. Um, now, of course, we could change that to log in or sign up, uh, but in this case, I'll just leave it in as that. So that's actually what I want to return back is a message very similar to this. So if they are authenticated, we'll go ahead and say the first message will just be an error occurred. And since I'm actually using Bootstrap, I can add in a class of BG warning, or let's say BG danger and text light. And then I'll do PX3 and rounded. That's okay if you don't know those class names, but I will go ahead and use them. So now I've got a new message in here. So if I refresh and pick a different rating, we get that error occurred and I need to put in full on class here. And yet again, there we go. So an error occurred, great. Okay, so maybe I'll also add in PY of one. And let's try that again. And error occurred, great. Let's do a little margin bottom and B of one and last try. And now nope, still no margin, margin bottom two. And that error is happening because let's add the margin here and we'll come back in, save that and refresh. And there we go. So a little margin error occurred. Okay, great. So now what we want to do, of course, is actually do the rating. Now these items here, these elements, I would probably not keep inside of a view like this. I would probably actually have them as a template that I then end up rendering. Uh, but I'll leave that to you. If you want to actually go ahead and render these different messages as little HTML snippets, it's probably a good idea, but I'm not going to do that at this point. So now that our user is authenticated, let's go ahead and create a few things. So first and foremost, we want to grab the content type. So from Django.contrib.contentTypes.models, we're going to import the import the content type model. And of course, the C type here is going to be content type.objects. Now, another way to get these objects is by using the app label, movies, and then the model itself, which is movie. That will give us that content type. Next, of course, we're gonna go ahead and add in our rating objects. So from models, we're gonna import a rating. And then I'll go ahead and do rating obj equals to rating.objects.create. Well, we've got our content type here as C type. We have our object ID in here. 
And we also have our rating value, which is gonna be just simply value equaling to rating value. And then of course, we also have our user because that user is authenticated. And so now I've got a rating object and then all I'll do to really just complete it off, if the rating object has a content object and it's not none, then I'll go ahead and update my message here and simply say, BG success, text light, all that, and just say success, save it. Or maybe rating saved. Refresh in here into our main page. Let's go ahead and pick a rating on one of these things. And we got a four, that's not necessarily a good sign here. So let's go ahead and inspect the element go into the console, I get a 500 error, okay? So let's go ahead and see, we've got object ID is expecting class object. So the field object ID is express, oh, ha, that is not what's supposed to be there, it should be a underscore ID, okay? So of course it's this value right here. Let's try that again, and I will change this, rating saved. Great, and there we go. So of course, if I refresh the page, well, let's go ahead and make sure that Tom and Jerry is five and I refresh, it's five. This movie that I've never heard of is a one. This one's gonna be a four. And what do you know? Jungle Book 2003, eh, it was okay. Let's change it to three and so on, right? So now I actually have the ability to rate these things. So the next question, of course, would be in the individual view. It still says pick a rating. If I do four, the rating is still saved. And if I refresh the page, obviously that goes away. If I change it to five, it's a five, right? And it's creating a new rating every single time. So if we go into the admin, do a quick search by our user, we should see the same one coming through a couple of times, right? So back into the recommender, I'm in MacArthur here. So if I change it to one, and I refresh my ratings in here, I see that MacArthur is now a one, and that's the active value. The other ones are not active values. This was, of course, intentional. Uh, but now, of course, now we've got rating here, and we refresh, and things are starting to look really, really good in terms of a dynamic rating. Now, this is all thanks to how amazing HTMX is. It just really simplifies this whole process quite a bit. Now to write the JavaScript for all of this, you would have to do pretty much everything we just did, but also write in a bunch of logic that JavaScript would have to handle with JSON data and all sorts of different things that we just don't have to handle because of HTMX. Now, one of the other things that you might wanna add on here is the view decorator for requiring a post method. So I didn't actually do that. I just left it in if it's a request or not. So you definitely want to have it as a required post method. So this is really simple. We just come in here and do the at require methods and then pass in uh, just simply post here, save that and I refresh in here and then I run this again, rating saved. Now, of course, if I added this to get, changed the method itself and tried to update it, you know, it's not gonna allow it. It's gonna give me a 405 error. And yes, there's absolutely things that you would wanna do on the HTMX side to render that error. Uh, that's just not something I'm gonna cover at this point because we now have a working rating system uh, for our end users and we can actually go into all of the movies and start rating them, which is so, so cool, right? Yeah, I think it's pretty cool. Okay, so if you have any questions on this, let me know. Otherwise, let's keep going. Now what we're gonna do is create a infinite rating flow with Django and HTMX. This is actually really, really cool. So um, we're gonna go ahead and have something that's similar to viewing a detailed view, but I'll also have another button in here to be able to skip it, and it will actually render out a new view for us. So the first thing that I wanna do is actually create the view itself. Going into movies and views, I'll scroll down to the movie detail view, and I'm actually going to roughly copy this. So we'll go ahead and do class movie infinite, and we'll call this rating view. And it's gonna take in the movie detail view. Now, of course, the reason I do that is to get all of the attributes that are already in the movie detail view. Now, the first thing that I wanna change is the get object call, and 
instead of having the default, which we used to get the primary key, the specific movie detail itself, I'm gonna go ahead and just grab a random one, which is gonna be movie.objects.all order by random and first. This will give me a random value in here in some form. Now, we can also go ahead and just say movie infinite rating view is equal to this view. So we can take a look. Okay, and so back into my URLs, I'm gonna go ahead and add in a path here called infinite and with the trailing slash and it's just gonna be views dot movie infinite rating view. So of course I can use this path as hopefully you're aware, if I put a string here, it does not conflict with the integer value of the primary key which is nice because it gives me another dynamic URL. And so I can come in here and do infinite hit enter. And every time I refresh it, it gives me a brand new view. This is fantastic. It's exactly what I want. So the next thing of course, would be to have a infinite view uh, actual template. So a template that changes based off of the infinite view, because what I want is not just picking a rating, but I also wanna be able to skip it. So I'll do a skip first and then we'll do the rating second. Both are roughly the exact same thing as far as refreshing the page will be concerned. So going into our templates from our list, I'm gonna just copy that and we will paste it down here. So basically, you know, if it's HTMX, we want a different one. So the first thing is gonna be infinite and then the next one will be infinite dash view. Okay, so let's go ahead and make the infinite snippet first. So in here, we'll go ahead and do infinite.html. Now this one is actually somewhat similar to the detail view, right? So it's actually gonna be roughly speaking this right here. We'll put this into the infinite. So we still want the card in here and all that. That's definitely something that we will keep. Next, we're gonna go ahead and create the infinite view itself. So we'll change infinite to infinite view.html. This one, of course, is gonna include snippet and infinite.html itself. Great. Okay, so I'll leave this in as the column, but of course I also need uh, all of the other sort of detail type things. So I'll bring in extends base and also the end block, just like that. Great. So this is really just to be able to render out this particular infinite.html page. That's the point, right? So if we look back at that view, whenever I request this page, it's gonna you know, go off of infinite.html when I request it with the uh, HTMX. Okay, so we'll talk about that trigger in just a moment. But for now, what I'll do is go into my ratings view. So if we look at our ratings view here, um, one of the things that will hopefully stand out is the fact that these might be empty objects. I don't have any sort of validation built into it. So what I wanna do is if object ID is none or rating uh, value is none, then I wanna return some sort of HTTP response. So for now, I'll just go ahead and say something like skipping and I'll give it a 200. Okay, great. So with that in mind, back into my infinite.html, this is the snippet, of course, where I'm loading in the card. I'll go ahead and add in skip being true. So being able to skip the rating or really just skipping the card, it's not so much the rating in this case, it's skipping the card itself. Now, as we've already seen, I can just refresh the page and it'll do that. Uh, looks like I have a val invalid and a little spelling error, there we go. Uh, so if I refresh the page, yes, it absolutely does skip it. But if I put a skip here, I might wanna log when somebody is skipping. I'm not gonna do that right now, but in other words, if it comes in empty, I might wanna log this. I might wanna save it somewhere to see that, hey, people are skipping this particular movie a lot. Now I need to adjust some things related to it. Again, that's a little bit more minutia that we just aren't gonna review right now. So anyways, in infinite, we've got this skip now. So back into that movie card snippet. What I'm just gonna do is right next to the actual rating choices, I'm gonna go ahead and say, if skip is true, then I'll go ahead and add in a button for it. So button, and this is gonna be class of BTN and BTN outline secondary. And I'll just go ahead and say in there, 
we'll just put skip. And I want a HX post to movie rate. Now one could argue maybe we put the skip in the rating portion itself, but it actually doesn't make sense to put it in the rating portion uh, because you might want to use this skip thing, well, pretty much anywhere. And maybe we should even have its own, you know, view itself altogether with a bunch of different arguments. But I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to do this simple one right here. So if we save it and we refresh on this page, I now have this skip here. And what eventually it'll do is actually request in the back end. Uh, and this should be rate, not, not movie, but <laughs> it should be rate movie. So I had that backwards. So let's refresh that. Hit skip. And now it says skipping. So of course, this is happening because of the rating view. This right here, it's returning an HTTP response of skipping. And the way HTMX works is it's going to automatically replace what's ever in here. So it's attempting to skip it, which is great. It's actually showing me the response that I want. So I actually want to change it just a little bit and now return back the response. And I want to add in a header into this response. Now that header is going to be HX dash trigger. And then I'm just going to give this trigger an arbitrary name. I'm going to call it did skip movie or rating, whatever you want to call it. But anyways, I've got did skip movie. So this is the trigger name that I can now use somewhere else. Where else am I going to use it? Well, what do you know? It's going to be inside of infinite.html, the actual snippet itself. I no longer need this class, but now what I'll do is hx get, and this is going to be slash movies slash infinite literally the exact same place that it's being rendered on. We're going to do a request back to it. And then we're going to go ahead and add in an HX dash trigger. So this trigger is going to be an initially from that did skip movie that we just set. So this header right here, I can now use that. Wait, let's go back into infinite. I can now use that right here. And all I need to do is say from colon body. Okay, so that's going to be the trigger that I have. And then I just add in hx dash swap. And this is going to be outer HTML, as in it's going to swap this entire thing for itself, essentially, because of how, of course, we have the template set up, it's going to just re render that template. But this time, it's going to re render a brand new object because it's ordered by random. So if we save that and refresh in here, I can skip, 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 and so on, right? Pretty cool. So this same idea is absolutely true with rating, right? So back into our ratings here, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna copy the response again, scroll down a bit and say, if the rating object is in there, then I'll go ahead and add in this new response. I'm going to use a different kind of trigger, which is after settle. But it's roughly the same thing. This time it's going to be did rate movie. So going back into my infinite, I could actually use another one, another trigger to do this. This time it's did rate movie. So it's either one, it's going to go ahead and re-render and give us something new. So we refresh in here, 10 billion, what's on your plate? Never heard of it. I'm going to give it a one. The final def def uh, defense, <laughs> one, never heard of it. Bloody tie, one, never heard of it. Now, skip is probably more accurate for things I've never heard of, but I'm not going to impose that on somebody. I'm just going to assume that they don't want to rate it at this point, right? So if they want to rate it, they will give it a rated, you know, whatever that is. So many of these movies I've literally never heard of. So me personally, I'm going to be skipping a lot of them. Uh, but overall, I now have a way to have like literally infinite amount of flow in here, right? And eventually I'll probably come back to ones that I've rated, but there's so many movies that it's probably not gonna happen anytime soon. Now, I will say if you wanted to make it where it wasn't movies that you've rated before, um, all you would have to do is, well, let's see, come back into our ratings here, into the view. What we would need, not in ratings, but rather movies, we would need to update our query set here. So basically getting all of the movie IDs that I have rated, 
So again, if let's go ahead and do user equals to self.request.user, and we'll say if user is authenticated, then I'll go ahead and say exclude IDs being some list, and I'll put that up here too, and then we'll just do exclude, you know, ID in the exclude IDs, and this will be now movie infinite rating that I've already done, which would be x dot object ID for x in user dot rating set dot filter active being true, or something along those lines. And then that would actually end up giving us quite a few, uh, but it, it, you know, since I'm only looking up one specific object, this is not a incredibly inefficient item, although it's not incredibly efficient either, because if I end up rating 40,000 items in here, then actually doing this lookup does take some time. So perhaps there would be another method I create for the movies I just simply haven't rated yet, right? So I could actually create a whole nother model along with a test, or excuse me, a task itself that is like, hey, here's all the movies you haven't rated yet, and that being its own table and query set for that particular user. Uh, but of course, that's not what I'm gonna end up doing. In fact, I'm not gonna have this exclude in here whatsoever, uh, so I will get rid of that. Uh, but you totally could, and that would be how you do it. Uh, so this is really nice. This could be used in many different ways, right? It doesn't have to be used just for skipping stuff. We could do it with loading things as well. But at this point, I'm just gonna leave it like this. I do wanna actually update my navigation a little bit, just as some house cleaning before we go. And that's gonna go into our nav bar here. I will put the home to go to the home and home. And then I'll go ahead and do movies and infinite. So movies, and this is not the current page, so I'll go ahead and get rid of it. In fact, I will do that for the other one too, just because we don't need it. You totally could add it, but I'll just do that. Movies and now infinite and infinite review or something like that. There we go. And oops, that should be movies slash infinite. Maybe it should be on just simply infinite, but you know, that would be something you can play around with. But now I got all of that and we're starting to look a lot better as far as getting some ratings done. And popular ratings, uh, kids return, never heard of it, right? And <laughs> so many of these movies with these fake ratings are, are really funny to me because I've never heard of any of them. Um, but you know, there definitely are movies that we like and certainly adding some sort of search function would probably help with finding the rate, the movies that we actually do want to rate. Um, but given enough users and enough ratings and a recommendation engine, a proper one, uh, is actually much more important to actually having average ratings going up for all of those important ones. Now we're gonna go ahead and create exports of our rating data, and we're gonna turn it into a CSV file, so it's gonna be a little bit easier to just load up and train in our machine learning model. So let's go ahead and do this. The first thing that I wanna do here is I wanna create a new app, and I'll call this app Exports. And so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into Exports, as well as CFE Home Settings. I'll go ahead and add this into my internal apps or the installed apps that I have. Okay, so then I'll close that out. I don't have models yet, I will shortly, but inside of exports, we'll also create utils.py. And so in here, we want to actually grab the rating model. So from ratings.models, we're gonna import rating. And then we're gonna go ahead and do from django.db.models, we're gonna import F, and they'll do from types. Dot models, we're gonna import the content type. Okay, so first off, I'm gonna define, and this is going to be generate rating data set. Okay, so it's gonna return some sort of, well, list of values. Now, how do we actually generate this data set? Well, first off, we wanna get the content type, so I'll do C type, and that is content type objects.get app label being movies and the model itself is going to be movie. 
Then we want to narrow our ratings down. The actual query set that we want is going to be related to that, of course. So it's going to be active ratings and the content type for those movies. So this is really generating the movie rating data set, data set here. Or of course, we could actually pass in the app label and the model itself as well right in here. And that's actually the method I'll go about doing this so I can reuse this if I ever change to different models. Great. So now if I break this down, I've got this query set here, right? And this will give me all of my active ratings of the model as we should expect. The next thing is we actually want to just change or get the values for this. So one of the things we could do is just do QS.values and get like the user ID. We could get the object ID and then finally the value itself. So these are actually the three values we need for collaborative filtering. Now the actual filtering model itself, the actual training portion is going to have slightly different data as in the field names are slightly different. So instead of user ID, it will be something like user ID. Instead of object ID, it will be movie ID. And then instead of value, it will be rating. Okay, so this is more specific to the one I'm trying to create here versus what we've got right here. So in order for us to be able to change those field names, there are a, a few different ways on how we could do it. Or what we could do is just say QS equals to QS.annotate and then user ID, as in this field name here, set it equal to the F string of user underscore ID and then movie ID equals to F string of, well, what do you think? It's gonna be object ID. And then finally, rating is equal to the F string of value or that F function rather, not F string. And so now I've got the ability to get these values. So let's actually see this in action. Let's go into Python manage.py shell. We're gonna go ahead and do from exports import utils and then utils dot generating that rating data set. And here we go. It's gonna be a lot of things, but it gives us our user IDs, our movie IDs, and then the rating value itself. This is literally the data I want. Now, if you had Python pandas, you could see the data frame from this, right? I don't think I have Python pandas installed and I definitely did not bring it in, but I would be able to just bring it in like that. And this part is actually really important for, you know, the actual data science users that would end up looking at this. But of course, we're going to be doing the data set ourselves. So the next utility function itself is to be actually exporting this data set. So we're going to go ahead and define export data set. And it's going to take in a data set. And then what we want to do is actually generate a file and save it to the export model. So let's go ahead and actually create that model first, right? So exporting the data set will generate, will actually get this generated rating data set. So it's going to call that. So we can start that process at least. So we can say the uh, data set is equal to, well, I actually don't need to pass it in as an argument. I can leave that out, but now we can generate this data set here. What I might pass in are the arguments here. So now I've got this potential data set here that I'll end up using. And so I'm also going to be using from the CSV package, we're going to import CSV. I'm going to go ahead and use something related to it, which would be grabbing this data set and setting it into a CSV file. Um, and so before I actually put it into a CSV file, I'm also going to put it into a temp file. So for this, what I'm going to do is I will come down here and say with temp file dot named temporary file, we want to add the mode of read and write. So read plus, and then we'll go ahead and say as temp F as in temp file, we'll tab that data set in now. And so what we should have here in this data set are a lot of different key value pairs, right? So what I can say is try keys equals to the data set zero dot keys. And then we'll go ahead and do accept pass, or rather we'll go ahead and return it. So if the data, if we can't even get the keys from this data set, 
then we have other issues. Now the keys are necessary for our dict writer. So we'll go ahead and do dict writer. And this is gonna be csv.dict writer. And we're gonna write it to the temp file with those keys, right? So all this is doing is making sure that we know what the column names are essentially for the CSV. Now, th these steps are a lot easier with the pandas data frame, but I wanted to make it not required to use pandas for this. So the next one is dict write or writer, let's call it writer. And then we'll go ahead and do write header. That of course is gonna take in all the column names then. And then we'll do dict writer and then write rows of our actual data set. Okay, so this creates a CSV file for us. After we create that CSV file, we're gonna go ahead and do temp temp.f.seek to zero. So this is go, go to the top of the file. So then now I'll be able to write this file. So uh, write to data set or rather export model. Okay, so we, of course we need to create the export model. And this is fairly straightforward. But at this point, what is important is this actually is creating a file for me. I could use a different path, like a local file path, but using a temporary file is nice because once this is all done, your regular system will clean up that temporary file um, as you need it. Uh, but, but basically it's ready to be a CSV file itself. Okay, so let's go ahead and create the model now. Now that we have the basis for generating the data set, and exporting the data set. We'll go ahead and come into models here and I'll go ahead and do class and this is gonna be simply export and it's gonna be models.model. And then we're gonna go ahead and take in a couple things, the file itself, so models.file field. And we'll go ahead and do blank equals to true and null equals to true. I also want to have an upload handler, which I'll handle in a moment. I'll go ahead and do timestamp equals to models.date time field and auto now add being true. Okay, so I might also wanna have an ID in here. So I'll do models.uuid field, and we'll go ahead and give it a primary key being true, the editable being false, and then I'll also set in a default, which will require me to import the uuid package. So the default is gonna be uuid.uuid4, Great, okay, so if you're not familiar with this, basically it's just gonna set a UUID as the primary key instead of one, two, three, four, five, and so on, the auto field there. Okay, so this is it for the export. It gives me all the data I need with the exception of how I'm gonna handle the file field. So that's something that I'll do now. Uh, but the idea here is every time I need to generate and export a data set, it will actually go into a model. From that, I'll be able to actually grab everything that I need to grab as far as the data itself. Okay, cool. Uh, so now to do this, let's go ahead and import. We're gonna import first off, we'll import pathlib. So go ahead and import pathlib. And then we also wanna import from django.utils, we're gonna import the time zone. And what I wanna define here is the export file handler and this takes in the instance and file name, and then you are gonna return something. So this handler here is for, if we go to upload to, we can set it to that handler. And so this is just gonna give me a path that I can add in, which is gonna be exports, and then something, and maybe something else. Okay, so the first thing is, I'm gonna go ahead and say today, and that's as simple as timezone.now, and then strf time, and we're just reformatting the time to being a string. So I'm gonna have it year, and then we're gonna have it as month and day. I could probably get a little bit more specific with the time itself, but that's really what I want. Next is gonna be where I actually store it. Now, you could probably get away with just keeping the file name in here. So if I put in the file name, I could probably be fine, right? But that's actually not what I wanna have. Instead, I'll go ahead and say fpath equals to pathlib.path .path of this file name. Now, the reason for this is so that we can get the extension, which is fpath.suffix, which includes, just remember, it includes the dot. So if it's dot CSV, it would include that value, um, which you know we want to include. 
Cool. So now I just want need to create a new F name. And one of the ways we could do this is by the instance itself. So I could actually use the instance ID as part of the file name. Uh, but more than likely, we won't have the instance ID, or if we do have it, uh, do we really need to repeat it? Maybe, maybe not. So I'm gonna have two different options for the potential file name. First off, I'll go ahead and say if has attribute, the instance of ID. Then I'll go ahead and say the file name is based off of that. So I'll go ahead and do F string, and this is instance.id. Again, it's gonna be a UUID field, and then the extension right after that. Okay, and we'll put that there. And then of course, if that's not available, we'll go ahead and basically give us a, another UUID. So just UUID, UUID four, and there we go. Okay, so now we have a new place to handle this file uploader. Fantastic. So before I handle the actual file field itself, um, before I use this model at all, I wanna go back into my settings and I wanna set a media root. So what I'm gonna do here is inside of SRC, I'm gonna go ahead and create a new folder and we're just gonna call this my static file or let's call it a local-cdn. Now the only reason I'm calling it a local-cdn is to add it into my git ignore and we'll just come in here and do src slash local dash cdn. That's it. So I want that in there, but I don't want to track it with version control. So the reason that I have that, of course, is so that I can actually put my uploads in there. So my local systems uploads. So back into my settings.py, we'll now go ahead and declare media root, and that's gonna be equal to the base dir slash, well, local dash CDN, and then maybe we'll go ahead and say slash media. Great. And so by default, that file field will upload to that media dir. So let's go ahead and exit out of the Python shell and we'll go ahead and run Python manage.py, make migrations, and then Python manage.py migrate. Great. Okay. So now I've got pretty much all the things that I need with the exception of the final part of the utility. And that is gonna be actually saving this to the export model, right? So what I wanna do actually is inside of this export data set, I'm gonna go ahead and use apps to get that model. So from Django.apps, we're gonna import apps. And I really want the data set model in here. So I'll go ahead, or the export model rather, and there's gonna be apps.get model. And of course it's gonna be exports and export. Okay, so with that then, I'm gonna come down here and just do object equals to export.objects.create and then object.file.save. Well, I wanna save the file name, which is gonna be export.csv. This part is where I can also set the file name. So if I go back into the models and I wanted to actually use the file name that's uploaded, this is what I could actually end up using. Um, which I just put an arbitrary name, but definitely make sure that I have .csv in here. Then what I wanna do is actually add in a file. Now this file is from Django itself. So we're gonna go ahead and import that one now. So from django.core.files.base, we're gonna import the file class. And we can actually use that file class now to turn our temporary file into an uploadable file into the file field. The file field, of course, is this right here. So if I called this my export file, I would have to rename this one to export file. But I'm gonna leave it in as file. I think it makes a lot more sense. Uh, but now that we've got that, let's just go ahead and make sure all of our migrations are done and so on. Great. Okay, so now I have this utility here for exporting the data set. All I need to do is then wrap it into a shared task. So we've already seen this a number of times as well. Let's go ahead and do tasks.py. We're gonna go ahead and do from celery. We're gonna import the shared task. And then I'll do from dot, util, from dot import utils as export utils. And then I'm gonna go ahead and add in our shared task here. And I'll give it a name of export the rating dataset. 
and then it'll define that same thing, but I'll call it a task. And then it doesn't take any arguments or keyword args. All we need to do here is export utils dot export data set. Run that and that's it. So I could add in other arguments in here, such as maybe I want to limit the size of the data set, right? So perhaps up here, I would want to have a limit as well, which would be arguments inside of this export data set. Now these things could actually be combined, but I like them having them separate so that if I need to use this data anywhere else or just visualize this data, I totally could um, very, very easily as well. Okay, so now I've got this task here. I've got all sorts of good stuff. Um, let's go ahead and do one final thing, which would be running this task regularly. So in celery.py, I'm gonna go ahead and copy this one. And this is gonna be run every hour. And this is gonna be run rating export and every hour. So in this case, it's gonna be 60 by 60, one hour. That might be too many, that might be too frequently, but the amount of ratings that I'm getting, um, which we could review, is substantial. So it's probably not too many. So let's go ahead and grab that again and jump into Celery and just name that task correctly. So we're gonna go ahead and save that, come back into our servers here. I'm gonna go ahead and do a slow shutdown or a warm shutdown of Celery, which is just one control C. It does take a little bit of time because it might be in process. I'm gonna go ahead and run that worker again. I should see the export rating data set now, and I do. So let's go ahead and create our first export in the admin. So going back into the admin, I'm gonna go ahead and do a periodic task. I'm gonna add a periodic task, and this is gonna be export data set one off. The task itself is gonna be the export rating data set. The interval schedule I'll do every 30 seconds, and I'll use this one off task thing here. I'll hit save and continue, and hopefully it will actually end up creating that for me. While that's working, I will go ahead and add the export model into the admin. So we'll do from dot models, import, export, <laughs> import, export, that's funny. Admin.site.register, the export itself. Okay, and so one of the things we can look out for is in this local CDN on whether or not those exports actually come through. So I'll go ahead and refresh in here go into exports and I'm not seeing anything yet. So that's maybe not a great sign. Oh, here, I just received it. So now I got the database is locked. I got a locked database. So it's not allowed or it's not able to do the export. Certainly one of the downsides of using SQL is that right there, um, or SQLite rather, was the locking of the database and how overloaded I'm pretty much doing with this, but here we go. We actually did get a successful export. And now if I look in here, there it is. And there's our file. And of course, if I actually go ahead and come back into my project here, what do you know? There is a successful export right there of the data set. And it looks like the data actually came through. Fantastic. Our collaborative filtering data set is prepared. Now, there are things that I had to test out a bunch to get to this point. The things that I had to test out were actually exporting the data set as to one. If you forget to do this, you are definitely not going to have an exported data set. And of course, if you forget to actually get the values, you're not going to have a dictionary value. And so a lot of things will fail in here as well. So by all means, definitely check all of these things if you divert from them. But now that you have it, it's actually, I think, pretty straightforward. And the other thing that's really cool about this now is at any time, if I just like, oh, I need the export, I just go into my periodic test, this one off right here. I just scroll down a bit or actually scroll to enabled and hit save and continue. And then if you go back in, uh, what you'll get is eventually you'll see like about 30 seconds or so, you should see a brand new uh, you know, task for that. Oh, I need to make sure it's running. It wasn't even running. Uh, but you will see a new task for that at some point as well. And then, of course, it's actually going to give you uh, that rating. Now, the other, the, the major cool thing about this too, with how I have it currently set up, 
is if you had Bodo 3 or will it really AWS S3 or any sort of object storage as your media storage, this will go in there. So any cloud-based storage, this would upload to that with this exact same method. Um, it's not really gonna be any different, which is also a critical piece to all of this and making sure that our exports become cloud-based when we can actually turn our Django project into being cloud-based. And yes, I'm getting the databases locked. I think it's because I'm trying to do too many things at once with the exports and with the data sets and all that. Um, so what I uh, probably would have to end up doing is slow down um, with the SQLite, slow down the frequency as to when I do the, uh, the ratings as well as when I do the entire uh, database update. So uh, we've got the export in here now. Looks like it actually finished. So let's go ahead and take a look there's another data set in there too. And of course, if I go into the admin, I should see that as well for both of them. And I can click on it. Uh, in this case, it actually does not allow me to download it directly from here because I'm not serving that as a download. Uh, but one would be able to click on it and serve it at some point as well, especially if it was in AWS S3 or you know Linode Object Storage or DigitalOcean uh, Spaces. I mean, there's a lot of places as to where that data could end up being stored. And so you could just look up Django Storages and some of those cloud providers for that. It's certainly something I'll cover in the future and I've covered a lot in the past as well. Um, so yeah, that is exporting our data set. I realized we covered a lot of things and a lot of ground very, very quickly. Uh, but a lot of this is fairly rudimentary when it comes to handling file uploads, file data, file handlers. The really only new thing I think I would imagine possibly only new thing would be annotating this data and then also possibly just saving it through a CSV file, uh, much like that. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and integrate Jupyter Notebooks with Django. Now, Jupyter Notebooks are incredibly valuable for machine learning and all sorts of data science activities. Now, actually having them integrated with Django gives us the ability to use our Django models, our Django utilities, or pretty much anything related to Django. So that's why we want to integrate them. And if you've never used Jupyter Notebooks before, we will use them a good amount. But the general idea here is they essentially take our Python shell, so Python managed.py shell, and they allow us to remember what's inside of the shell, like 10 times 10 and so on. All right, so I actually already have Jupyter installed, but we'll go ahead and give it a quick look here. The first thing I wanna do is create a new requirements file. So requirements.ml.txt. This of course is just to separate our actual Django web application from the requirements that we may or may not need inside of the web application itself, perhaps in Celery, but for now, we'll just go ahead and create a new requirements uh, file for it. So we'll go ahead and do Jupyter, NumPy, and Pandas. So these are three of the most popular, if not the absolute most popular packages for machine learning in general, but certainly for Python machine learning. So we're gonna go ahead and install these. Let's go ahead and navigate back here with python-m pip install dash r requirements and .ml.txt, hit enter. This will do all of the necessary requirements that you need to install. So now I'll go ahead and create my first notebook to see, really hopefully see the value of integrating Django with Jupyter. So inside of the SRC folder here, I'll go ahead and do MBS. MBS is a very common way to abbreviate notebooks for any given project, let alone a Django one. So inside of here, I'll also go ahead and create setup underscore Django.py. Now I'm just gonna copy and paste this code. It's actually pretty straightforward and I'll also have it below this video. But the idea here is we need a module to call to make sure that I can use the default Django settings module that I have, right? Which is in this case, cfehome.settings. So go ahead and change yours if you're not using cfehome.settings. This of course is the same settings module that you'll find in manage.py, for example, right? So we need to set those things up in order to use Django. And then we also need to make sure that this notebooks folder is actually next to all of my Django code because of this right here. This will actually move my working directory next to all of the Django related stuff so that I can actually use all of the Django related stuff. So let's go ahead and see what that looks like. Let's navigate into SRC here. 
and I'll just run Jupyter and Notebook. I'll hit enter. This will open up a Jupyter Notebook server. Notice that I'm in that same exact location where I have all of my Django code in here, and then I have my NBS. Okay, so inside of NBS here, I'll go ahead and create a new Python 3 notebook. This Python 3 notebook, we'll just go ahead and say movies dataset test. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do is have Jupyter communicate with Django. So we're gonna go ahead and import that setup Django module, the entire thing, right? So this entire module itself, and then we'll call setup Django.init just like that. And that init method is this right here. So this will actually configure and set up all of the things necessary for Django. Granted, you could write all of these in every single notebook, but it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense in our case. So, so I'll just go ahead and keep it in as a module. I'll go ahead and run that. No big deal. Now what I can do is from movies.models import movie. And then I can do a query set of movie.objects.all. Well, let's go ahead and do values and I'll just go ahead and do title and maybe release date, something like that. And we, I mean, we could also do like rating average and rating count while we're at it. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and take a look at this below and we'll see QS. Now you might be wondering, how did I actually run the cell? It's just shift enter as to how you run cells. It's kind of like hitting enter in the Python managed shell, but shift enter is specifically in Jupyter, because of course we have to be able to write multiple lines with just simply enter. Uh, another way to do it is just pressing this run button here too. Um, anyways, so as we see here, we've got our movies data set. So we actually were able to load in our Django data. Now, if I actually commented this out with command uh, and slash or control slash, depending on your system, and I did kernel restart and run all, what I'll get is this error, right? So no module names in movies, mainly because, well, it doesn't work off of Django. It's not currently working off of Django. So yeah, that's uh, an important part of all of this. Okay, great. So now that we've got that, let's actually turn this into a data set or more specifically a data frame. So let's actually call this movies data frame test. Now data frame comes from pandas. So I'll go ahead and do import pandas as PD hit shift and enter. And then I'll go ahead and do DF equals to PD dot data frame. So that class, and we want to initialize that class with this data right here, which I can do with just passing in that query set. And then we can take a look at that data or at least some of it with DF dot head. And then I can say N equals to, let's say 10 items. Hit shift enter and there we go. We've got 10 items in here that are coming through from this data set and most likely in the order of that data set as well, which we can experiment with, with doing qs.first and hit enter. And we get that first item in that query set. And what do you know, it matches the first item in the data frame as well. Cool, so now at this point, we have the ability to start experimenting a lot with all of our Django data. Now, the important part of this is another avenue or another place that we can actually save data as well. So I can call stuff like df.2csv. I'm not gonna do it right now, but we can actually save this entire data set to a CSV file with uh, data frames, right? So with pandas data frames. This actually saves us a ton of time in relation to what we did with this load move movie data. Of course, if we have the ability to load movie data, we also have the ability to export it. And it's actually gonna override a lot of the things that you, we did here. Um, and it's just so much more simple to use Jupyter Notebooks. But the, the main reason here is to actually get to the point where we have data that's fully ready to be trained in a machine learning model, and then also have the ability to experiment with other data sets potentially, experiment by loading them in to our Django project, but also experiment with you know the actual machine learning but then also we can do all sorts of prediction experimentation as well prior to turning it into a feature on our, you know, whether it's on our celery worker process or in our Django process as well. So we're going to be using this a lot going forward. If you have any questions about Jupyter Notebooks at all, let me know. Otherwise, let's keep going.
Now we're gonna go ahead and load in real ratings to our fake users using our Jupyter Notebooks. Now, a big part of the reason for this is because random or pseudo random data that's generated like this is probably not gonna have a great pattern. At the very least, it's not gonna be super accurate to what real people might feel about these things. Now, the best data would be data that you generated on your own site with your own users. And we have a foundation now to be able to export that data on a regular basis, which is what we see in our local CDN here. So now what we're gonna do is actually open up Jupyter Notebooks in here. I'm actually gonna go ahead and duplicate our last notebook. And this one is gonna be called, well, Load Real Ratings. So we'll just go ahead and name it that. So Load Real Ratings to Fake Users. And we'll go ahead and open this up. Now, one of the first things that I do need to do is I need to go into my downloads where I have that original archive there. And that's also where our movie's metadata was. I'm gonna bring in ratings underscore small. You could totally use the bigger one, but it's quite a bit more data. So it's probably not something um, that I recommend doing at this point. So go ahead and drag this on over into your data folder here. And since it's highlighted, I'm also gonna go ahead and make sure that this is on my Git Ignore. So jump, jumping over into Git, I will go ahead and add this into Git Ignore as well. And then we'll just go ahead and save that. Okay, great. So with this rating small, I wanna load this in to my current ratings data set, which actually means that I will be getting rid of my current ratings. So the first thing is, let's just load in this file into a pandas data frame. So I'll go ahead and bring in pandas up at the top and I'll get rid of this. I will go ahead and also go and grab from django.com uh, we're gonna import our settings. I want the base directory here, uh, or more specifically, I want the data directory. So we'll go ahead and say ratings path equals to settings.data dir, and we'll do ratings and small.csv. Let's just verify that that even exists. So let's run these first two cells, and then I'll do ratings path dot exists. And I should see true. Great. Okay, so now, of course, I wanna turn this ratings path into a data frame itself. To do this, we are gonna go ahead and do df equals to pd dot read underscore CSV of whatever the path is to that CSV file. So it can absolutely read path lib paths too, which of course is what this is. Okay, so if we read that, and I'll get rid of this right here, and we'll look at the first few ratings, and there we go. Okay, so I now have the data that I want to load in to my Django database. But of course, this data has user IDs on it. So what we'll need to do is we'll need to verify these user IDs actually exist in our Django documentation, or our Django database. So that means, of course, if you don't verify it, I'll show you where the error comes. But what we do wanna do is grab our current users. And to do that, we'll do from django.contrib.auth. We'll import git user model. And then we'll do user equals to git user and model. Okay, and so our user IDs. So we'll just go ahead and say current users equals to user.objects.all values list of the ID, and we'll go ahead and say flat being true. And that should give us a list of all of our users. The rating users, the ones from the data frame, is as simple as DF or data frame. The column that we want to grab, which is gonna be user ID. This probably looks a little familiar on purpose. And then we are gonna go ahead and say to list. And so that should give us a, another list of IDs in here. And so to actually get the missing IDs, we use set. So if I do missing user IDs and do the set of the rating users minus the set of the current users, I'll see what users are missing from both of these, or more specifically from the ones that are in the ratings, which are these IDs right here. Now, why, why is it that I even need these? Well, um, when we actually go to create the ratings, what we're gonna do is, in a few items, we'll go ahead and do for r in rating records. Then I'll go ahead and do this you know, user rating, and I'll actually unpack the ratings in here, and that will have a user ID. So we'll come to that in just a moment. 
Um, so now what I'll do is I'll create all these users. So for UID in the list of, or just the missing user IDs, I can print all these out here as well. Uh, but basically I want to create a user for this. So I'll just do user.objects.create and the ID, I will set the ID explicitly to that user ID iteration. And then we'll go ahead and set a username as well because that will be required in our case. I'll go ahead and say missing user dash and then maybe the ID or something along those lines. Um, and so I'll go ahead and put UID here. Okay, so then I go run through that and create all of those users and that should actually solve the missing user problem. So if I run this again, I should have nothing in that user set and therefore I won't have to list through anything anymore. So that's now a solved problem in general, uh, which is pretty cool. Okay, so now of course the actual field names that we wanna use are gonna have to be related to the rating. In other words, if we look at our data, we are gonna go ahead and grab, you know, df.head again, this is not how our user data is set up. So if I actually do this to records um, just like this, so we want to actually see what this data ends up looking like, rather to uh, dict of the records. And this will give us a bunch of dictionary values in here. So we want to actually transform that uh, so it actually fits with what a rating model would end up looking like. So how do we go about doing that? Well, first off, we are going to go ahead and create new columns. So the first one is going to be our value column, and this is going to be based off of rating, right? So the rating column. Notice there's 2.5 in here. We did whole numbers, so I'm going to change this to being whole numbers as well. So we use something called apply, and I'll go ahead and say lambda x, and I want to put this into as an integer of, you know, you know, whatever it might be. Now, what I would, I could absolutely use it as that. So let's go ahead and do df.head and take a look. So this actually rounds down the value. I'm actually gonna go ahead and round it up. And so to do this, we have to do a couple different imports. We're gonna import math. We're gonna go ahead and do from decimal, import the decimal class. And so what I wanna do then is run math.ceiling or math.seal and run it like that. This will change things quite a bit. And so it looks like I've got math is not defined. I should have ran the cell above here for a moment. And there we go. So now it's actually like loading these up or rounding these up to the nearest whole number. Cool. And so of course, if you haven't used pandas before, this is gonna be like, well, how did you even know how to do this? Um, what's happening here is it's gonna iterate through each row and it will apply this function right here for me, right? So I could absolutely define a function that does that as well, uh, but it's a super useful way to just quickly change values basically from a, another column, we'll apply all those changes and then add it to being our new column, right? So it's not changing the original value, but rather setting the new value in there. Um, it's very similar to going like iteration by iteration, like in here, I mean, it's very similar to this actually, where we're actually creating almost new data in there. Uh, but nevertheless, we now have a value column that's rounded to the nearest whole number. Uh, that is absolutely important. If you try to set it based off of a decimal number, well, going back into the actual rating model itself, we used rating choices. And those choices are integer choices, and the actual field itself is a integer field. Now you could have changed it to a decimal field. You could re-architect everything to match what we've got here, um, but I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna leave it just like this. Okay, so now the next one is our user ID, and this is gonna be simply DF and user ID. And then finally, our actual object ID is DF and the movie ID. Okay, great. And then of course, df.head, and we can see uh, after we run those cells, we see all of the new values in here. Now, the user ID is actually a hidden field in here because of this foreign key. So I can actually set the user ID to like, you know, 10 or something, and then it would set the foreign key to the user object of 10, which makes things really a lot easier when we're adding a bunch of data like we're about to do. 
So the next thing with this is to then not, or like basically ignore everything except for our new columns here. So to, the way I do it is typically I would do something like a transformed DF equals to DF dot copy. So copying the original data frame and then taking only certain columns in here. So the columns I want, columns are gonna be the user ID, the value, and then the object ID. Those are the columns I want. So those are the ones I will pass through in here, just like that. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this one now. Now we should have transform df.head, hit enter, and here are a lot closer to the data that we want. And then of course, if I actually changed it to dict of the uh, records, this will give me all of the dictionary values that I would end up using. Hopefully some of this stuff is starting to look familiar with you know how our query sets end up working and what we did in that last one, right? So when we did these values here, they give us something very similar. They give us dictionary values. So we're basically going the reverse direction, of course, right? So if we come in here, we can see here's all those dictionary values, very, very similar. Okay, cool. Um, so now that we do have the records here, uh, what I wanna have is, I'll go ahead and set this to rating records. I'm actually gonna go ahead and delete all of my current ratings. So let's go ahead and do from ratings.models, import rating, and then qs equals to rating.objects.all, and then qs.delete. Now, there's already a lot of ratings on here. I have probably close to a million or something like that, some ridiculous number. Um, those are gonna be just completely ignored. We have all of the ability to continue to make some of that random data if we need to, uh, but I'm just gonna go ahead and run this. And while that's running, I can start writing the next part. So the next part is of course getting our content type stuff. So I'll go ahead and do from Django.contrib.contenttypes.models. We're gonna import the content type class and C type is equal to content type objects that get app label being movies and the model being movie. Okay, so we've got that content type and there we go. Next one is going to be just iterating through all of these rating records and creating a new rating. So let's go ahead and do that now. So uh, we'll go ahead and say new rating is equal to an empty list. So we'll do for r in rating records. We'll go ahead and do r and content type. And this is gonna be equal to that C type. Now, if I print out r and then break it, just so we can see what it looks like, the very first one is now giving us a value that I could set a rating object on. So we'll go ahead and do new rating dot append. And this is gonna be our rating model, unpacking the R, and then we'll go ahead and after all that's all said and done, we'll do rating.objects.bulk, create new rating, or rather new ratings, let's change it with an S. Okay, and then we'll go ahead and ignore conflicts being true, and we'll add in a batch size of a thousand. Okay, so now we'll just go ahead and run that. This will take a moment, but it will give us a bunch of new ratings, and hopefully we won't have any errors with our actual users themselves. Okay, so there it went, went through. It actually did create a bunch of ratings in here, um, and we are seeing a bunch of none in there. We'll take a look as to why in a moment. Um, so in our rating records, if our user ID was non-existent, in other words, if we didn't do this part, we would get a foreign key error and it'd be really hard to diagnose. It'd be hard to figure it out just from that foreign key error. So going back into our ratings here now, I see that I am rating a bunch of things and there's also empty content, content objects. This is because this object ID doesn't actually have a movie listed in our database. That movie just does not exist in here, which is just one of those things where we sort of have to uh, like update our, our movie list, if you will, um, and try and figure those things out, which is definitely outside the scope of what I wanna do here. And so now, of course, my actual movie ratings listing, what's, what I see is not showing up either. So we're gonna go ahead and bring in the task of, you know, update movie ratings. 
back into our time frame here, or excuse me, our, our um, back into our uh, notebook here. We'll go ahead and do from ratings.tasks. We're gonna import that task movie rating update, and then we'll run this through. And now our top movies will be adjusted based off of you know the actual votes and stuff like that. And I mean, in many cases, there'll only be a couple of votes in there. Uh, but overall, we our ratings are a lot closer to what they should be. And then our recent movies, we will also see some other ratings related to that too. Pretty neat. Now that we have these ratings, we're a lot closer to doing real collaborative filters. Whenever we use third-party data like we did with our movies data set, we run the risk of inconsistencies in that data. And we've actually seen this now with our ratings. Now that we've loaded in these ratings, we have seen those inconsistencies because in theory, the movies data set that was given to us is the same exact data that would be based off of these ratings. And in some sense it is, but we need to do some investigating to figure out how to update our store movies to that correct data. Now we've actually already seen something sort of like this when we generated a bunch of fake users and then added in that fake data, right? So we needed to make sure that our users, if we were missing some users from the rating users and the current users, we actually just created those new users. Now we can't exactly do that with the movies because we don't want a duplicate of any of these movies. We want just that one single movie and it's one single rating or group of ratings depending on what's going on. So it's a slightly different problem, although very similar. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna open up my notebooks and I'm gonna duplicate that fake ratings one and we're gonna go through it in here. So let's go ahead and rename this and I'll go ahead and call this update movie IDs and ratings. Okay, so let's go ahead and open it up. And what I wanna do is I will leave out the ratings. I'll go ahead and get rid of pretty much everything below the first few imports here. And we'll go ahead and delete those cells. Okay, so what's the first thing that I actually need to address? And that is figuring out which movie IDs are missing based off of the ratings that I currently have. So to do this, I'm gonna go ahead and import from ratings.models. We're gonna import our rating. And I'll use my intuition for this, which would be grabbing a rating query set, so rating.objects.all, and then filtering it down by content object being null, like that. Now, we sort of saw this already to some degree with in here, right? So we actually got all of the IDs, we looked for the different sets to find which ones were missing, and so on. I'm sort of doing something similar here, or at least I think I am. So if I actually run this, what I'll get is an error, right? So the content object itself is not actually attached to any of this data. So it's actually very similar to if I do dot values and content object in here as well, or let's go ahead and say content object underscore ID, that also still will not give me that data, right? And so if I actually wanted to grab some of this data, I would go to the source of the content object but I'm not trying to do a reverse relationship here. Instead, what I'm trying to do is I'm really just trying to find the ratings that have an empty content object, or more specifically, I'm trying to get the object ID that relates to those being empty. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna get rid of this, and I wanna find my missing movie IDs. And this is gonna be an empty list here. So all I'm gonna do is do for object in QS, that is true, I'm gonna go through all of the rating objects here. And I'll go ahead and say if object.content object is none, as in it does not have a content object, I'm gonna go ahead and add in, we'll append in our object dot, this now is gonna be our obj dot object ID. So the actual instance itself, let's go ahead and call this instance just so it's not too confusing here. But basically, if each instance does not have an object ID, we'll go ahead and grab and add the object ID um, onto our missing movies here. And then we'll go ahead and do a couple things. First off is gonna be my, let's just do underscore total, is gonna be missing movies, well, the length of the missing movies. And then I'll go ahead and just say total missing is equal to, well, let's do a, set of those missing movies, and we'll actually turn those back into a list as well. Now, of course, using a set means that it will get rid of all of the duplicates. 
And then I can go ahead and print out the length of that total missing as well as the original total to see if there's a difference there. I think there will be, but maybe not, of course, because ratings might rate the same movie several times. So let's go ahead and run this. This will actually take some time, uh, time to actually run through all of these ratings, right? And, and even more time if you actually used uh, the big rating data set that we had before, or uh, that, that, that was certainly an option. So while that's running, we'll go ahead and talk about the data set we need to bring in here. And that's gonna be from our downloads, assuming you still have the downloads from the movies data set, which of course is in some sense from the movies lens data set, a much bigger data set, but it does have additional data in there as well. So in this data, we're gonna go ahead and bring over links underscore small. Now, of course, if you're using the big ratings, you would just use the big links. So in here, what we see is a movie ID. This is the same movie ID that's in the ratings themselves. We also see an IMDB ID and a TMDB ID. These are two different sources for where the data could possibly be. Two different IDs from two different services that were combined essentially to bring in the movie's metadata here. And we can actually scroll over and see in this movie's metadata, we have the IMDB ID in here as well, and we might have the other one. Um, but the, th the thing is that we already see with this data that's inconsistent is the fact that they're using underscores here, whereas here they're not using underscores. But I have a really good uh, like a sense that it is roughly the same data, if not the exact same. Um, now, I've already actually experimented with this a lot, so I know that it is roughly the same data. And that sort of experimentation I'll leave to you, but I'm gonna give you the techniques that I used so you can try it out as well. So first off, I don't want this links to be in my Git repo, so I'll go ahead and add it to my Git ignore while I'm at it. And so at this point, I think maybe the IDs have been loaded and it looks like they have. I actually did the wrong print statement here, so I'll just cut that out and paste it underneath here. And there we go. So my total missing is about a little over 6,000 movies where the number of ratings that are affected is 56,000, which is crazy to think because the actual count of ratings is all, like almost double that rough. This is the total amount of movies that are missing is about half as far as the ratings are concerned. So this is a major issue, something that we definitely want to address. So now what we're gonna do is load in that links small so to do this, we're gonna go ahead and bring in a few more imports. I'll just bring it back up here. And the first one is from django.com. We're gonna go ahead and import our settings. And I'm gonna go ahead and create my links small CSV path. And this is gonna be settings.baseDir and links small.csv. The, or not base dir, rather data dir, much like we did over here the data directory as well, okay? And we can also check that it exists, and of course it does. Okay, so let's go ahead and make sure pandas is also installed. So we'll go ahead and, or imported rather. So import the pandas as PD, and then we'll go ahead and grab in our links data frame. So I'll call this links df, and this is gonna be pd.read csv, and it's gonna be that path there and I'll do links df.head, hit enter, and there we go. Okay, great. So um, now what I wanna do is I wanna actually find inside of here these movie IDs that are related to these missing movie IDs, right? So I want to narrow down this list here and I'll just call this my ms underscore df as in my missing data frame. And this is gonna be taking from this links data frame I'm gonna go ahead and look inside of here. We'll go ahead and first off copy it because I'm gonna narrow it down a bit. And I'll do linksdf dot movie ID dot is in, and then it's inside of this list right here. Whatever that list ends up being. We could also just do total missing. And so if I come in here, this is how we actually narrow down a data frame itself. So we grab the data frame itself. I'm gonna go ahead and copy it because I want a new copy essentially. And then I use this method here to narrow it down. We grab the original data frame, the column, and then we wanna look if that column value is inside of that list. 
this is going to give me that data. So we can do msdf, not dot heads, but rather dot head. And we see that it does have some values in here. Now, the key thing is I actually want to check that this data frame, we look at the shape here and we see that the first item in here, this actually counts the number of rows that are in this data frame. And three is the number of columns. Okay, so the number of rows, we actually want to check that it's equal to our total missing. So the length of our total missing and we get true. Great. So in other words, our links data frame here has the exact number of items that are missing from our entire ratings data set, which is fantastic. That's exactly what we want to see because that means that I now have matches over here that we might end up using. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to have to enrich this column for IMDB ID. Now, the reason I have to enrich it is because of how IMDB works. So if I go to imdb.com um, and look at some movie title, what I see here is TT slash and all of these IDs in here. And if you went through the entire data frame, you would find that TT is not in that ID. So I need to update how it ends up working. So we're going to define something called enrich the IMDB row. And I'll go ahead and say value, or rather the IMDB column is probably a better term for this. And what I want to see is the value equals to the string of the value. So regardless of how the data frame is treating this data right now, I'm going to append data to it, which is why I'm going to make it a string. So I'll go ahead and say if the length of this value is equal to 7, then I'm going to do something to return the value. And then if the length of the value is equal to six, then I'm going to return a different value. And then my default will just be to return that value. So what I uncovered was when I was doing the IMDB section is that if it's at a seven, I just am going to go ahead and append the TT in there. So we'll do an F string and I'll just do TT and that value. And then if it was a six, it still has that TT in there, but it also adds a zero in front of it. And more than likely, if it's a five, it probably adds two zeros, which I didn't actually test out, but we'll go ahead and do that. So basically, at the end of the day, the IMDB ID seems to always be of a length of nine. That's kind of the key to it. And this is a way to enrich this data to just sort of basically assume that. Now, I might lose some data in here, but the vast majority of it through my tests actually showed this to be successful. So now what I want to do is make a new column and I want to use the IMDB column. So MSDF and IMDB with a capital I in there. And I want to enrich it by doing apply and we'll go ahead and grab this function in here. So of course what it does is the value on each columns row is going to run through this function. So it certainly could take a, a good amount of time, but it's actually not that many data set items. So it's like 6,000. So this right here doesn't necessarily take that much time. Now, if you used all of the data, you might want to go and just say to CSV and save it and then open up a brand new Jupyter Notebook to run off of that CSV. Um, that's not something I'm going to do because it won't take that long. So if I do msdf.head and hit enter, um, I'm getting none in here. So it looks like I did something incorrect. Perhaps I did the IMDB ID incorrectly. So let's go ahead and try that again. Still getting none. Haha, -ha, this is why. So I have value is not being returned. That's a problem. And if I do it now, I now have this, you know, TT column in here. Finally. Okay, great. So now what's the next thing I need to do? Well, I need to compare this TT column against something else that already exists. So let's go ahead and bring in the movies data frame. So I'll go ahead and do my movies metadata or just really movies CSV. And there's going to be movies underscore metadata dot CSV. I believe that's the name of it, but we'll go ahead and check with dot exists. That solves that issue on whether or not it's the name. Of course, if I did movies metadata D, it will say false. Cool. So now that I've got this, I'll go ahead and do my movies data frame. And this is going to be equal to, of course, pd.read. CSV and this data right here. 
Now in this case, I actually only want a few columns and I'll go ahead and do use calls. The columns that I want in here are my movies, let's say calls equals to the title, the overview, the release date. And we also, of course, are gonna want the IMDB ID. Now, why is it that I want just this data? Well, the reason being is I'm actually going to update my MSDF with some of this data. That's all I'm really doing here. And it's really for spot checking the titles when we need to spot check it. So I'm gonna go ahead and do movies.df.head and hit enter and there we go. So we only get those columns in there that we wanted. Of course, figuring out what those columns are, there's two different ways on how to do it. Of course, you could load in the entire data frame and then look at the columns or we could just remember back to what we did um, when we actually loaded in this data itself inside of our utilities, I think maybe in CFE home, we loaded in this movie data and those were really the only columns we were concerned about. Certainly we had the ID column and we could certainly bring that in, but it's actually not necessary and I'll show you why in just a moment. The reason is because now what we're gonna do is we're gonna now make our missing movies data frame and it's gonna be from our original MSDF. And we're gonna go ahead and merge it with this movies DF, okay? And what we wanna do here is we wanna merge it or actually combine these data pieces because of this IMDB ID here. Notice that this one is TT and this one is also TT. And luckily for us, the very first actually match with each other, which is very fortunate for this example, but it's very rarely ever works out that way. So instead of using the movie ID, which is what we stored in here as well, instead of using that, we're gonna go ahead and grab the TT and use that as our like merging factor. So the left-hand side is gonna be this data. This is the data we want to keep. The right-hand side is gonna be this data, this is the data we want to bring in. So we're gonna go ahead and say left on, and this is gonna be TT, this right here. And then the right on, and this is gonna be this column right here. And then we'll go ahead and do our missing movies df.head and hit enter. Cool. So now we see it enriched. Now, if I had all of this data reversed, as in if I had movies DF on this side and MSDF on this side, we would then be enriching the movies data frame, not the, you know, the links data frame that I have here or the MSDF that I have here. That gets a little complicated, so definitely try it out, play around to see what it looks like if it is complicated to you. But at this point, now we have this missing movies data frame. So what I wanna do here is I wanna grab a couple things. I wanna grab the actual movie ID, right? So this is gonna be the movie ID that I'll end up saving or updating my, rate, my movies data set with, that's this in here. So we're gonna go ahead and grab a, um, we're gonna actually add that field in there. So we'll go ahead and do movies, missing movies uh, data frame. We'll go ahead and say the ID, and it's gonna be based off of the missing movies DF and we'll call that movie ID, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and do something similar with the TMDB ID, okay? And I'll call this ID alt, okay? So what I assume here is what I stored in my data set, the IDs here are basically going to be interchanged in some cases. In other words, the movie ID sometimes references IMDB, the movie ID sometimes re references TMDB. So TMDB is the movie database, just another place that you can actually grab movie data in addition to IMDB, which is a much, probably much more well-known one. Nevertheless, I'm gonna go ahead and use both of these as potential IDs to update or change with my database ID stuff. So the thing is though, if we look at this data, Right here, this looks like a float number. So I actually want to change it. So I'll go ahead and do apply. And there's going to be lambda x. This is just going to be the string of the integer of x. Okay. All it is is just changing this into a string so that it's not 0. 
because if the movie ID was ever referenced with this string here in our database, we would actually have stored it as an ID. So in here, we actually store it as an integer as well. That's kind of the idea. So let's go ahead and take a look at this now. And now we have our ID and our ID alternate, right? So the TM ID, TMDB ID is the same. It's just now doesn't have zero on the end, basically. So now this leaves us to our actual final data frame. So our final data frame is only going to be part of this data frame right here. So the final underscore DF is equal to this movie's data frame. We'll go ahead and copy it. And now just the columns that I want. In my case, I only want ID and ID alt, and then finally the title. Okay. And then of course, we'll go ahead and take a look at this and do dot head and there we go. Okay. So the reason for this is because I'm going to go ahead and now look up basically all of my movies that have this alt ID. The original ID is the original one I stored. So now I have basically the original one that's stored in our data set. That's also in our database because when we loaded it in, it just went off of the movie ID itself. Um, and that's generally speaking, what the ID was that we ended up saving. It's not always true, but generally speaking, it is. And then we'll also look at alt ID. So let's just go ahead and grab all of the alt IDs here. So I'll go ahead and do alt ID list equals to this final data frame. We'll grab the alt ID alt and then to list hit enter. Next, we'll go ahead and grab our movies QS being to movie.objects.filter ID in this alt ID list. And then I'll do movies QS.count. And we need to import movies here. So let's go ahead and bring it up here from movies.models import movie and come back down here. And we'll go ahead and run this. I accidentally ran this cell, so it's going to take just a moment. And there we go. We have now identified 6,000 movies that are mistaken for the incorrect IDs. So if we scroll up a bit, that means we're losing about 300 movies, which I think is acceptable at this time. We could absolutely drill in a little bit more to find what the challenge would end up being. Now, my sneaking suspicion is that if I actually used movie ID in the first place, perhaps this would have changed because I actually used ID in here. I did not use movie ID when we loaded in that movie metadata CSV. So that is certainly something you could try. But I'm going to go ahead and stick with this one for now because realistically, we're really close to solving the problem. We're really close to solving what the actual data would end up being. Okay, cool. So now what I want to do is I want to go through some of this data here. Now to do this, what I'm going to do first is import from django.forms.models. We're going to import something called model to dict. And what we want to do in here is we'll go ahead and do for obj in the movies query set here. I'm only going to do up to one. And all I want to print out here is maybe the obj.id. And that we will also check if it's in my final data set here. So I'll go ahead and say data equals to the final DF dot copy. We absolutely want to copy this on purpose because, um, well, every iteration will just recopy it because we're going to go ahead and narrow it down with final um, and underscore DF, the ID alt. And it's going to be equal to the string of OBJ dot ID. Now I paused the video and added to make sure that it definitely is a string in here. So I can also make sure here as well. We did that before. So it definitely should be. This is just an optional thing if need be. So basically what we want to see here is the size of this. So data dot shape and run that. And sure enough, we get one item coming back from here with three columns. And then we got the item ID, which is two. So it actually is finding that data for us, which is great. So with this, we'll go ahead and do if data dot shape uh, of, you know, the first iteration or the first element, rather the index item of zero uh, is equal to one, then we'll go ahead and start doing some stuff. Now, the things we want to do is I want to get the OG 
data, the OG model data, let's call this OG model data, being equal to, well, model to dict of the object itself. And we can print out what that looks like. Run it again. And that gives me all of that original data because I want to update the ID. Since the ID is the primary key, I can't just do obj.id. That actually causes havoc for us a little bit. Um, so what I want to do though, is instead of just obj.id, I want to grab my new data. So we'll go ahead and say updated data is coming from this like basically small data frame. And then we'll go ahead and do two dicks of records. And since we know that there's only one record in here, I can grab that first index item. And this will give me that data, which we can look at by printing out both of them. Let's go ahead and print them out next to each other, one after the other. And so the bottom one is here, the top one is here. So what we can do now is we can of course verify the titles. Let's go ahead and do that and just say, if the object.title is equal to maybe the data right here and that title, or let's actually use the record data itself. So record data .get of title, then we'll go ahead and print these things out. So this is just another check. This is why I have the title in there is just to make sure that the titles are the same because perhaps I got the IDs wrong, but if the titles are the same, then we probably feel pretty good that the updated data has the correct ID. And so what I need to do is really just grab my original model data, change the ID to my updated model data, and that's it. I could change the title. I could add an enrich other data in here if I wanted to, I just am not going to. And so now I've got my original model data and I can print out it twice, I'll get rid of this updated data. If I print out twice, it shows me this new object ID. So what I'm gonna do then is I'm actually gonna go ahead and do obj.delete. This will delete that original movie object, obj.delete. But the fact that I don't have a actual foreign key to the movies at this point with my ratings especially, if there was a foreign key, it would delete all of those ratings that are associated to this. So if I made a mistake, it would delete those ratings, which we don't want. But of course, um, since I don't have that foreign key, I have a generic foreign key, I can absolutely now do movie.objects.create and we'll go ahead and use all of that new OG model data, which really I'm gonna go ahead and just rename it to being the new model data is equal to that OG model data, just so I'm not confused ever in the future, uh, which of course we could also just iterate a new dictionary in there as well uh, and do something like that. And so now let's remember this ID of 4470. I'm going to go ahead and run through this again. Let's print both things out this first iteration so I can see it again. I'm going to run it and now I've got 4470 in here. So let's go into my ratings or rather my movies first and we wanna find the ID. I don't have a way to filter these down. So let's jump into the admin for those and we'll add in search filter and we'll go ahead and just add in ID there for the movie. And we'll refresh in here, assuming that I did uh, that search, that's not search filter, but rather search fields. And there we go. Now I paste in that ID and what do you know, there's Arial right there and the ID is up here. Of course, I could have just pasted it into the URL as well, uh, but now that, that actual data is there and working. So the next and final thing would be to come back into our movies and right below this, I'm gonna go ahead and run the update movie ratings here because that will actually update all of my ratings after some time. But of course, I only did one item in here. I'm gonna do all of the items now so let's go ahead and get rid of this right here. And I will actually bring in the query set right above it just to make sure that it's only working off of those missing IDs query set. It might try to do Arial again, but the thing is the data itself won't be found uh, because it's deleted. As in Arial won't show up again because uh, it won't be in this query set any longer. So let's go ahead and run this. This should take a good amount of time because it's 6,000 and now 33 movies, 
Um, so of course I'll let that finish and then we'll come back and take a look. All right, so there it is. After some time, it was all updated. So if we go back into our ratings here, ooh, there it is, much, much better. We actually have a lot more ratings coming through. Really exciting. So now let's go ahead and update our display for actual proper popularity. So now we finally have all of the correct and real ratings in our data set. So what we wanna do is update how our popularity is sorted. So there's a couple different ways on how we could go about approaching this. What I'm gonna do is create a query set approach first, and then we'll talk about other ones. So the query set approach would be inside of the movies model. We're gonna go ahead and define a new one called popular, and it's gonna take in self, and then we'll go ahead and return some sort of query set here. Now, what I wanna do is I actually want to annotate some score. So I'll go ahead and do annotate and score equals to, well, what do we want this to equal to? Now, first and foremost, I can use that F function here on a query set. And I could say something like rating average, right? We totally could do that. Generally speaking, the average rating maybe could be the score. But of course, the problem with this is, well, um, this is not giving us the accurate score. It's not giving us any kind of scores. It's giving us the rating. In many ways, we could just leave the view as is if we were going to keep that. So if we scroll back into the list view here, this is where we actually can resort everything, right? And so I don't want to do that. What I want to do is calculate an actual score here. So I can bring in another one called sum. And with this, I can use it, wrap it around a score. Let me just write out sum around here and put another parentheses here. Okay, so I can do average score, and then I wanna add in something called an output field, and there's gonna be models.float field. Okay, so as of now, this is not great either because it's not really calculating anything. So the question of course is, what am I gonna to use to calculate this score? Well, what I'm gonna use is the rating average and the rating count. Sure is a good thing that we added those two fields to all of our movies. And so this will be able to give me some sort of popularity score in of itself. So with this in mind, let's go ahead and go into one more thing here is we wanna actually, from the annotation, we're gonna go ahead and then do order by whatever that's, that actual variable name that we put here, which is just simply score. So with that in mind, let's go into our views here and I'm just gonna comment all of these out for a moment. And then we'll just do QS is gonna be, well, let's leave, actually we'll leave in the query set. I'll just comment out everything else. And then QS.popular. Okay, so we'll save that and we'll refresh in our view here. And right now it's giving us popular, maybe the wrong direction. So let's go back into our model itself, do minus score and reverse that direction. And there we go. Cool. So now it's giving us million dollar hotel, never heard of it, but it does have a lot of ratings in here. Forrest Gump, great movie, love this movie. So yes, absolutely. Now it's starting to show me movies that are realistic for high score movies, um, which is definitely a much better feeling. And the score I came up with is really just taking the average time, the amount of, you know, actual items that it was rated. So this, of course, means that ones that are five stars um, aren't necessarily going to show up here if they only have a few ratings, right? That's kind of the point. The other thing is I want to have unpopular show up as another sorting option still. So I'll go ahead and add in reverse here being false. So basically what I wanna do is say ordering is the negative score. So by default, it's going to be negative. If reverse, then the ordering is the score. And now I have a method I could use to have true popularity in here. So going back into my view here, now I need to update how I sort everything. So let me just break this down a little bit. This time I'm gonna go ahead and give the rating. So I'm gonna do this in terms of top rated and low 
rated. So now it's based off of the actual rating. These are gonna be popular and well, maybe unpopular. So those are new sorting choices as well. So my default sort here now is gonna be request.get that sort or the session itself, or finally, I'm gonna put this in as simply popular. Okay, so I'll get rid of all this, or actually I will leave it as reference for a moment. And then we'll go ahead and say that this could just be, instead of default sort, it could just be sort now. And again, bringing this back in, this is close, but it's not quite there. Because really, if the sort equals to popular, then I wanna return back qs.popular. If the sort equals to unpopular, then I wanna return back the, well, the reverse of that. So that's gonna be reverse being true. Now, I could absolutely make a new method called just simply unpopular as well, uh, but I'll just leave it like that. Otherwise, it'll go off of that original sort that we had. And now this is a little bit cleaner of a value. Um, and I'm also gonna go ahead and just leave it with whatever that default sort would end up being overall anyway. So as in, if for some reason sort is none, um, then we'll just leave that query set sort like that. Okay, so now going back into my movies, I have new rankings here. I can go off of unpopular, it'll refresh. I can go off of top rated. Now it's showing me what I originally had, lower rated and so on, right? Um, pretty simple as far as the sorting is concerned. But now what I wanna do is add in a recommended view. So if I come down into my movie infinite rating view, I'm gonna copy it, paste down here. This time what I'm gonna do is simply, well, a couple things. We'll call this movie, uh, let's do popular view. And there we go. So movie popular view. And we can come in here. I actually do want to have it exclude IDs. So the query set is going to be movie.objects.filter. And this is, or rather, dot all dot popular. And then dot exclude ID in exclude IDs. Cool. This of course is not actually what I want, but rather my movie ID options. So I will go ahead and add in dot values and the ID, well, let's do values list. And we'll go ahead and say flat being true. So then I will go ahead and use only those. So ID in those movie ID options. Granted, it's two query sets here now, but the point is it's gonna only be popular movies, um, at least to some degree, or at least rated in only popular movies, and then it's gonna exclude all of these other ones. So really, maybe I would also wanna have up here a cutoff of like maybe the top 250 most popular movies on there. And now I've got this movie popular view, and then we'll go into my URLs add in a new path called popular and movies popular view, or did I call it movie, uh, movie popular view? Save that and we'll go into movies popular. And what do you know? These are now gonna give me better, more popular movies. Okay, great. So I'm gonna also add in to my templates. Let's go into our nav bar and grab in a copy and paste here and just do popular. Okay, there we go, very good. So at this point, I actually have a recommendation engine, kind of, and it's kind of collaborative filtering. Now, the reason that I even say these things is because we can assume several things about our user. Number one, this user is coming here for a movie. So if you go to popular review, these are popular movies. So it's safe to say, hey, I sort of think that you might like these movies. Some of them are really good, right? Like, I don't know, I've never heard of that one. Never heard of that one. 
right? So there's definitely going to be movies that you've never heard of, and maybe it'd be worth watching, right? And so that's kind of the key here is we want to actually be able to review various movies that you might really, really like. And so if we stopped right here, this is how a lot of websites still work in terms of popular. But the thing is, I wanted to mention another way to calculate this popular score and perhaps something you would rather do. Um, and so if we go back into ratings and our tasks here, that popular score could actually be right in here. And so I could actually do score equals to the aggregate rate times the count, or really the rating average times the count. And then having a new field in here called score being score, right? And this is actually probably something I would rather do because I can then run this task on a regular basis. Whereas my current method of popular works fine, but it's actually gonna be calculating this over and over and over again, which is certainly not ideal. So I'm gonna go ahead and do popular calc here. And I'm just gonna add in popular and having basically the same thing and reverse being false. So it's roughly the same thing with in terms of ordering and all that. And this time it's just gonna be return self order by and ordering because score will become a field now. So let's go ahead and make it a field inside of here. I'm gonna go ahead and do score and we'll do models dot decimal field and I'll give it multiple places as well. You could use a float field or a decimal field. It doesn't actually matter that much in this case. And then I'll go ahead and make migrations. So Python manage.py make migrations and then python manage.py migrate very good and then going back into our task here um, our score should be absolutely working in there um, so let's go ahead and try that out and i think we all already have this in our management commands so let's just do a quick test for that i'll do a search for it and if we look in here there's our management command for updating the rating so i'll run python manage.py and calculate ratings, hit enter, and we're getting an invalid operation for uh, this decimal. So clearly uh, it's not allowing me to do that decimal itself. So let's go ahead and take a look as to why. So in the task itself, I might need to just change this into being a decimal instance. So let's go ahead and try that out. So import decimal and then I'll come back down here and the score I get is gonna be decimal dot decimal. It might have been a lot easier just as a float field. Uh, let's go ahead and try it again and still having some issues with that score. So let's go ahead and look at some of them. Print out score and it's giving me some scores here. Yeah, it's not actually making them decimals. So uh, which is kind of interesting. So I'll go ahead and times this by 1.0 and try that again. Still giving me an invalid error. <laughs> hilarious. Okay, so let's go ahead and just change this to a float field then because the actual data type doesn't really matter that much. Let's see if the float field does us any better. And we'll go ahead and migrate this. And let's try and calculate this time. That time we didn't get an error. Okay, great. I think it, it looks like because of some of the calculations that it was just a bit off um, as far as the decimal field is concerned. Like I didn't round it and all that. I could have rounded it. That would have actually solved the issue if I rounded it to the nearest uh, two digits or whatever. Um, but I just changed it to a float field just to keep, keep things simple for us. So if we save that and run it again, we can just now test our popular again. Should be the exact same sort of ordering in terms of our movies and our popular recommendations overall. Terminator Rise of the Machines, I can't believe this is so high. This is not, in my opinion, that great of a movie. It's not terrible, but it's not great. Um, anyway, so now we've got a lot of really good stuff in here that I think is pretty accurate for recommendations. Definitely for me, I'm, I'm looking at these, I'm like, hey, man, these are, these are some great movies um, that I really, really enjoyed myself and I continue to enjoy some of them 
to this day. Um, so this is, of course, not collaborative filtering. This is just using math, uh, which, of course, collaborative filtering uses math, too. But this is using pretty fundamental math, and it assumes that the average rating that someone gives is a good way to recommend movies to you, which is not always true, right? So like, let's go to the unpopular ones. Unforgiven, I've heard amazing things about this movie. Perhaps it's amazing. Mars Attacks, I actually like Mars Attacks. I don't know why this is rated so low, right? And so on and so forth. So that's one thing to think about. Also just simply lowest rated, Groundhog's Day. I love Groundhog's Day, this is great right? Um, granted, it was rated by one by one person. So it's not a great rating system um, in terms of recommendations. It's accurate in terms of the fact that it's rated based off of all these people. And perhaps if we used that bigger data set, we would have even better ratings in here and thus even better popular movies. But another huge consideration for this score that we're just not taking into account here are maybe page views, right? So what if in this score we actually wanted to grab in the page views? What if we also wanted to grab in uh, the sales? Like what if this movie was sailing like crazy, sailing, selling like crazy, like a bunch of movie tickets were sold and therefore the score should go up, the score that we're giving it. Really, this is just a ranking that is sort of arbitrary in here. Collaborative filtering does arbitrary rankings as well, but it's not nearly as arbitrary as what I'm trying to accomplish here. That being said though, is we can actually start to think of these scores in terms of potential other kinds of collaborative filtering models, which we'll talk about once we get there. But at this point, we actually do have a recommendation engine. It's just not based in machine learning. Let's go ahead and make that change. In this one, we're gonna talk at a high level what collaborative filtering is. I wanna show you several examples so you have a better sense as to what's going on with the machine learning training so that when we do implement collaborative filtering, we can see what's sort of important and what's not. So first and foremost, if we actually do an import, a rating object import based off of a user and a rating of five or greater. So at this point, the thought is just a user, just a rating. These are the things we're looking for to provide some sort of recommendation off of what other people have said. So based off of those things, we see that we've got a movie with a specific ID. It was rated five by user one. So we can grab other user IDs based off of this same value. And that's what's happening here. And then from that, we can grab what all of those other users have rated at least a four or higher. So we could sort of assume that these are highly rated movies from these same users, from this same single movie. And from there, we can make assertions about, well, what we could predict to this single user right here. But unfortunately, these assertions end up being a lot of movies. Now, what I have here is actually probably valid for a much smaller data set. As in, if there's only 50 items, whether it's movies or products or whatever, 50 things that are rated in the entire data set, but maybe it's rated by a thousand users and they're very polarizing, this might actually work, right? So maybe a lot of users rated a five and a lot of users rated a one, and this might actually give me real ratings. But as we see here, this doesn't do a whole lot for me, right? Like offering 3000 suggestions to somebody doesn't give them really a good idea of what they should watch now or what are the next 10 movies they should watch. This is the next 3000. That's gonna take a really long time to go through. So we need a better mental model as to what's going on here. So let's go ahead and take a look at other attributes or other ways to think about giving a prediction or a set of predictions to a particular user. So if we look in here, we now have two different movie attributes, right? And then the actual user's preferences. So just by looking at this data, we see that movie one, sci-fi comedy with the latest action hero, user A is probably gonna like. They like comedy, sci-fi, and the latest action movie star. Movie two, they might like, because it has that user. So one third of the attributes of this, they might actually end up liking it. Maybe not. But what we need to do here is we need to take these attributes and preferences, and we need to turn them into math. We need to actually be able to calculate something with them. So the first thing is to take my user's preferences here and go ahead and just grab them and 
put them into numbers between one and negative one. This is arbitrary here, right? So I'm just trying to conceptualize this for you. These arbitrary numbers do correspond to what we wrote up here, as in they really like comedies. They pretty much really like sci-fi. And then they, you know, mostly like this action star, right? So, so we're sort of assuming that of all of the movies, these are the five or three attributes that we're really, really concerned about. So in the case of this user, it's just these three attributes. That's it. We don't think about anything else. Not, the, not what they rated this movie, not what anybody else has rated, just these attributes, just these preferences. And so with that, then we take those two movies and we score them against this user's preferences, like what they actually have in the movie. And so these are the scores we get. The first movie is a sci-fi comedy with that action hero. Absolutely. These numbers look reasonable. The second movie is a historical fiction with drama. These also look pretty reasonable. And perhaps that action hero, that latest action movie star, is only in it half the time or less than half. And therefore, it gets this rating. Okay. So now we have three different rating scores. So now we have three different mathematical, you know, items that we can actually do some, some, some good math on to make some predictions. In other words, we can grab my preferences, rate them against the movie one attribute scores, and then my preference rates them against the movie two attribute scores. Again, as people, as humans, we can look at these three things and be like, okay, well, movie user A is obviously going to like movie one, but not movie two, right? But our computers need to actually use data. They can't just look at a sentence like this and make an assertion. Well, at least not yet. Machine learning will get us there. But right now we have these two scores and this user's preferences. And so we can actually make an assertion. We can predict what their rating is based off of all that stuff. So the first movie gets a 2.4 out of a possible three. The second movie gets a negative almost one out of a negative three. So the first movie, we have a really high likelihood that this user is going to like it. The second movie, we have a really low likelihood that they're, they're going to like it, right? Not the lowest possible one, but definitely low. And so we now have a way to predict what this user might like. But of course, there's a huge challenge here. One of them that you probably already know. We don't know what user A's preferences are, nor do we know what attributes this movie has that are important. We really are making guesses here as to what might be important. In fact, this used to be the way Netflix and other kinds of recommendation engines used to do things. They used to survey their users, ask a bunch of questions to find out well, what their preferences are. And then from there, they might take some professional like movie experts to start giving movies attributes based off of user preferences and, and so on. And then giving these scores automatically and thus then starting to give some rating recommendations based off of this. This right here, though, is, of course, not collaborative filtering. This doesn't say anything about other users' preferences either, right? And, of course, we could start to take that into account and make better scores as well. But that's actually where collaborative filtering starts to come in. So if we take a look at what data we do have, it looks like this, right? So we don't have any preferences of the user as to why they rated movie one a five, but we do have the rating. In other words we do have a score that they are giving us, right? And so they have a score for other movies as well. And so what we could start to assume, very similar to that first example, is that users will start to score things that they like very similar to other users who like to score things that they really like, right? So user one, well, scored a lot of things very similar to, well, user eight, but user eight also seems to like a lot of movies maybe also to user seven and maybe also to user 15, right? So we can also sort of assume or make the assertion that user one, seven, eight, you know, 15 or whatever, however many other users, they all sort of like similar movies. And so if we take enough math and well, uh, you know, machine learning, what we'll end up doing is we'll be able to, instead of knowing what their preferences are, knowing what the attributes are, will kind of reverse engineer those things. So in other words, if I did know what those preferences are for the user and I did know what the attributes are for the movie, I could say, hey, movie one and user one, if we do this math here, we'll say that they'll give a score of five, right? But if I reverse engineer that, 
I then turn these scores and attributes, these preferences and attributes into actual variables. And so what machine learning will do is it will take all of these features or preferences and assign some sort of number to it. Over time, it's gonna do enough reverse engineering, enough mathematical calculations to come up with what these ratings are. And so when I say over time, it's just gonna be doing a bunch of matrix multiplication to find what this score is to then start assigning values for these various variables. Now these various variables are called latent features. Latent as in we're, they're hidden, we don't know what they are, but we do know what their final score is. We do know what these values are. And so the machine learning model will try to make predictions based off of the other values. And once it does that with enough users, then we can start to make better predictions based off of, essentially based off of this, but instead of passing in their preferences and their scores, we'll pass in the user ID and the movie ID, and then it will make a prediction. In other words, if I rated a bunch of movies here, so this is user one, and we've got user seven, they have a bunch of similar ratings, maybe not perfect, but we could say that, you know, movie 260, user one hasn't seen yet, you know, perhaps they'll give it a five or a four based off of another user or a five, right? So we've got a few users that rated it five that have similar ratings otherwise. And we could get to a point where our machine learning algorithm is going to guess it's going to be between four or five based off of what we've got here. Now, of course, we don't have all of the users in here, nor do we have all the movies. So it's certainly possible with more data that this you know, recommendation or this rating will end up being like a three or a two. But based off of what we see here, I think there's a really good likelihood that it's going to be a five. Now, this is not true for all of the movies and it's not true for all of the spaces all of the time because we do have some gaps in here. But the machine learning model, the machine learning algorithms that we'll end up using will start to try and make sense of all of these features. Now, what we have here is the assumption that there are five features but there could be a hundred, there could be a thousand features. And so what our job would be to do is to play around with the number of features that these hidden or latent features, we're going to play around with what those are and try to make sense of it with the machine learning algorithm to get the best predictions across the most amount of users. So that's where we leave it. And this is what collaborative filtering is all about. The important things to note here are we don't have any of the user's preferences other than their rating. We don't have any of the movie's preferences or features other than what users have rated it, right? That's all we have. And so when I talked earlier about the cold start problem, this is part of the reason cold start problems exist is because when we first start out, we don't have any data. So we need to gather that data as soon as possible. So the chances that you recommend movies with a collaborative filtering model early on is probably on the lower side. In fact, what you would probably do early on is do something like we did up here, right? Even if you had 50,000 movies or let's say 3,000 ratings here for these various movies, what you could end up doing then is just recommending movies that have the highest average score and that would definitely lower this down or at least give us a, a ranking as to how we could recommend movies as well. So basically, we start with what we started with here on our projects. Over time, we start to gather enough data that that's going to be this model right here. Once we have enough data, we can start doing a collaborative filtering model. So it sort of solves the cold start problem. Not completely, but it still is at least somewhere where we, where we can go uh, with this collaborative filtering model. Now, of course, the imp other important part of this is these are ratings, but they could be page views. They could be add to carts, right? I think page views is actually one that you could start off with pretty quickly because then you could just advertise all the different products and see which ones get the actual most page views. It has nothing to do with conversions, just the number of clicks that are on there. You can do recommendations based off of that as well in a very similar format as to what we did. Uh, it, page views is actually a lot easier than handling ratings. It's just when somebody goes to a view of any kind, a Django view, we can just increment our you know database table for that particular view, um, you know based off the object ID and all that stuff. So that's actually pretty cool. I do challenge you to do that if if uh, 
that is interesting to you. Uh, but now that we hopefully have a better conceptual model of collaborative filtering, I think it starts to make a lot more sense once we actually start using it, right? Like once we actually make a data set and train a model. So let's go ahead and do that now. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and look at example collaborative filtering with Surprise ML. Granted, I already have a bunch of code that's in here, but we'll talk about what's going on. And Surprise's documentation is great. So there's already a lot of stuff going on there that you can actually just copy and paste as well. Now, Surprise itself is built off of Scikit-Learn, which is a machine learning package that's been around for a long time. Surprise is a lot newer than that, so I would imagine some things will change over time. So if anything does change, please let us know so we can update the notebook itself. But first and foremost, we install Scikit Surprise, and we're gonna be using version 1.1.0 so we can pickle it later, so I can actually export the trained model that I wanna work off of. This is just an example, so if you wanna skip the example and you wanna just go into the implementation, by all means, you can do that very soon. But the idea here is we wanna take a look at what's going on with all of this data. So first we do these imports. We are also gonna reference our data directory. Uh, and the reason I'm doing it this way is because it's just a little bit easier in terms of not using Django uh, because we just want the data, right? And so we get the data here and then we load it into a data frame and we drop empty ratings. So if there are any empty ratings whatsoever, we're gonna go ahead and get rid of them. Next, we're gonna go ahead and get our min and max ratings, right? So the minimum rating is 0.5, the maximum is five. We need that to set up surprise. So the first thing is we add in a rating scale. This is actually really nice because this means that I can actually have a rating scale of one to 10, maybe one to 100, maybe zero or one. It doesn't actually matter what our rating scale ends up being, just that we do declare it here. Next, we load in our data frame. That's why I even use pandas in the first place with these default column names. Now, if your column names are different, be sure to just change them to this. Um, I believe that's gonna be what the default will end up being. I think the important one really is the rating itself, not necessarily the other two column names, uh, but I do recommend going up based off of what we have here and changing other column names if you don't have them already. Okay, so we'll go ahead and do that, implement that. Now we actually have a data set. So this data set has training data, it also has test data. And we'll see that in just a little bit. So the next thing is we are gonna declare the algorithm we're using. In this case, it's FSVD. This is a type of algorithm, a type of machine learning algorithm that you can use for collaborative filtering. There's a lot of details and data that go into that. But the general idea here is somebody else did all those details and data for us, which is fantastic. So that means that I don't have to spend a lot of time learning all the math to build up this model. Now we'll actually build up a model very soon using Keras, but the idea here is we can actually just use this algorithm right here and run it as we see fit. So this next method is called cross validate. What this is gonna do is it's going to compare our algorithm with our data across the root mean squared error loss function and the mean absolute error loss function. So in other words, it's looking for the most optimal way to run our predictions. Um, and we'll see what that looks like in just a moment. So we'll go ahead and run that cell. Um, and so I'll let this run. It's gonna be the actual uh, cross-validation epochs is gonna be four. Each epoch for each validation is 20 um, for the algorithm itself. So in other words, it does two of the root mean square error uh, or RMSE and then two of the MAE in 20 epochs each is kind of the point of that. And then it gives us the results from it here. And so here's our results. We've got a, you know, a number of different results that are maybe hard to diagnose. So we'll look at the accuracy in just a moment after we do the training of it. So this is the actual training. First, it was just doing validation. This is now training the actual model. So, you know, perhaps in the future, we won't necessarily have to do the training itself. Uh, but it is nice that, or the cross-validating itself, it is nice that we do have this so that it can give us some sort of method to choose based on whether or not we wanna use the root mean squared error loss function or the mean absolute error loss function, uh, both of which can be good. So anyway, so we did our training finally, and now we're gonna take a look at our accuracy here. So that's what's going on here. We're gonna go ahead and grab our test set, 
we're actually gonna grab some predictions from that test set, and then we'll go ahead and take a look at the accuracy of it with the root mean squared error. This accuracy is about 64%, which is okay. Um, not too bad. I mean, it's almost better than guessing. <laughs> it's probably better than guessing. And then the mean absolute error has, you know, 50% accuracy. So it's not nearly as good. Um, so we'll go ahead and stick with the root mean squared error. And then I'm gonna go ahead and grab some sample data in here. This gives me some sample data and I can actually get the estimated rating based off of that user ID and movie. And we could do this multiple times. So now we have a tool that we could use on all of our users, on all of our movie IDs for some sort of prediction. And what if we used a user ID that probably doesn't exist in our data set? So I'll do like user ID of 10 million. And I'm pretty sure that user does not exist, uh, but it is still giving us a rating based off of what all other users have rated this, which it's not a super high rating, uh, but that rating will obviously improve as we use actual user IDs over time within the trading and whatnot. Um, and so of course, it's also missing uh, any sort of ratings that this user may have done in the prediction, which is what we you know, are just gonna have to leave out. We're basically just going off of the user and the movie ID prediction, which I think is actually really exciting, just how simple all of this in, ended up being um, just for this example. So implementing it is not a whole lot different, but it's then just using our actual data. But of course, we're gonna use this notebook to then start to build a celery task for both training and predicting our data. And the training part will then end up using Pickle to export it. And so now we'll just look at how to export this using Pickle. So we'll go ahead and do import Pickle. And to export data with Pickle, it's actually pretty straightforward, but you just need to make sure that what you're exporting is exportable. In our case, the algorithm is exportable. So I'll go ahead and just give my data, or let's go ahead and call this algo data. And this is gonna be my model, and it's gonna be to my algo. So I'll go ahead and do with open, and this is gonna be model.pkl. We're gonna go ahead and write bytes, so wb as f, and then we use pickle, so pickle.dump that data, that algo data here. And it could just be the algorithm. We don't necessarily have to put it into a dictionary like this. I just like to put it into the dictionary. So it's, well, it's easier to, to load later and also put other data in it if we want to. So I'll go ahead and dump this data into that file and we'll run that. Now I'll go ahead and open this. So I'll go ahead and say model algo is equal to none. Then I'll go ahead and do with open again with model.pkl. And then we'll read bytes this time as F. Then we'll go ahead and say model data loaded equals to, well, this is gonna be pickle.load of F again. So now we'll do the model algo equals to the model data loaded dot get of that model. So the data loaded is gonna be related to the algo data. Run that. And now I can do the prediction again. So UID equals to user ID and the item ID or IID equals to movie ID. And we run that and there we go. We got our prediction and I can do dot EST at the end of it. And it gives us the same prediction as before. And of course, if I run it again, I could do that. So of course, this opening part right here, as well as the prediction, that alone gives me the actual data that I'll end up wanting to use for inference. So I can, I can absolutely have a lot more items in here. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. If I put in a sample row of up to 10 and then put this to dict of the records, then I could go ahead and do four row in sample. Let's actually call this sample rows. And then our user ID is gonna be row.get user ID or just, well, we could probably just do row and user ID like that and row like that. All right, and then we can run our loaded model prediction based off of those things. And I'll go ahead and just call this my pred. And then we'll go ahead and print out e one. And we run that and now I got a bunch of different predictions and it's incredibly fast. 
That's really cool. So that's using surprise. Now, of course, we need to implement this into our entire system. So let's go ahead and start working on that. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and create all of the utility methods we need to train our model. That's to export our data, to transform it if we need to, and then actually run our various trainings. So to do this, I'm gonna create a new module and we'll do Python and manage.py start app and we'll call it ML, a new module and Django application. So inside of ML, I'm gonna go ahead and say utils.py. And I wanted to define a few functions that we'll definitely need. Number one is going to be export our data set, right? So to load in our data set, basically. Then we're gonna go ahead and train our data set. And then we want to, well, actually, instead of train data set, we'd probably say train our model. And then we would want to save our model or export our model, which we'll call that. And then if we had all of the necessary features that we wanted in this utility, it would be load our model. Okay, cool. So this is absolutely what we need to build towards. Now, what data set are we ex actually exporting here? I'm gonna actually call this my export ratings data set. Now, let's go ahead and actually just create that. And I'll do from ratings.models, we're gonna import the rating model. And then I'll also go ahead and do from django.db.models, we're gonna import F. And the reason for this is so that we can do QS equals to rating.objects.filter, active being true. Now that of course is not the only thing that we want. We want a specific kind of rating because it is again, a generic foreign key here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm also gonna bring in the content type. So we'll do from types dot models import content type and then like usual we can do c type equals to that content type dot objects then we'll go ahead and do dot get app label being to movies and the model being to in this case lowercase movie so then i can actually filter them down by active and this content type and then what i can do is annotate all of this data so qs equals to qs dot annotate and really just adding or changing what is coming back as far as the column names are concerned. So F of user ID, of course, changes that. And we've seen this hopefully several times now. So I'll go ahead and update it really quickly. So movie ID, and then finally rating. Rating, of course, is value, and movie ID is object ID. Okay, so now that we've got these annotations here, of course, the final thing would be then to return QS.values of those. So that's gonna be user ID and then movie ID and then rating. So this right here is gonna be a list of dictionary values, right? So that's what we'll see. Those dictionary values can be used in other places. So the first thing is with this train model, I'll go ahead and say dataset equals to this export ratings dataset. Now this works fine in terms of some types of model training, but we're gonna be training a surprise model, right? That's the point here. So we need to make sure that we are training it correctly. Now, if we go back into our notebook for it and scroll down to when we did train it, first off, we've got this data frame here, and then we've got a reader and data. So it has a different kind of data loader specifically in surprise. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and say get data loader. And this is going to take in our data set. Now in here, I'll go ahead and do from uh, pan or we'll import pandas as PD. And then I'll give my data frame, I'll pass it in here. And I'll explain this why I'm doing it this way. Because if our Django project, our actual web application, does not have pandas, there's a really good chance that it's not gonna be running the training itself. So having the import happen inside of the function itself can help mitigate errors when it comes to having this actually run. Um, so we'll just keep that just like that. Next up with this actual data itself, we could verify the specific columns that we might want. I already know what those columns are because of this data right here. So it's absolutely coming from 
this exports rating data set. So all I'm really gonna do is drop in a inside of ratings and I'll say in place being true. Then I'm gonna go ahead and get the max rating and min rating for these. And that of course is df.rating.max and then df.rating.min. Cool. So dot rating, or you could use these brackets too. You can use either method if you weren't aware. So with that, now I can actually bring in the reader. So let's go ahead and grab our surprise model here. So from surprise, and we're gonna import accuracy and reader data set and SVD. And then uh, I'll also import cross validation. So from surprise dot model selection, we'll import cross validation. Great. So the first thing is we are gonna come down here and initialize our reader. And this is gonna give us a rating scale related to, well, the minimum rating and the maximum rating, just like that, okay? And then I can return back my actual data loader, which would be the data set, and then it's load from DF of the data frame, and we'll go ahead and pass in the reader itself. Now I will actually declare the columns that we want to bring in. I'll just go ahead and do it user ID and movie ID and then rating. And we'll just pass it in down here like that. Okay, so now we've got this data loader. So this is gonna be, let's call it loaded data. And we'll go ahead and do the get data loader of that data set. Great. So we're a lot closer. Let's go back into our model here. We're now ready for the cross-validation method um, and also initializing the model, both of which we can do inside of the train model. And right off the bat, I see the number of epochs here. This is gonna be an argument that I want. I see verbose being here. This is also an argument that I want. So let's go ahead and add these in, number of epochs. And I'm just gonna change verbose to being verbose here, so towards the end. Okay, and instead of calling it algo, I'll call it model. The data is gonna be our loaded data now. And we'll keep with the root mean squared error and the mean absolute error as our cross validation. And this should be cross validate, not cross validation. We got a little import error there. And we can do CV results equals to that. Now, this is something that would be used to improve our training process. This is something that you might not need to do in the automated section. You definitely can. There's definitely ways to improve our predictions, but just keep that in mind that you might also want to just skip this altogether when you're actually implementing the automated training. It's when you're doing the manual training that you'll want to play around with this to see which one's a little bit more accurate, but I think root mean squared error or RMSE is gonna be your go-to going forward for a lot of different types of machine learning. Um, another thing is these results, maybe we'd want to save, and I'm going to call these CV results. We maybe want to save them somewhere, uh, something I'm not going to cover right now. But anyway, so we now have a couple steps of our model training. Okay, and so SVD is in there, great. And then we're going to go ahead and go to the next step. After all that training, then it's about actually, or rather after the cross validation, then we actually do the training itself, which is what we see here. So again, the data is simply the loaded data. That is now our training set. Um, this is often referred to as the X train, but the reason that it's not called X train on surprise is because we actually get the test set from this training set as well. So I'll go ahead and keep model as the name. So model.fit of that train set. And if I scroll down a bit, I then get my accuracy stuff along with a name. So let's go ahead and paste those in. And here we go. Okay, so this stuff right here, I actually think I wanna save it as a different function. So we'll go ahead and say define get model accuracy essentially. And it's gonna take in the train set and the model. 
and then it's going to return back our accuracy, which we have right here. So I'll go ahead and cut these out, paste it in here, and we'll return back accuracy. And I'm also going to go ahead and say use RMSE being true. And then I'll say if not use RMSE, then I'll just go ahead and use MAE or the mean absolute error. Okay, cool. Um, so there we go. Now we've got all of this stuff of the model accuracy. So if I scroll down a bit and say the accuracy is equal to get model accuracy of those arguments, which was the train set and the model, and also use RMSE. And again, this flag could be changed based off of those CV results. And there we go. And so now the model name, we can leave it in as accuracy with the float in here. But the problem is this is gonna save model dash something like 0 0.63 or something like that, as far as the percentage is concerned. So I want it to be a little bit higher than that. So I'll do accuracy label being a hundred times the accuracy, and then I'll just have it go to the nearest integer with int. So now that my label is coming in like that. There we go, cool. So let's go ahead and come back down. And we have, we have pretty much everything that we need. Of course, I still need the prediction function itself, but maybe not even, I probably don't even need to do that. Uh, but I do need to actually save the model somewhere. And we did talk about it with these pickles here. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy this. And now we've got this export model function here. So let's go ahead and import pickle. Okay, and I'm also gonna go ahead and import temp file. So import temp file. And if I scroll down a bit, I realize that yes, I can absolutely, this is not export, but this is read bytes. So I have the wrong one. Let me just go up one here and replace it. There we go. And so this is gonna be our model. And here we go. So now, the thing that I don't wanna do is I don't wanna actually save my model in my Django code, right? I wanna save it where it makes sense to save it. And we already have seen this with our exports here. So the exports actually export this data set somewhere. Now we could actually use this export function as well if we were so interested. I would actually recommend that you create your own model for it, but it's not something I'm gonna do. Instead, I wanna show you another method that you can use as well, especially for exporting data that doesn't necessarily rely on a, you know, a database entry at all. And that's what we're gonna do. So to do this, I'm gonna first off inside of exports, I'm gonna go ahead and create a method called storages.py or a module called storages.py. This one is incredibly simple. I'm gonna copy and paste it and tell you what's going on. Okay, so first and foremost, we import the default storage for Django. The nice thing about this is we have the ability to have this be our production storage. So when you're uploading files in Django, you wanna make sure that those files go into production. These are media files, the things that you're uploading, right? And that's what we did with our exports. We had a file field and we up uploaded them somewhere. Now the somewhere it went was the default storage in Django. Now I wanna have this method so that I could change it later to anything I want. So if I ever want to tr change where I save my models or where I store them, this is what we'll end up doing is, is just updating this storage function here. So with that in mind, I'm gonna go ahead and bring it in and we'll just go ahead and do from exports. We're gonna import storages as export or exports storages. And then I'll go ahead and come down here and we want to save this model somewhere. Okay, so but there's a problem here. And the problem is that we are not saving it in a temporary location. Instead, what we're do, doing is we're saving it inside or next to the code. What I wanna do is save it on a temporary location somewhere on my system. And that's why I brought in temp file. Okay, so what we're gonna do here now is we're gonna come in with this export model here and I'm gonna go ahead and write with temp file dot named temporary file, give it a mode and this is gonna be RB plus 
and we'll call it as temp file or temp f. Now I'm gonna go ahead and tab this over. I no longer need to open that, but instead I'm just gonna use pickle dump of that data. So I can actually go ahead and grab it like here and then grab that temp file just like that. So now pickle will dump this file into a temporary file. Okay, that's great. Next, what I need to do is actually save it to a specific location. So the location I wanna save it to is gonna be completely up to me on how I think about going with this one. So the first one is I'm actually gonna pass in model name and I'll just call it model. Then I'm gonna go ahead and add in the model type, which in my case, I'll leave it in as surprise. And then I'll do a model extension and this is gonna be PKL and then verbose being true. Okay. So why do I have all of those? Well, that's because I want my path to be based off of all of those. So it's gonna be ML slash models slash model underscore type, as in whatever's being passed through right here, slash model name dot model extension. So I'm sort of forward thinking with this path. Okay, that's kind of the point is we wanna think through when I use future models or different kinds of machine learning models that may or may not use pickle. So that's why I'm actually thinking through this path itself. And so we could also have a flag for whether or not we wanna save pickle or save it in this way. We'll, we'll worry about that in the future anyway, but I just wanted to start thinking through it in terms of how I end up saving my model path anyway. So with this in mind, if we go back into storages, we've got our file path, our file object, and then whether or not we wanna overwrite that thing. So here's our file path. Now, what is our file object? Now, this is not exactly straightforward, right? Because is it the pickle itself or is it the temporary file? Now, it's actually going to be the temporary file, but there's actually one other aspect we need to add in here, and that is, turning this into a proper file, into a Django file. Um, so that's what we're gonna do, is we're gonna come up here and we're gonna import from django.core.files.base, we're gonna import file, and then we'll come back down, change this temporary file into an actual file, just like that. And so now we should actually be able to save this data. Okay. And I don't want to override it yet because what I'm actually going to do is take this one more time and then I'll go ahead and call the model name just simply latest. And this is going to be my path underscore latest. And now I'll go ahead and save that one again with the exact same file. And then I'll go ahead and overwrite being true and we'll go ahead and save that. Fantastic. Okay, so now that we have a way to export the model, loading it isn't a whole lot different, but now what I could do is just load it based off of the latest path, right? So coming back in here, model type being surprise and the model extension being PKL. So now with this load model, now I can actually take it one step further and this is gonna need my media root here into that. And we have the media root or we can actually import the media root from django.conf, we'll import settings and then we'll come back down here and settings.media root. That's where the path should be. That's where, if it exists, that's where it should be at least. So we'll do if path.exists then we'll go ahead and load in what the model is. So first off, we'll declare it as being none, and then the model will be from pickle. So with open and path latest, and we'll go ahead and do read bytes, and then we'll do as F, and then this is going to be the model data being pickle.load path latest, and then the model are, is gonna be equal to model data.get of that model. 
And then we'll go ahead and return back the model itself so we can actually load it up. Okay. So again, here's that dictionary there where we're actually storing that model. And then this would be how we load it. Fantastic. Okay, so there's a, this is like fairly error prone for a number of reasons uh, because, well, we haven't actually tested it at all. So let's go ahead and test it in just a moment. So model, model name, and I'll go ahead and leave all of these things in as well. Great. And then I'll add in one more statement here and say, if verbose, then I'll just print out exporting to path and path latest. Great. So we're going to go ahead and save that. Now I'm going to go ahead and create a task for this. So inside of ML, we'll go ahead and do tasks.py. And from celery, we're going to import our shared task. And I'll define this as well, uh, train our surprise model. We'll give it a shared task. And then I'll go ahead and do from dot utils import train model. Okay, and then we'll just call train model. So utils, and I'm gonna actually add in train model surprise or train surprise model task as not test, but task. Right, and we just wanna make sure that we've got all that stuff in there. Looks like we do. Notice that I'm not actually gonna end up using the load model just yet. And it uh, looks like I wrote out surprise incorrectly in there. Okay. And let's go ahead and give it a shot. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna run into Python manage.py shell doesn't really matter if I run the shared task or not as is. I just want to see if it even works. So from ml.tasks, we're going to import uh, not our shared task, but rather our trained model. So from ml.tasks, import that. And we could not import our trained model here. Let's see why. Uh, train surprise model. So I'm actually going to go ahead and change this to being ML utils as ML utils. And then we get better code completion here. So ML utils dot, and this is going to be train our surprise model. There we go. Much better code completion. So let's exit out and try that again. Press up. And let's go ahead and give this a shot. Let it run. It's already, it's doing cross-validation now. That's what it should be doing. Then after it does the cross-validation, it'll do the training. All of these things won't take that long in terms of the actual training process. Uh, what I'm also looking for though, is gonna be once it's finished training in my load local CDN here under the media folder, I'm of course looking for an ML folder as well. And there it is with latest and the next model too. So of course, if I run this again now, um, what's gonna happen is the next model that has a 64% is not gonna overwrite this one, but rather it's gonna go ahead and create a, another one, which is great. That's exactly what I wanted. I want this to be able to train on a regular basis without over overriding the same percentage or close to the same percentage on here as we see here. This one had better accuracy actually, so it didn't need to override it at all. So a couple thoughts here as far as the export itself. Perhaps we create a whole model in of itself too, to track these things, to track some of the metrics. That would actually be a really good idea to do. Uh, it's just adding a lot of complexity, things that you already know what to do, I think, because your export model then, um, instead of doing all this stuff in here, you could actually just save the model to a file, much like we, we did when we exported the data set. We could save the, the stuff to a file, and then in that model, in the save method, it could actually save the files uh, and export it to uh, the, the storage files, the same exact thing in overriding the save method too. Uh, so that's not something I'm gonna implement right now. 
Uh, but now we have a way to train this stuff. So the next thing, of course, is just to take these training things and then load in a model and actually provide recommendations. Pretty neat. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and do a batch inference test or really a batch model prediction. So this, of course, is gonna be in Celery as well. So I'll go ahead and do at shared task and we're gonna define, well, we'll call this batch uh, user predictions task. Okay, and I actually don't need it to re return anything, but I do need to grab the model, which is in MLUtils, and we'll go ahead and do load model. And then I'll just go ahead and grab some arbitrary prediction. So I'll do model.predict, and we'll go ahead and do UID being some ran random user number, and then the IID, as in the item ID, which was our movies. I'll give a random one for that, and then do dot EST. I'll also make sure if model is not none, then I'll go ahead and run that prediction, and we'll go ahead and print out whatever that prediction ends up being. Okay, so let's go ahead and save that, and we'll jump into our shell now. And then I'll just go ahead and do from ml.tasks, we're gonna import all, and I'll go ahead and run that, okay? And so I get an error here based off of the utility method here. So let's go ahead and open that up. If I scroll down a bit, I see my load model here. I actually see what the error is. When I go to open it, I open it as file, but then I try to load the actual file path itself. So let's make sure I'm using F there. Uh, some people have actually put the open inside of here but this is actually more efficient because once it's all done, it closes that file for us. We don't have to worry about it. Uh, but then I'll return back the model. So that, that should actually solve that problem. So let's go ahead and exit out and give it another shot. And oops, I need to import it and run it. And there we go. So now we've got a prediction and it's very consistent for that particular batch user prediction model task. So now what we need to do is, well, get actual users. So what I wanna have here is, let's say get, let's do recent user IDs. And well, what are they, right? That's gonna be, of course, some sort of list. And then I'll have to get movie IDs. And again, what are they? And the question, of course, is do we do all of the movies? Do we do some of them? Those things are things that you'll have to figure out as far as how time goes and also maybe how big the user IDs are. Um, so there's a lot of things to consider here that we are just not gonna spend time trying to consider. Instead, what I'm gonna do is grab all my recent user IDs and we'll do it based off of some sor sort of time. So inside of profiles here, I wanna create a new utility method. So we'll go do utils.py and we're gonna define get recent users. And I'll go ahead and say days ago, and we'll start it out at just seven. So what do I mean by days ago? Well, it's gonna be user.objects.filter and something with that days ago, okay? So that's of course what I mean. And the first thing I need to do with that is from django.contrib.auth, we're gonna import the get user model and user equals to that get user model, okay? And since we see that we've got days ago there, that should hopefully mean that we know that we need to import date time. And we also need to import from django.utils. We're gonna import the actual um, time zone method as well. And I also wanna return IDs only in this case. Okay, so I might not always use IDs only, but in this case I will. Now, notice that this is just a function that I'm putting in utilities. Realistically, I would probably add a proxy model to the user and then have, you know, get recent users here as a function that does basically this same thing. Um, but I'm not building that proxy model right now. I just wanna keep things as simple as possible and create the user feature here. Okay, so in our query set, what I can do is I can actually filter this down by, let's say date joined. And with that date joined, if it's seven days ago, Let's go ahead and do our delta being date time dot time delta. And there's gonna be days equals two days ago. And so um, the delta is always gonna be in the past. We'll just always consider it negative. So now is time zone 
dot now, and then our actual time delta is going to be the now minus this delta. And so now what I want is date joined is greater than or equal to that time delta. Now there is another field that we, we might want to have, and that is from Django uh, DB models. We're going to import Q. And so I'm actually going to go ahead and use a Q lookup so I can do two different filters in here. And this is going to be the last log last logged in. I believe that's how it goes. And that's going to be greater than or equal to that time delta as well. And there we go. And then we'll go ahead and do the final thing is if IDs only, then we'll return QS.values list ID and flat being true. Otherwise, we're going to return back that query set. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and separate these things out so it's a little easier to see what's going on with this Q lookup. Okay, so I think those fields might be the incorrect names, but we'll go ahead and give it a shot. And let's go ahead and import it from profiles.utils. We're going to import all, and then I'll go ahead and get recent users. And yeah, last login is incorrect. So whenever I forget the field name, I do exactly what I just did. I just write some field name and then I see the correct keyword value for it, which is in this case, last login or last login. And this is greater than or equal to. So we'll go ahead and exit out of our shell there and I'll run it again. There are my recent users, not very many, right? Um, and so those are the ones I'm actually gonna run based off of all of my, like that's the prediction inference that I'll end up doing. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and bring this in. So back into my tasks here, we'll go and do from profile import utils as profile utils. And we'll get our recent user IDs being profile utils dot get recent users. And it looks like we have an issue here from profiles dot profile. There we go. And there's our recent user IDs. So now what do we need to do? Well, we're gonna to have to go through each movie. Now this again could be recent movies. We could do something very similar to our Gint recent users, or we could quite literally do all of them. So I'll go ahead and just do all of them for now. So we'll do from movies and uh, models. We're gonna import the movie model itself. And our movie IDs are gonna be Movie the objects to all and dot values list. And this is going to be movie ID or more specifically our ID because we did clean those things up. So the actual trained model itself is coming off of our data database in this same way based off of those IDs. We can verify that by going back into our export ratings data set. And we've got our movie ID is based off of that object ID, which should also be based off of what we fixed with all those movie IDs. Okay, so now we go for movie IDs in, or rather movie ID in movie IDs, and then for user in recent user IDs, and then our predictions. Let's tab this over, and you, and movie ID, and then we'll go ahead and do you, movie ID, and pred. Okay, so we're gonna save that, exit out of this shell, and we'll go ahead and import it again. I'll just press up several times, run that, and it's gonna take a while, because there's a lot of movies, and there's gonna be a lot of predictions. So this is where, of course, oh, well, maybe we shouldn't predict all of them, but then again, maybe we should. And we could actually do it I did it by movie ID, but maybe we want to do it by user, like as in, I'm going to go off of the users first, so I get a bunch of their recent ones. And maybe I also re-rate these by popularity. So let's go and take a look at that. And let's see what I mean by by popularity. So back into our movies. And what do you know? We have our popular item here. And so this actually would be 
a little bit better as far as the movies are concerned. So we'll do dot popular and then maybe up to the top 250 most popular. Because again, we're just trying to give some recommendations to this user. Does this user have 250 items in there? Well, that sort of makes sense that, that 250 recommendations is probably plenty. Of course, the only downside to this is if all of these movies are actually done, like if I have already given predictions for all of these movies and maybe this user has already rated all of them, maybe this is now a downside for this. So perhaps this is more of like uh, updated predictions in these more recent movies. So there's a lot of things that we could do to play around with improving what we end up giving them predictions on right on a regular basis, right? And perhaps we also batch them into different, different movies altogether. Um, so there's a lot of different things, a lot of different things that we could do. Uh, but let's go ahead and run that task again and see how much faster it is with just 250 movies. It's really, really fast. So perhaps the batching then would be um, we have some sort of pagination in the movies themselves. So we'll go ahead and do start page being zero and then uh, offset being 250. So the part here would be start page and then the offset, which is really the start page plus the offset. Okay. So then we could actually come back and say, um, I don't know, max pages being, let's say a thousand. And we'll go ahead and do the off start page offset. So that, let's just call that something different in here. We'll leave that max pages. We'll go ahead and do end page is start page plus offset. Okay. And so I come back in here. There we go. So now it's going to give me still sorted by popular, uh, but it will start and end. Okay. And then we'll basically say if end page is less than max pages, then we'll just return it back and run it again. But now the end page is the start page. We'll go ahead and just do end page minus one and we can leave that same offset. Okay. And so this now, of course, will give me a little bit more of predictions and it'll just keep going based off of what that max page would end up being. So let's go ahead and bring it in. So now it's roughly the same thing. Uh, it's just giving me a little bit different look at all of these different movies. And I actually would rather go based off of the movie iteration uh, and then the recent user IDs versus the other way around so that I'm actually predicting on the movie for a bunch of different users and then moving to the next movie, a bunch of different users. Um, and that's just for this one. This is a batch one that I would do on a regular basis. Quite a bit different than if we're like, hey, update batch update. Let's do, let's go and do batch update user predictions task. This max and uh, this pagination stuff we could still keep. This time though, my user ID is going to be equal to some number, right? So user ID. And so now the recent user IDs is no longer a recent user ID. It's rather just one user ID. And so of course, if you're seeing this, you're like, oh, well now I can actually pass both of these things in and they could be one single function. Um, we could totally do that. But what I actually want to do is maybe the less popular choices. So a different query set in here altogether. And so order by reverse of popular. And so reverse being true. And then, then this one will hopefully get all of the user pages. In this case, I'll go ahead and do like 100,000 as max pages. And that will definitely be quite a bit more. Let's go ahead and exit out. And we'll run it again. And the user ID being, I don't know, 32. And we run that. And this will take quite some time. Now, 32, it's giving the same rating all across the board. So it's a really good chance that this user has no ratings or maybe just doesn't exist at all. So let's go ahead and cancel that one out and maybe change it back to user one. Also giving all of the same ratings for all of the movies. Uh, not a great start for that 
once we got towards the end, though, it started actually giving us proper predictions. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that. A big part of the reason that all these old ones didn't have very good predictions has everything to do with the fact that they don't have very many predictions in general. Uh, so yet another reason to not necessarily do this in reverse, but it is something definitely worth taking a look at. Uh, so that's actually doing our batch predictions. Now, of course, when we do have batch predictions, it's probably a good idea to actually store these somewhere so we can actually give predictions to any given user. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and store our machine learning predictions into a new model. So let's go ahead and create that one with a suggestion model. So Python manage.py start app and suggestions. So this is gonna be almost identical to ratings. So inside of ratings, I'll actually copy uh, basically everything. So let's go ahead and grab ratings models, copy the whole thing and paste it in here. And then with that in mind, let's go ahead and do a quick search with command F or control F, look for rating and replace it with suggestion. Make sure you're getting the capitalized there. And you could go through each one uh, as far as what we're replacing here. And I'll just go ahead and replace everything in there and save it. Okay, so there's a lot of things that we can do here. I'm gonna get rid of some stuff that we just don't need. The rating suggestion choice, I don't need. I don't need the manager. There's a lot of things that we can just you know, get rid of altogether. The value itself, well, this is gonna be fairly arbitrary. So I'm gonna leave it as blank and I'm actually gonna change it to being a float field. And I use float here, of course, because the prediction has a percent in terms of a float, as in less than one, but greater than zero. So that's what we'll leave in as the value. But everything else is roughly the same. Something I don't need is active and active update, right? So I really don't need those at all. But I might wanna keep track of the suggestion in relation to the rating. So if it did get rated, maybe I just can update my suggestions accordingly. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm gonna get rid of this post save in here as well. We don't need that. And I will go ahead and add in a few new fields here. And this is for when ratings occur after a suggestion. And so we'll go ahead and say did rate equals to models dot boolean field the default being false, and then did rate timestamp. Um, it's very similar to what we had before. So models.date time field and auto now add being false and auto now being false and then blank being true and null being true. Okay, and then I also might want the rating value in here as well. It's not necessary completely, but maybe the rating value when these things occur, right? And so it's literally only when ratings happen. We totally could update the model itself after the suggestion is added, like we could clean it up, assuming that ratings have already happened in the past for any given suggestion, but I'm gonna leave that out. I, I'll explain why when we get there, but the idea being, just generally speaking, that we just wanna store all the suggestions, whatever they might be, and then we can worry about the query set or what we present to the user later. So this is what I'm gonna leave it as. And the only reason that this exists is so that we can have a signal to just update these things in the future when we actually create some ratings. So what that means is back into the model for ratings, we'll go ahead and bring in the suggestion itself. So the suggestion model is gonna be suggestion equals to apps.get model and this is of course is suggestions and suggestion okay and so what we want to do is we want to find essentially the same query set here uh, with one big exception so i'll go ahead and copy this query set paste it down here and this time it's going to be suggestion query set and of course we're doing rating.objects.filter all of these things and then the big one is did rate being false, because that was our default. And I can get rid of the exclude here. And we'll basically say if suggestion QS that exists, any of them, that is if we did it many, many times, we wanna check this, which is also telling. So if we've added these suggestions a lot, and then one day we finally rated it, it's also telling, it's another data point to say like, oh, we suggested this movie a lot, and then finally the user rated it. So maybe that's an event that's worth keeping track of. So with this in mind, I'll go ahead and do suggestion QS update. 
and we'll go ahead and pass in did rate being true, did rate timestamp being time zone dot now, and then rating value is gonna be just the instance value. Great. So let's go ahead and save that and save our suggestions. Let's add it into our installed apps as well. CFE Home, Settings, and inside of Installed Apps, Suggestions, right underneath Ratings. Okay, and we'll go ahead and run Python manage.py, make migrations, and then Python manage.py, migrate. Very good. And this works exactly like the rating model now. So what we wanna do, of course, is use it in our predictions. Before I do, I'm gonna get rid of some of the imports that we just don't need in here. Or we'll like so. Okay, so now back into ML, into our tasks here. What I wanna do is, well, first off, these two tasks are basically the same. The biggest difference is the user ID is being passed. And so if I say user IDs is none, uh, then I can just do something like this instead of what I had before, which really means that now that I've got that down here, I can just pass in basically all of the same parameters with a specific user in mind. So user IDs being equal to that, let's just verify, oh, it's users IDs, so let's do that. Now it's coming in as a list, and then I can pass in all of these arguments in here as well. And now it's the same data, or roughly the same data. And I'll just pass in those arguments that are coming through there. Great. So this is gonna be update single user predictions. That probably makes a little bit more sense than what I had. And then this is batch users predictions task. Perfect. Okay, so now that we've got this, let's go ahead and make sure I update all of the places that I use that on. Um, but now that we've got this, we have a new place or one single place that I can actually add in suggestions. So I'll go ahead and create a bulk create, like what might be expected. So this is gonna be our suggestion and whatever data that we want to come in here. So what is the data that we're gonna be passing in? Well. We have a user ID, that's what this is for. We can say user ID is equal to you. We've got an object ID, which of course is the movie ID. We have a value, which of course is the prediction. And there we go. The one thing that we don't have is the content type, or well, in this case, the suggestion model coming in either. So go ahead and bring in from Django.apps, we're gonna import apps, and then we'll do from Django.contrib dot content types dot models. We're gonna import the content type and we'll come down here, do the suggestion model first. And this of course is apps.git model and it's suggestions and suggestion. And then the content type, C type being content type dot objects dot git and the app label being movies and the model being movie. As we've seen many, many times, so we can come in here and do content type being that content type. We can pass in this data, unpack it, so it turns into keyword arguments, and then after all said and done, suggestion to objects the bulk create of those ignore conflicts being true. Fantastic. Okay, so let's go ahead and do one more thing before we test it out. And that is going into the ratings admin, copying everything, and bringing it into the suggestions admin, and cut and pasting everything, doing a quick search and replace for rating and suggestion. And there we go. If you remember, suggestion did not have active. So let's get rid of that. Uh, so we'll save that. And let's just make sure our server is still running looks like it is. And let's jump into the Python manage.py shell. And we'll go ahead and do from and ml.tasks as it's already importing for me. I could do either one of these tasks in here. Let's go ahead and run the very first one, hit enter, and I'm getting none type. Okay, so I got users 
being none. And oh, that's because of this. So if users IDs is none, little conditional error, but that's okay. Let's try that again, exit out, import again, and run again. And there we go. So I'm still printing these things out, which actually will slow down performance. It affects performance quite a bit. I don't need to print them out. Uh, but as we see, we actually just created a bunch of suggestions. So if we go into our admin, let's go take a look and scroll down to suggestions. And here's a bunch of suggestions. So if I search for a particular user and resort by the value of the suggestions, now I get a bunch of suggestions. Now I haven't seen all of these movies, but a lot of them just on first glance, I know that I really like. Godfather Pi 2, I know that I really like that. Uh, happiness, I don't know that that's the one I was thinking of, but Back to the Future, definitely like that. Empire Strikes Back, definitely like that. It's giving me pretty solid ratings. Maybe not the, maybe not the greatest ratings yet, but solid nonetheless. So the other thing is it's also just giving me ratings. It's not necessarily going and not giving me ratings that already exist. It's giving me all of the ratings. Um, and so there's gonna be many different ways on how we can handle the suggestion query set when it does come back to me. But if I go to the very end and I see, let's say, uh, I don't know, Mission Possible 2. I actually kind of like this movie. I think it was better than 2.5. I don't know, there's some cheesiness to it. Uh, but let's go ahead and take a look at that. So go into movies and take a look at the rating itself. I don't have a rating. The average rating is 3.2. This is not the average rating, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and update my rating to a five. We'll save that. And now what I'm gonna do is just run a quick bulk training. Okay, and let's actually trigger it. So this shouldn't take a whole lot of time, uh, but what I'm hoping will happen is we'll actually get an updated rating um, in a suggestion itself. It, it might happen, it might not, but we'll see. Uh, but one thing that I can do is right away in the suggestion, if I refresh in here, notice that did rate comes through and sure enough, there is the rating, the rating value and all that stuff. So that's actually working really nicely, uh, which I do really, really like. So there's a couple of considerations that we do want to think about in terms of the suggestions themselves, right? So just like our actual ratings, we actually might want to bring back whether or not it's active or a current rating, right? So if I just suggested suggested this and I've never suggested it before, perhaps I need a flag for that. That might be a good idea to do. It's something I'm actually gonna avoid because the things that we will rate are gonna be based off of the timestamp. So order them somewhat recently. Um, and then also we will go ahead and, well, eliminate movies that we've already rated itself. So even if we get duplicate suggestions for any particular user, I actually think that's okay, especially in terms of movies. But as soon as they rate it, those suggestions we will be able to remove. Okay, so now I trained a new model. Let's go ahead and try and run the user's prediction task again. I believe all the same movies will come through. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at these suggestions again. Get CFE in here and I'll go ahead and have to find the one movie, Mission Impossible 2, which might be like finding a needle in a haystack in terms of how this is done. Um, so that might actually prove to be a little challenging with how the current query set uh, is coming through and I'm, I'm definitely not seeing it. Uh, but the point here is that our suggestions will have changed. I have a lot more again. Um, and yeah, so we will probably want to do something about cleaning up our suggestions over time because we'll start to get way too many if we keep on suggesting everything. And so the, pro the problem and solution could be just removing all of the current suggestions when we start to create new ones for any given user or just having some sort of cleanup task to remove them as well um, or just update the, the validity of them or even better yet, in our tasks, what we could do then too, is we could actually grab all of the suggestions, the actual data dictionary itself, and then put a bunch of object IDs in there, and then essentially remove object IDs that have already been done for any given user. Uh, in other words, basically, you know, adding a, maybe a little bit more of an efficient call for this in terms of 
actually creating the suggestions themselves as well. Okay, so I created another training and I ran it again. And I just wanna show you that it is gonna to start to snowball as to how many suggestions are in here. So definitely gonna to have to do something about deleting old suggestions or removing them. Uh, otherwise we'll have just way too many. We're now faced with a new conundrum and that is duplicating the suggestion for any given content object, right? So any given movie, I could have a lot of suggestions for it over a short amount of time. So literally every time I run that batch, it gives me a new suggestion to all of these same users, which is good and bad, right? We might end up getting too much data. Now there's a lot of different ways on how we could think about handling this. One, we could create a task, a task, a regular task that just removes old suggestions. It goes in there, any suggestion that's a week old, boom, gone. We could delete it from the database altogether. Another one being that when a user actually looks at a suggestion, we could treat it like a notification to where it removes all of the old ones or it deactivates all the old ones and then it's maybe added to a whole new list of already suggested items, don't suggest these things. And we're actually gonna sort of combine those a little bit in the sense that what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna make a new sort of data set that comes in here that allows for me to look up something based off of the movie and the user ID in the iteration, hopefully pretty efficiently. So to do this efficiently, we need to create a model manager for the suggestion. So we'll do class suggestion manager, and this is models.manager. And we're gonna return back a data dictionary from some sort of method. So we're gonna call this get recently suggested. It's gonna take in self, and then it's gonna return a dictionary here. So the idea behind this is to add as keys all of the movies. So we'll go ahead and do a movie ID. And in there, it would be user A, you know, user B, and so on, based off of some time duration. So how do we actually create this? Well, first and foremost, I'm going to have to grab my movie IDs that I want. I'm gonna have to grab my user IDs that I want, and then maybe a time duration, so days ago, and I'll go ahead and say seven, okay? So all I'm looking for here are things that have already been done, not ones that haven't been done, but ones that have already been done. So already suggested, great. So what's the query set here? Well, first off, it's self.filter, or rather self.get query set, and then .filter, and we are gonna go ahead and do content type. And we're gonna to have to grab that. So C type equals to content type dot objects dot get and app label being movies and model being movie. Okay, so there's our content type. And then we're gonna go ahead and add in our object ID. And we'll go ahead and do two underscores and we'll say in movie IDs, and then a user ID, two underscores in user IDs. We'll worry about days ago in just a moment, but this will give us our query set. It does not give us this dictionary that I wanted with the movies as the keys. So let's go ahead and do values, and we'll go ahead and grab our object ID, which of course is our movie ID. So let's go ahead and just make that more clear to us in the future as well. So we'll do from django.db.models, import F, and hopefully you already know what I'm gonna do, but annotate, and we'll say movie ID equals to the F string or the F function for object ID, and then user ID equally to, again, the F of user ID. And so there's gonna be our values. We've got our movie ID and our user ID. Great. So this query set is now more like a data set, right? because it's just a list of dictionary values. Each one has a movie ID and each one also has a user ID. So what I can do with this is I can actually iterate through each data point in there. So I'll go ahead and say e, uh, for D in the data set, I could print out this D. And what we'll see is a list of, you know, movie ID being something and then user ID also being something. Like it'll have to be that way because these movies are gonna be something that exists or just an empty list. 
So what I can do then is I can say movie ID equals to D dot get movie ID and then user ID equals to D dot get of the user ID. And so to do this, all I want to do is I want to check inside of this data if movie, if this movie ID here is inside of the data that I want to get back, all right? I'll also say or the string of that movie ID is in that data. Then what I'll do, actually, we'll actually make the movie ID a string. So let's go ahead and just declare it as a string always. That way we don't have too many conditions going on here. But if the user ID or the movie ID is in this data, then we're going to go ahead and do something. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and add it. So data movie ID is equal to, and what are we adding? Well, this first user as a list item. And if it is in there already, then we'll just go ahead and append this user in here as a list item. And then finally, it will return all that. Okay, and so that's what's gonna happen here. It's gonna look look everything up in a query set, and then it's gonna add this in. Now, this actually might get incredibly inefficient over time, but for now, this is the method that we're gonna use. Now, the way it will become less inefficient is by in our task, if we limit the number of items that we're doing on any given page, any given batch. So if we put this down to 100, then it's gonna be significantly less as far as that's concerned or more specifically the offset. If we put this down to 50, then it's gonna be less items altogether uh, in there. So that's important, especially for the movie IDs, right? So let's, let's bring it down to 50. Max pages is actually the amount of batches that it will end up doing. Um, so 50 is fine in this case. Okay, so now that we've got that, we've got recently suggested, let's go ahead and add it in with objects equaling to uh, this suggestion manager. Okay. And so go back into our tasks here. I wanna bring the suggestion, it's still in there, which is good. So now what I want is the recent, recently, suge uh, recently suggested. So we'll go ahead and say recently suggested. And this equals to suggestion dot objects dot get recently suggested. We already have our movie IDs and we already have our user IDs. What do you know? Okay, so now this should give me a dictionary value. So what I want to do is I'll go ahead and say, uh, well, the movie suggested. So already let's do movie ID done equals to, or rather users done equals to this recently suggested dot get the string of the movie ID and well, that's either gonna be none or a list of items. So we'll just go ahead and do that. So this should give us back a list or we'll declare a list. And then we'll just say, if you, if the user ID is in that list, then we'll just run continue. We won't even predict, we'll just continue the for loop and do that. This should help solve this problem for us. And of course I can also print out the movie ID is done for the user. So let's go ahead and save that and we'll give this a shot. Copy this and we'll run python manage.py shell and from ml.tasks, we'll import everything. We'll run these predictions and it already has done for user. Great. And it was actually pretty fast for all of those. It didn't add new predictions. So let's go ahead and add in the delta now, as far as time ago. So I have it as days ago, uh, but maybe we do something a little bit smaller than that. Actually, let's leave it in as days ago. So now we'll go ahead and import date time. And then we'll also import from django.utils. We'll import the time zone. And like we've seen before, we'll go ahead and do the delta is uh, date time and time delta and days equals to days ago. And then we'll go ahead and do the time delta equals to time zone dot now minus the delta. And so basically 
we're again looking for recently suggested. So this filter in here would be timestamp and it's gonna be greater than or equal to that time delta. And now if I run this again, actually let's do it one way. I'll do less than or equal to that. This time it should do all of them because, well, looks like it didn't want to. So maybe I didn't save it in the right time. Let's try that again. Yeah, so it's not skipping any of them this time. So it actually did do all of them uh, based off of the fact that, well, I have none done over, you know, seven days ago. So again, if it's greater than or equal to, that's actually what we want. Just so we have exactly the, you know, timestamp that we're working off of as far as the recently suggested. And of course I could change that as I see fit, but this now uh, helps us solve that problem of automatically doing suggestions for everything, right? And so that's actually pretty cool. Now, the other thing that we could consider with these arguments here, I'm gonna go ahead and do my uh, actual filter args. I'm gonna change it to being a dictionary so it's a little easier to read and object IDs in movie IDs and there we go and then the final one a little easier to read there unpack that and I'll also go ahead and say data set equals to data set dot annotate. Cool. So the other thing that I could consider here is perhaps the rating value changing or perhaps the model changed. And if the model changed, then perhaps I want all new suggestions, right? So that's another option, of course. And that would just be adding another field here actually updating that field when the model does change, which would happen when we do that training. Um, and then all of those recent suggestions are now no longer active. So in other words, I'm just gonna go ahead and add in a, another field here and say uh, active, like I got rid of, and say the default being true. And then we'll run python manage.py make migrations and then Python manage.py migrate. And the final thing being in here is saying active being true. So then I can also manually force some sort of a recently suggested based off of inactive, you know, items. So going into like Toy Story, for example, uh, we'll save it as inactive. I went ahead and removed a couple of them and also made those two inactive so that we could do exactly what I was shooting for, which was allowing me to just go and have one-offs where I am able to manually change it and add a new value, a new suggestion to that user. So the cool thing about that then is if they go to, you know, maybe they go to a specific movie that they didn't rate yet, uh, but the, it was suggested three days ago and they rated all these other ones, then I can actually make sure that, that you know, the, the suggestion is showing up. The other one being, of course, we could narrow the model down as well and say, did rate in there also, or maybe that's a whole nother query set. So like if it's already rated, maybe that's the opposite of the, you know, timestamp. So if it's already rated, we probably don't need to give them suggestions for it. Uh, but again, those are going to help us understand the accuracy of our model. I think this is pretty cool. If you have any questions on this, let me know. Otherwise, let's keep going. Now, of course, we need to actually have a home page with suggested movies based off of the machine learning model. But I actually found a little bit of a bug in our review process for popular review. Now, the first review that shows up here is actually rated by popularity. It has a little bit of a sorting beyond that, but it is one of the top 250 most popular. Now, if I go and rate this, let's say a four, now what it's actually doing is an infinite review. It's doing a random review altogether. And we could verify this by going into the Git request itself. Notice that it's going to movies infinite, 
when it still needs to go to movies popular. So all I'm gonna do here is change the path for that. And we need this for the dashboard. So we'll take a look at that dashboard in a moment. And so into our movies here, into our views, we're gonna to go to the movie popular view. And I just wanna add into my get context data here. So we'll go and define get context data, takes in self, we'll get the original context of that. And actually let's pass in any args and keyword args if for some reason those are in there, which they should not be, but if they are, let's go ahead and pass it in. Just as a fail safe, return that context of course. And then I'll go ahead and say endless path is equal to, well, the path that this is on, which in my case is, I believe, movies and popular, right? So there absolutely is a shortcut way to write this using the URL resolver of reverse, but I'm just gonna leave it in like that. So with this endless path, what I wanna do then is we'll actually use an underscore for the endless path back into my infinite template, infinite.html. I'll just go ahead and say if endless path, then we'll use whatever that is. Otherwise, we'll use infinite. And then there we go. Save that. And so now, if I refresh in here, I should be able to get more highly rated movies, right? So this one's pretty highly rated. Never heard of it. I'm gonna give it a one because I've never heard of it. Guarded State, I really liked this movie. I'll give it a four, right? So now these are actually accurate popular review, so infinite. Now you might have caught that already, but I did not until now. So since we have this, now it's time to actually put in our suggestions. So let's go ahead and do this. I'll go ahead and do Python manage.py start app, and we're gonna call it dashboard. So the only reason I'm calling it dashboard is to separate it from everything else and to know that I'm just really using the dashboard views here. And I'm gonna define a home view. You could call it dashboard view. I'm just gonna go ahead and do a function-based view to start just to see exactly how we might wanna do this. So I'll call this dashboard and main.html for the template name. And then the context, I'll go ahead and pass in a empty context for now. And we'll also go ahead and say user equals to request.user. And if not user.is authenticated, I'll go ahead and pass render request and maybe like landing.html, right? So your primary landing page, you could also call it home page, whatever you wanna call it, doesn't really matter. Okay, so why is it that I wanted that infinite there? Why in general did I want that? Well, it's mainly so I could actually come in my home view and I could say context, and this is gonna be my endless path. This is gonna be equal to that, of course. And then I'll go ahead and say if request.htmx, then I want to return render. And this time it's going to be movies, snippet, and infinite. Okay. So I might not do this in the long run, but for now, that's what I'll end up doing. So let's go ahead and make our main dashboard here. And templates. Then we'll go ahead and do dashboard and main.html. Okay, so let's go ahead and grab the infinite view, copy that and bring it into our main view here. So we've got this object here. So what I wanna do is actually give an object of some kind. This will be the first step. We'll go ahead and do from suggestions.models. We're gonna import the suggestion model. And of course, at this point, the user is gonna be authenticated. So I'll go ahead and do my query set is suggestion.objects.filter user equals to user. And I'll also say did rate equals to false. So what is my actual object here? If I do context and object, well, it's gonna be qs.first and whatever the content object is, right? And since I have this infinite here, I'm actually gonna go ahead and do qs.order by and just say random. So hopefully I actually have some suggestions for this user, but this will allow me to have that object and hopefully it will render out correctly. So let's go ahead and bring this home view in to our main configuration. 
So we'll do, I'm gonna copy this ratings here and just change it to dashboard and dashboard views. And then we'll go ahead and create a path for it for our homepage. And this is gonna be dashboard views.home view. Great. Okay, so now that we've got that, let's go into our homepage. And I've got none type is not subscriptable. Now, this is because I actually don't have any suggestions. I deleted all of the suggestions for this particular user for this reason. So let's go ahead and come back in here and now say if qs.exists, then that will be the object. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and do context object equals to, well, maybe now we want to grab some popular movies. So from movies.models, we're going to import movie and movie.objects.all.popular and maybe the, yeah, I don't know, the first one. <laughs> That's going to always be the same movie, but we'll just leave it like that for now. And then we will refresh in here and it's million dollar hotel. Okay, so this is always the one that's recommended, which again is maybe not what we want. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and just do a random movie for the time being, or I could actually change things just slightly, which I won't do just yet. So I'll go ahead and just say order by and random. Okay, so now I've got suggestions in here that aren't actually suggestions. They're just random stuff to give to this user because it's a brand new user. Okay, so there's gonna be a couple of things that we'll need to clarify or clean up so that we are, for our brand new users, getting at least some suggestions. And you might already have an intuitive sense about this, right? And so if we don't have suggestions just yet, perhaps we need to trigger them. Perhaps we need to go into our machine learning tasks and actually grab some suggestions because I don't have any, right? And that certainly is something we might want to do. Uh, the question is whether or not this should be done on the home view or not. And to me, I'm not going to do it on the home view. We'll implement it later. Uh, but what I will do is manually run those tasks. So we'll go ahead and run Python manage.py shell. I'm now going to go ahead and manually just run this prediction task. So from ml.tasks, and let's run that. So hopefully at this point we have some suggestions now. And now I get this object here. Okay, great. So that's actually fine. I, I made a little mistake as far as the view is concerned. And that is this should be dot context object. There we go. And now if I refresh in here, it's giving me some sort of recommendations. And I think these are actually pretty good already, right? So they're already pretty decent recommendations for this particular user. And if I sort them by this value here, uh, th these are actually fairly accurate for me already, which is pretty interesting. Um, but then again, these could just be popular movies, right? So that is the other aspect of this that's pretty hard to diagnose in the terms of movies themselves. Nevertheless, I still want to see those movies and I probably want to see them in this particular order. Like the Empire Strikes Back should be the first thing that's recommended to me. And then I can go from there, right? So that's actually what we still need to do is we need to update it in order to see the correct list order for any given movie. So this takes in a whole other aspect into our movies manager. So going into our movies manager, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna define a new method called by ID order. And it's going to be self and movie IDs being equal to an empty list. And I'll go ahead and get my query set first. And there's going to be self.get query set. And we want to filter this down by ID in the movie IDs. And then we want to filter it down even more or rather order it in a certain way based off of the list order in that case. So to do this, we need to understand how to iterate through this list so we get the position value as well as the actual ID value. So a way to do this would be to create a tuple and then do for the I value or the index value and then the ID value, or in this case, I'll just say PK, and then we'll go ahead and enumerate 
the movie IDs. Now, in this case, the primary key and the ID is the same. So I actually am going to call this my movie PKs. And then I will actually filter this down by that primary key as well. Okay, cool. Um, and so now I'm going to iterate through all of those. And if we think about this, we can do the PK and that's equal to I or something like that, right? So we could actually have the primary key and then its corresponding index value, like where it actually is, like the position it is in this list. This would be a way to sort of look at that data. Now, what we can actually do is use Django to clarify this a bit by using case and when. So what this means then is I can actually wrap this whole thing around a case. We'll go ahead and unpack it just like that, right? So I'm still enumerating anything. And then in here, I just go ahead and say when. And instead of being a tuple, I'll get rid of this comma, that shouldn't have been there anyway. But instead of this being a tuple, I'll use the field name of PK equals to the iteration value of PK. I'm gonna go ahead and just call this PKI so we don't get confused or too confused that is. And then this being IDX as in the iteration value. And then we'll put this in, then give us that position. And so this is gonna be the case that we do to maintain our order. It's pretty nice. And then I can actually do QS.order by that maintained order. So we're gonna go ahead and save that now. And I already have the movie manager set up. So back into my views here, what I've got is this context object. What I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna go ahead and get my movie uh, IDs is equal to QS.values list. And of course it's object ID. And we'll go ahead and say flat being true. We should probably narrow this down to our content type as well. Um, because the next part of this would be, let's actually change this from QS to just being suggestion QS. And we'll go ahead and grab that. And then that. And now our new QS is going to be movie.objects.by. And this was our ID order. And then we pass in our movie IDs here as the argument. And now we're gonna go ahead and get rid of that ordering. And we save that. This is no longer a content object, but rather just the first item in there because it is now a movie. We can save that and refresh in here. This is now the top rated movie for this particular user uh, in this case. Now I actually don't have the ordering Looks like maybe the ordering is incorrect as far as the suggestion values are concerned. So I'll go ahead and change this to being order by, and this is gonna be negative value, so that my highest rated suggestion comes up first, which is the Empire Strike Back, and I refresh in here, and there we go. So that's pretty cool. So now I actually have the highest suggested thing coming up first, and that's what's showing up. Now, the thing about this though, of course, is that I actually want to have more actual suggestions showing up here. So this infinite thing is nice if I actually wanted to have some sort of infinite view, right? So if I wanna now pick a rating for this, like, hey, you must rate it in this order type of thing, Empire Strike Back is great, then it goes to the next one, and if I refresh in here, it will literally not go to the next one until I actually go there but I can also skip it or try to skip it. In this case, it won't skip because quite literally the ordering of it is always gonna be exactly the same. Um, of course, there's things that I could do to change it and all that, uh, but really what I wanna do is not have this infinite thing showing up. Um, what I do want instead is I wanna have maybe just a list view show up of these different movies. So that means then I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of this change this from object to object list and object list and get rid of first as well. Pretty great. So now we have a object list. So we're gonna go ahead and jump into our template for our homepage, our dashboard page. And this one is gonna copy our original list view. So I'll go ahead and copy the movie list view, bring it into our dashboard here. I'm gonna get rid of this sorting here but instead of sorting, I'll just go ahead and say H1 and welcome back. 
and I'll go ahead and do instead of MS auto being ME auto, we'll save it and we'll refresh on our homepage here now. So this is actually gonna give us way too much data, right? Cause it's actually giving us every single rating now. So there's a couple of different things on how, what we could think about for doing that specifically. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and come back into my view here and I'm gonna go ahead and say max movies being let's say 10. And so that I can now cut this down to being up to 10 movies on both of these query sets here. And then refreshing in here. And now I've got all of these ratings that I can now go through. Pretty fantastic. So then Raiders of the Lock Stark, I can go ahead and rate that one. 39 Steps, never heard of it. Happiness, I've never heard of that movie. 12 Angry Men, I've heard of this one. I think it was okay. I'll give it a three. Uh, this one, I don't know. You know, So now we can actually start mo rating movies that are more accurately what we're trying to do here uh, for this particular user or any particular user. And now, of course, if I refresh this, I get a whole new set of ratings because what I did was this did rate being false. That was another key aspect of this is that making sure that I can only grab ones that I haven't rated yet uh, for those suggestions. Because if I have rated them, then the suggestions aren't really suggestions. They're kind of redundant information. So of course, the last thing would be to actually update the content type. But then there's a whole nother issue that I want to address. And that is how often I'm gonna do the training, how often I'm gonna update my suggestions. So if we think about it, going into our tasks here, I wanna run this if I rate a bunch of movies. So that would mean that I come into my ratings and I would want to review what's going on in here. So that's a number of things that I will still absolutely do. Uh, but for now, let's go ahead and leave it as is with a new dashboard, with a ordered movie suggestions, which is fantastic. I think this is such a cool little uh, neat trick to keep an ordering maintained from some other list. Now we're gonna go ahead and trigger our machine learning predictions task based off of the number of ratings I give in any given session. So it's actually pretty straightforward to do. So first and foremost, we wanna jump into the rate movies view and down where we actually have a content object, like it actually was created as a rating, uh, we're gonna go ahead and do it in here. Now there's one little error that I have, it's keep on saying skipping, it should actually give us the success message in there. And so above this, I'm gonna go ahead and now grab some sort of item related to this, right? So what is it that I'm trying to grab here? Well, I'm trying to keep track of the number of times I rated something in this current session. And even if the session is really long, I wanna keep track of what that ends up being. So I'll go ahead and just say items rated equals to request .get, uh, session get and items dash rated. Or we'll go ahead and say zero, right? And so basically every time I successfully rate a session, and this is denoted by the fact there's a content object, I'll go ahead and auto increment this. So items rated plus equals to one and then set it into my session again. So request that session and then add items rated equals to that one. And it's items dash rated. And then we'll go ahead and print out the number of items rated. We'll do it every single time. And then I'll go ahead and come back in, refresh, and I've never heard of this one, doesn't sound interesting, I'll give it a one, and a one there too, okay? So now we've got two items total rated, great. So what I wanna do then is really, after this is a certain amount, let's say five, if items modulo five equals to zero, then we're gonna go ahead and print trigger rating. Pretty cool. So, or trigger new suggestions really. So it's trigger new suggestions. So how do we actually do that? Now, hopefully you remember, but the idea is we come into ML, we've got tasks in here, and there is our batch users prediction task. I also have a batch user single prediction task, which I'm just gonna get rid of because the batch users one is really easy to use. So we'll go ahead and copy this and we'll bring it into our views here. So I'll go ahead and do from ML, uh, we're gonna import tasks as ML tasks. And then down here, 
we will go ahead and start this trigger. So first off, the user's IDs is really just equal to the request.user.id, um, or rather just user.id, because we already declared the request.user. And that is going to work with dot and the batch users prediction task dot apply async. Now the reason we have apply async is for our keyword args here and I'll separate them each out. So user IDs is equal to this user IDs here. Okay. Now the next thing is actually where am I going to start this? Because if you remember back to the user's prediction task, let's go ahead and take a look at it. We have, well, it's basically starting at the popular movies. We do have it paginated. So this is actually pretty important, um, which actually brings us back to the next question as to where do we actually start this? So start page and well, how do we figure this one out? This is going to be fairly straightforward as well, but for now I'll go ahead and do a thousand. Now we could also do order random or something like that. And then I'll go ahead and do max pages being let's say 10, right? So it's not really that many new predictions, uh, but it is giving us some predictions in here. If I break this down, you can see that it's correct. Okay, so apply async then uh, Im, you know, implies that I need to actually get my worker process running. And so I'll bring it back up and I'll just do the worker, not the beat server. So celery dash A CFE home and worker. I'll go ahead and do a log level of info and hit enter. I just wanna make sure that my task is in there and there it is right there, great. So I do have that task. So I should in theory be able to run this now. So let's go ahead and save it. And it's after after five, each five iteration, each five rating, it's gonna go ahead and give me some new suggestions. So I'll go ahead and rate a few more. And it's probably only gonna be a couple more. Terminator and eventually it gets there. And we get an unexpected keyword argument of user IDs. It's probably users IDs and of course it is. So let's come back in here to users IDs and we'll rate five more. Okay, so I'll come in to, let's just do infinite review for right now. One and one, right? So we'll just keep coming through here, rate some of them. So we have, and I want actual ratings. Like I'm trying to give these real ratings. I've never heard of these movies, so I'm just giving them all ones. And I went ahead and rated 10 items total now. It's triggering those new suggestions and there it goes. And it succeeds in really fast, right? But of course it's happening in the worker process. That's really important. We absolutely want it to happen in the worker process. If the worker process was down, let's go ahead and close it down. And let's take a look. If I refresh in here, I will go ahead and rate a few more. And getting close here. After I did that, um, it triggered new suggestions. Now, of course, they aren't actually running right now, but if I bring the worker back up, what we should see is that task. And we did get that task. So it's able to resume its task, which is fantastic. It's a really good thing that we get to see right there. So that is actually allowing us to trigger these predictions in some sense. Now, the one thing is this start page, right? If I'm always starting at page 1000, it's pretty much always gonna get the exact same predictions. Now, the, the movies that is at least, and if we look back at those tasks, that's because it's coming off of popular. Now that popularity will change, so it's not gonna be perfectly exact, uh, but it will be close. And in fact, maybe we change this to not always being popular or we freeze or basically store the iterations in some sense, or maybe we make a playlist of movies that we want to move off of and, and actually rate. And, you know, we can start to think of how to batch these more in the future. But for now, I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go ahead and make this start page based off of the number of suggestions this user hasn't suggested yet. Um, so if we come back into our homepage, let's go into our dashboard, into our views, we've got these suggestions right here. These I can also add into my request.session and we'll go ahead and say total new suggestions and we'll put it equal to suggestion ques.count. There we go. So this is gonna give me that suggestion, which is fantastic. This gives me some sort of number that I can now work off of. This number can be used 
inside of our ratings call. So we'll go ahead and grab it, just similar to our items rating. I'll put it right above and we'll go ahead and say start page equals to request.session.get the total new suggestions. Actually, I should probably put that in as a total and we'll just go ahead and say total new suggestions and we'll put it in as zero and this will be the start page. Okay, great. So again, this is a little problematic in some sense because, well, the way it's doing suggestions at this point is based off of the popular movies, right? So it's certainly possible that it's going to give those same suggestions all over again um, <laughs> because of how many that we end up having, which in some cases, okay. In some cases is not. So perhaps we need a new user, a specific user task that's based off of the user, not just these batch predictions, which is something we can think about in a little bit. Uh, but for now, I can actually come back in here again and rate, you know, five more and a lot of, a lot of not great movies in here, which is kind of funny. Um, but we can rate several more and we will absolutely get those going and they'll give us some new suggestions. We go back into the recommender and it's starting to show us a lot of the ones that, you know, sort of make sense, I think. Um, and the other part about this is these will start to improve over time as well. So the reason that they'll start to improve, of course, is in part because we'll train it on a regular basis, but also in part because the actual batch prediction right now is based off of user suggestions. And some of them they will actually skip, which is another part of this that we definitely added to improve that specific thing for any given user. And I actually don't want this print statement any longer. Uh, but now we have a, a really clean and simple way to get new user predictions. Now this of course doesn't mean this is the only method that we could use, right? So we could actually add in a, another method for bigger predictions. Perhaps we wanna have this only being at two and then we delay a bigger prediction to, I don't know, maybe 30 minutes from now. So it actually is adding a lot more um, and we only do that one time sort of thing. All right, so before we get started, we have a little housekeeping item, and that is if you're not logged in, the homepage just doesn't show anything. So let's go ahead and actually create that template. Uh, I'm gonna do it based off of the dashboard and just drag it on over. We'll go ahead and rename this to home.html and save it, refresh. Granted, it has nothing. Another housekeeping item would be the spacing here, which is solved by wrapping this block content into a div class of container and fluid so that we have all of that content coming in correctly. And then up here, the nav bar is not showing my actual logged in user uh, or like a link to that logged in user because we've got this right here. So we wanna say if user dot is authenticated, then we'll go ahead and do that. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and add in the login link. And I'll put it in as a nav link here. And just log in. And accounts login. Great. We should probably have a sign up one as well, uh, but I'm gonna leave that out. Oh, I see. I actually left it out of this list element here, so I will actually have it in as a button just like the other one as well, just to keep things sort of simple. Okay, cool. Uh, so now we can log in and do all that stuff. Great, perfect. And it's showing messages. The messages I might as well also have inside of that container fluid for if I ever need to update and change them. Great. All right, so yet again, we need to turn our sites on the movie IDs. So if we go back into our admin, we know that these IDs are well, they're fairly arbitrary. They're actually based off of something that we didn't create, right? They're based off of a third party data set. And I'm actually going to leave those IDs intact because that's not actually what my concern is because what we would need to solve for is also applicable to our users as well, or really any of our models in Django. And that has to do with the fact that these IDs are not continuous they seem like they're continuous, but they certainly aren't. Now, the reason that they're not continuous is because if I delete this in my database, regardless of what Django model, 
uh, the database and Django are not by default going to reuse this ID. They are going to go ahead and auto increment it. This is absolutely a feature of databases for a number of reasons. Now, of course, we could change what that primary key is away from auto incrementing IDs, but we're going to leave it in as auto incrementing IDs. Now, we can actually take a look at this challenge inside of this notebook that I ended up creating. It's actually very, very simple, right? So we bring in Django. We have a query set that's ordered by the original IDs or the IDs that I have stored in my database. And then I run a enumerate so I can see the position inside of this query set related to the actual instance itself. And I can start calculating the delta. And we can obviously write away that these are not continuous numbers. The position does not match the ID. And this is perfectly fine, but it's not great when it comes to experimenting with machine learning models otherwise. So what I wanna do is I actually want this position field stored into my movie objects. But again, even if I store the position itself, if I deleted one of these, the all of the other positions would be incorrect. Now, luckily for us, there's actually some built-in methods to do this inside of Django itself. So we're gonna go ahead and take a look at those built-in methods. And the first one is we're gonna import from django.db.models. We're gonna import something called window and F. Then we're gonna go ahead and do from django.db.models.functions. We're gonna import something called dense rank. Now there are other kinds of ranking, if you will, uh, that you could use dense rank, make sure that it's very similar to this position on a query set. So what we wanna do here is I'm gonna grab that original query set and I'll grab this right here and we'll come right down here and we're gonna go ahead and annotate this new one. I, I will actually leave all of them in there for now as we annotate it. So I'll do dot annotate. And what I wanna do here is I'll say new IDX basically as our new position, this is gonna be equal to a window. So the window itself is gonna allow me to have an expression and also an ordering, right? So this expression is going to be based off of that dense rank, okay? And then that dense rank is gonna be based off of the ordering that I want. So I can have a number of orderings in here. Order by can be a list of items. I am just gonna use the ID field and I'm gonna use ascending, okay? So very similar to like what we've already seen before. You could use descending if you wanted to. Um, and you could also change the ordering based off of uh, many other things, including like the other fields on the actual movie model itself. Now I'm gonna use it based off of the ID field for this exact reason the actual position is gonna to correspond to roughly speaking what the ID is. And then I can see if there's any discrepancies in the future if I need to. Uh, but in this case, I'm gonna leave it like this. Now one might actually change the ordering based off of the release date. That actually is not a terrible idea, uh, but I wanna keep things as simple as possible. So now if I actually do this query set filter here, I'll go ahead and grab this right here and we will paste this down here. I can go ahead and do this query set. I'm gonna do it up to 100 again, and I'll just put it in this enumeration clause. So now with this expression that I've got, I've got a new field on here called new IDX. So I'll go ahead and change this to IDX and this to new IDX, and then we'll give the delta itself, and we'll run this again. And this might actually take a good amount of time and it looks like maybe I have a, a little error on this one. Let's see what the error is. And I, I put a capital ID, it should be a lowercase ID. And we'll go ahead and run that, great. So that now solves it. Okay, so what's cool here is we see the position is zero, the IDX is one. So it actually starts at the number one. Our delta is a one. I want our delta to be a zero. I want the position to correspond to that new IDX or whatever I am calling this variable here. So this is actually really an easy solve, but what we see now is continuous variables going on, uh, regardless, or the continuous numbers going on, regardless of what the actual ID is, right? And that's the key. That's what we wanna actually end up solving and storing. So if I run this again, I now see that um, the, let's change this back to being 
object, I now see that the object ID doesn't correspond with this new IDX at all, uh, but it does actually give us some sort of value I can store. Okay, cool. Um, so again, this might be confusing if you're not familiar with the machine learning aspect of it, uh, but the point of this is to have continuous IDs that we can continuously update that actually don't affect anything else related to this data set other than the fact that we're storing this position. Now we can obviously run this calculation anytime we need to export this data and that's okay, but I'm actually not gonna do that for a number of reasons that we'll get into in just a moment. Okay, so I wanna break this down so I can see this a little bit better and we'll keep that window in there as well as that order by. And so I actually want this new IDX, I actually want it to be exactly the same position. So I want to start at zero, like you would with any given list in Python. So that's actually also pretty simple. I'm going to tab this in and do annotate again. So we're going to annotate another one. And this is going to be our final IDX. And this is very simple. It's just using F of the field that I created right here, and then subtracting one. And now I can do the position, the actual IDX is gonna be that final one. And then the Delta, we will see what that is with the final IDX. And we should get a Delta of zero all across the board. And this would be true for our entire data set. Now this right here is a lot more efficient than going through and doing the enumeration for all of these things like a more junior developer would probably use enumeration where I recommend that you do it like this because it's actually doing it on the database side and it will be much, much quicker um, as we see here and also more efficient for bigger data sets. Now the part that might not be efficient is actually then setting the IDs themselves, right? So I actually want to set the IDs only if they have changed. So we'll go ahead and do that now as a utility method or an actual, uh, you know, an actual task itself. Uh, but I'm not going to actually do it yet. We'll do it in the next one. But the point here is that we have a hopefully a basis for the position that we want to put in. Now, this is actually for embeddings. So if you've ever heard of the concept of embeddings, this will actually prove to be very valuable for that. And the other part is when we do have those positions stored, then when I actually have predictions, these predictions are often based off of the pos position that we just are, uh, are storing, right? So this actual IDX is how we will use predictions with other kinds of models and other kinds of machine learning. But at this point, let's actually turn this into a task. All right, so now that we have these position IDs or these position ranked IDs, I'm gonna go ahead and create a new field on my movie model. And this field is just going to be called IDX. And we'll go ahead and do models.integer field. And I'll go ahead and say blank is true and null is true. I will also add in some help text to remind me what these are for. So these are position IDs for ML, essentially. We could say for embeddings, we could do all sorts of things to give it more clarity. But I just want to make sure that I have position IDs uh, in here and stored. Okay, cool. Uh, so now that I've got that, let's go ahead and run our migration. So Python manage.py, make migrations. And let's make sure I'm in the right folder. And then we'll go ahead and run Python manage.py migrate. Great. Okay, so initially this is gonna take some time to actually implement. Uh, so let's go ahead and create the task now inside of movies. Uh, I've got this tasks.py here. I'm not sure if you have it or not, but let's go ahead and add it in. Now there's a few things that we need to import. First is from Celery, we're gonna import the shared task. And then I'll do from Django.apps, we're gonna import apps. And then from Django.db.models, we're gonna import the window and F functions. And then we'll also go ahead and import from Django.db.models.functions, we're gonna import that dense rank, rank as well. Okay, so the shared task here is really just so if I need to run it at some other time or in a worker process, I totally could, uh, but it's not necessary to be a shared task. It could totally just be a utility function, but I'm just gonna do it in as a shared task because 
I mean, we have the ability to do so. So I'm gonna call this my update movie position. Let's call it embedding IDX. Okay. And so this is gonna do all of them. And the reason I'm gonna I import an apps here is so I can grab the movie model. So movie equals to apps dot get model and it's movies and movie. And it should be a capital M here. Okay, so of course, the reason for this is because in models up high, this is actually where I'm gonna want to put this in signals. So from, we are gonna bring in from django.db and uh, models.signals, we're gonna import the pre-save method and the post delete method, or rather not the pre-save, but rather post save method here and post delete. Okay, so what I wanna do then is down underneath the movie model, we'll do movie and post save. This takes in a few arguments here, sender instance and created, and then it'll be args and keyword args. And for now, I'll just say if created in instance.id, we'll go ahead and say pass. The next one is gonna be movie post delete and args, keyword args, and again, pass. So let's go ahead and wrap these in with post save.connect, and that's gonna be this function, and the sender is gonna be movie, and I'll just copy this down here with post delete, sender be movie, just like that, great. So we have those signals. The next thing I need to add in here is from dot import tasks, as movie tasks, or let's say movies task to keep that app name going. So down here is where I actually wanna call these tasks, right? So if it's created and in there, we'll do movie tasks dot update movie position IDs. Again, we could totally delay this or have it like offset somewhere, but more than likely, the reason I don't necessarily have to have it in as a shared task or a, like an actual worker process is because if I'm adding movies or deleting them, there's a good chance it's being done in the admin. So we can totally wait for these positions to be created and finished. Okay. So the next thing is the movie, the actual updating of these IDs themselves. That's what's going to occur here. So if we add a new movie, we want to get its position, whatever it might be. And if we delete a movie, we want to update all of the positions that would be affected. So how do we actually find that out? Well, if you remember back to the notebook that we just created, we're gonna create the query set being movie.objects.all. Then we're gonna go ahead and annotate it a couple times. So the first annotation will be our new IDX. And this is gonna be inside of a window. So I'll go ahead and actually break this down and say new IDX and the window function here, which allows us to do an expression. The expression we're using is dense rank, which it looks like I did not import. I just imported dense. We're also gonna go ahead and order by. And as a refresher, you can order it by any kind of field using this F model here uh, or the F function. And I'm gonna use it by the ID and we'll use dot ascending. So that's how you can actually order it from something else. Now, one of the things I mentioned before is you could totally use like a publish date here if you want it to be based off of that publishing. Um, you could also probably order it in the query set itself and then annotate it. But I actually recommend using the window because of the dense ray method itself. And we do want to execute that method. So we'll call it right there just like that. Okay, great. So this will give us new IDs based off of the position that they're in, based off of their actually uh, ID. And of course we wanna grab the final IDX being based off of that, subtracting one. And this is just so it's the absolute position value itself. So now what we wanna do is we wanna go through for all of the objects in this query set. We wanna check if object.finalIDX is not equal to object.idx. Now, remember, this is an annotated field. This is not an actual field on the object itself. IDX is the actual field on the object itself. So we'll go ahead and do object.idx is equal to this right here. 
and then we'll go ahead and save it. Now, you might be wondering, why is it that I'm doing it this method? Well, this method will take longer, but it will ensure that everything is updated correctly in the correct order based off of all sorts of things, right? Um, so to be safe, we could absolutely do the order by method here. But the thing is, I don't actually need to do that because how this annotation is happening is the final IDX will absolutely correspond to the correct location and all of that. And I've only found this as being the most effective way to actually update things after you do these annotations. So if you find a new, more efficient method, please let me know in the, in the comments, but this is the best one I've found. And so the reason I'm only doing this if statement versus uh, you know, saving all of them is I don't need to save something if it didn't change, right? So that's the key part of that. And that will also be a little bit more efficient as well. So I'll go ahead and then add in if updated or add in a number for the updated and just update it as the IDs have changed. And then the final thing would be just to print out that we updated, you know, however many number of uh, the movie IDX fields. So the initial one is going to be big, right? It's going to have a lot of them in there, which is totally fine. Uh, but now that we've got this, we've got a way to run it and also a way to update it if necessary. Um, so with that in mind, I'm also going to go ahead into my admin and add into the list display, the IDX field here, as well as it being a read only field too. So we'll save that and let's go into the admin real quick. And so if I go in here, I'll see that my position field is not showing up at all. So what the only times that this would actually run is if something's created, right? Or it's deleted. So if I just go save and continue, it doesn't affect anything. Uh, so that's actually really important, I think. It only affects or changes these IDs if something was added to the database or removed from the database because those are actually the only things we care about in this sense. So let's go ahead and add a new movie. And I'm gonna call this movie like something like this movie kind of sucks. Oh, and I have a new issue here uh, that are related to the title itself. This is probably has something to do with the uh, previous calculation stuff that we had. So let's go ahead and probably remove those things because we no longer need them. So inside of movies, I'm no longer going to add, uh, I think these calculate ratings all across the board. I probably don't need any of those anymore. At least I don't think so. If for some reason I need to bring them back, I totally will. Uh, but I'll, I'll get rid of them inside of my read only fields at this point and these rating updated, all that. Cool. So the things that I probably want are just rating average and rating count. So those I think we could probably still keep in there actually, as far as the display. I just didn't need the actual display coming through. So we'll leave those in. Cool. So I'm gonna refresh in this movie ad uh, and delete this one that tried to calculate some stuff for me. You might have already seen this error or experienced it, um, but it's just something that I didn't necessarily need to do until now. Now notice that I am deleting it and it's actually working. So it's taking a long time to delete it. Uh, a big part of the reason or literally the only reason is because of this right here. It's updating all of the movie position embeddings. Um, and at this point, it totally has them, right? And so if I re-rank them, it starts at zero. What do you know? It's Toy Story and it goes all the way down. So this is actually really great. So going back in, if I went to create a delete me movie exclamation mark uh, and hit save and continue, it's gonna update it again. This time it's not gonna take nearly as long, but it will give us the correct position ID for this particular movie, which we could verify in here, right? So the most recent movie was added at the very, very end as it should, right? So it should be added to the end of these things for this particular ID. Cool. And so I could absolutely delete some random movie in here that maybe doesn't make sense. And you could also see that being uh, like actually having a huge effect on the ID itself. Uh, but I'll, I'll let you go ahead and decide that one for you because it will change all the IDs going forward, which is also pretty cool. Uh, but now that we have this, of course, I can run this on a regular basis as well. I don't necessarily have to do it here. Maybe I do it 
um, when I'm about to export my data. But I don't have any of that built in yet, so that would be something that we'd want to do later. But now we certainly have this option to run these updated positions uh, whenever we need to. And it's not going to be inefficient really now because it's mostly based off of uh, incorrect values uh, and it will only save based off of that as well. Uh, so hopefully that all makes sense. And uh, the part that might still not fully make sense is why we even need this field. So hopefully I'll clarify that even more so when we take a look at what this field will end up being used for with other kinds of machine learning models. All right, so now we need to export our movies data set. And of course, this means we have to go back to the exports app and modify a few things. Jumping into utilities first, I'm actually gonna go ahead and change the generate ratings data set to do the export itself. This is actually pretty straightforward on how to do. A big part of it is essentially grabbing these related items here um, in some sense. Now, the data set itself is really just data set equals to those values. And then I can return that data set, right? No big surprise here. But if I add in one little flag here and say to CSV, and I'll go ahead and give the default being true, then, well, what do you think it's going to do? If to CSV, then we'll go ahead and call this export data set. We'll go ahead and pass in the data set now as an argument. And of course, this is now going to be the argument here, right? And then I can go ahead and get rid of this. And again, if there's an exception, if there are no keys in here for that first item, it'll still return it, which is great. Uh, the next thing is the app label and whatnot. I may or may not want to keep that app label. It's interesting that the app label does say movies on here, not ratings. Um, nevertheless, we'll go ahead and get rid of that app label uh, and whatnot for now. Okay, so I've got my data set here. I also might want to add in perhaps my file name. So I'll just go ahead and say f name equals to um, dataset.csv and then I'll pass that into the file object itself. Now I can totally use this file name inside of my data set itself, but if you remember, uh, the model itself actually will change that file name. It doesn't necessarily use it except for the, you know, the actual extension that it is. Um, so we don't necessarily need that file name, but it is nice that I can change it as I see fit. So I'd go ahead and say rating here, just like that. Okay, great. So this is, well, one of those things where, how am I gonna go ahead and do this for movies? But of course, before I end up doing that, I wanna update my tasks to generate the rating data set and do to CSV being true. So just slightly changes it. So that means then I'm gonna go ahead and bring my export data set to the very top and there we go. Not a huge change, but it still ends up working out for me pretty well. The next thing is just the movies one. So from movies.models, we'll import movie and I'll go ahead and copy the generate rating data set here and now do generate movie data set and same app label. We probably uh, don't actually need the app label here. I do realize now where the app label is for and it's for the content type here. Uh, generate movies data set, don't need that one. I just need the movie itself and it's gonna be movie.objects.all. Okay, and so this is where I could do those annotations for the index values themselves if I were interested in doing that, right? So when I go back into the movies here, into the tasks, this is where I could calculate this exact same thing. Now again, the reason I'm not doing that is because I actually want it stored on my database so I can reference it whenever I need to. Okay, cool. So with this in mind, I will still annotate some things and that's gonna be movie ID. And this is still the ID itself. Movie IDX though is going to be based off of IDX. Uh, the movie objects don't have ratings, so we'll leave that out. And so those are the actual IDs or the values that I want for the movie data set. So movie IDX, and then I can add anything else that I might want in here, like the title, the release date, 
you know, the rating count, really anything that I might find relevant for eventual machine learning trading, rating average, and so on, right? So there we go. And then I'll call this my uh, data set, or rather movies.csv. Okay, so now's the tricky part. I am exporting these data sets, but I'm exporting them to basically the same place. And they're basically the same place because of this right here, how I handle these files, and also, of course, how the model is designed. So I actually want to think about this again and change it slightly to handle my design a little bit better. Now, you might hopefully are already familiar with this text choices here. So I'm just going to go ahead and use this and then declare a type for the export. So models.charfield. And of course, the choices are going to be these choices. And then we'll go ahead and give the default being rating. And then I also want to add in max length being like 20 or something along those lines. Okay, so that's the default type then. So with this coming in, what I can now use is in this instance, I can use the actual type itself. So I can just say the data type is equal to instance.type. And then I can use this in here, just like that. Great. And let's go ahead and do a slash here. So this now actually separates it. Now, one of the things that I'm not going to do, but you definitely could, is you can also use models in here as well, right? If you were going that direction. I actually prefer the method I did so that it's based off of the uh, a number of other factors that aren't just that it's a machine learning model, if you will. But you totally could do it here and use the same sort of methodology if you're so interested. The next thing is I'm also going to do a flag for latest and there's going to be models.boolean field and default being true. We'll talk about that one in a moment. Okay, so now when we actually go to export, it's going to go based off of that data type. So if we go back into our utility method here, and let's go ahead and keep it in here. Back in our utility method here, uh, what we might want is that data type. We might want to bring that in. Now this export model, I actually probably could just import the model itself because I'm not really using the task for it anywhere. The export task, I do not believe is anywhere else other than right in here. So in other words, I don't have circular imports necessarily. Uh, let's go ahead and just double check with our export utils. They're pretty much only in one place. Uh, so in other words, back into my utility function here, I will actually go ahead and do from dot models. We're going to import the export. <laughs> we're going to import the export. That's funny. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and import the export data type as well. Okay. And this just means that I'll get rid of the apps version of it and get rid of that as well. Okay. Now this circular import has everything to do with the export data type itself. So what we want here is passing in our type now and I'll go ahead and do export data type and ratings as the default type. And then the create method here, we're going to go ahead and pass in that type. Okay. So yet again, the export data set itself will pass in that argument for each item. And this is going to be movies. Oh, get rid of these extra parentheses in here. Great. And go. Cool. And again, just verifying that it's movies. And so far, so good. So now, if we think about it, when we go to upload this, this should now actually give us the correct values in here, uh, which is great. That's what I wanted to see as far as the tasks are concerned themselves. So let's go ahead and make sure that we update our migration. So I'll do python manage.py make migrations. And then we'll do python manage.py migrate. And then I'll go ahead and jump into the shell with python manage.py shell. And I'll bring in those two different utility methods here. In fact, I will actually exit out of the shell and I'll copy this and paste it again. And this time it's going to be export movies data set and then generate 
we use that utility method which we called generate movies this should be generate movies data set just like that okay great let's go back into the shell now and from exports.tasks import all and then i'll go ahead and do both of them this actually is named incorrectly let's try that one more time hopefully now i'll be able to give a actual example uh let's try it out let's import everything run it and then run this one as well and it looks like maybe i didn't save the utilities file itself let's try it again and export movies data set great no errors export ratings data set great no errors and let's go into our local cdn here exports now i've got movies and i've got ratings great so both things are working um, of course the structure is a little bit different now which is fine i could totally remove these old ones uh, again in production you probably wouldn't want to remove these old ones you'd probably would have want to think through all of this in advance um, and of course if you had to remove or just change it a little bit i would just call this e or something like that so that i, I know the difference between these or exports v2 or something along those lines if i really really needed to um, but the key thing here is i now have uh, the ability to export my movies data set but i did mention this latest here now this is actually a another method that i'm used that's actually similar to what we did with our models I'm actually going to save this data as well. So going back in here, I'll go ahead and do from dot import storages as exports storages. Let's go ahead and make sure that that's what I called it elsewhere. And it looks like it is export storages. Great. And then I'm going to go ahead and come back in here and we're just going to override the save method. So we'll go ahead and do save self args and keyword args. And I'll do a super class of save and we'll do args and keyword args. And then I'll go ahead and do if self.latest and self.file. Then we want to, you know, export, use export storages dot save of some sort of file path. So we'll do path file and overwrite being true. Okay. So the file itself of course is going to be file equals to self.file and then the path itself well this path is almost identical to this one except instead of doing today and the new file name i'm going to do latest dot and then some sort of extension right or whatever that extension is so the data type again is d type is equal to self dot type hey wow now of course i don't actually have to write out d type i can just put in self.type here and we'll leave that the extension is going to be pathlib.path assuming that i have pathlib in here still and i do and of course it's going to be based off of the file.name uh like we saw up here to some degree it's not exactly the same but it's very close and so this extension is then dot suffix and i believe we saw that one up here right there and so now i can use that extension here and there's my path there's my file there's my export and what do you know now there's one other thing here is in terms of saving this is after it is saved i want to make sure that everything else with this exact type is no longer latest as well so in other words exports or export.objects.filter type equals to self.type and we'll exclude the primary key of self.pk and then we'll just do qs.update latest being false so basically turning all of the other latest ones off now the nice thing about this is i can toggle it now so if i save everything i think everything's nice and good assuming that the server is still running with no errors i'll go into my movies uh, or back into my admin rather and go to grab some sort of export and I'll save this one, hit save and continue. And then I'll jump back into my local CDN here, exports, movies, and there's my latest. Now, why would I do that? Well, that's easy. If we think about 
the relative path here now for downloading this. The relative latest path is simply export movies latest, right? So now I know exactly what the latest file is and I don't have to search for it based off of, um, you know, the date and stuff like that. Although those will be ordered, uh, but it's just going to be a lot easier for me to handle it uh, in this fashion, which I think is pretty nice. So next, of course, in my export admin, I would probably want to adjust this a bit. So we'll do class export admin. And this is admin.model admin. And we'll do list display. And I'll go ahead and say the type maybe. So type and latest. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and put this in here. Save it. And maybe I'll also put the, the date on it itself. So the actual timestamp, we'll put that in there as well. Save that. Going back into the admin, assuming that I have it running. Go back into our exports here. And now I can see all of these different items in here. Uh, notice that ratings is all over the place. So I'll go ahead and make sure that I have only one. And now I get a no such file. No surprise there because my ratings are actually incorrect. So let's go ahead and just get rid of my super old ones and I'll only keep the new ones here. The old ones just don't point to the right location if you weren't already aware of that. So anyways, the most recent one that was created and there we go, pretty nice. And I've, of course I can filter these down. So list filter and we get filtered down by type and timestamp and latest. We could do it by all three, uh, might as well. And we can refresh in here. And now I can say, oh, all my ratings, latest one and latest one, great. And perhaps we want latest showing up first. Cool. And so what I could probably think about doing as well is maybe calculating the number of rows that are in this export so I can see uh, if the rows have changed or just have a general idea of it. Um, that I'll leave to you. And of course you would do this in the utility itself. When you go to export it, the data set itself, the length of that data set could then be used in the create itself, right? So if you did, um, you know, rows count, it'd be the length of that data set. But of course you'd have to actually add that and make a few modifications. And perhaps you need it, perhaps you don't. I would argue you probably don't need it because you can create this data set at literally any time uh, just by updating you know, something on your Celery worker process. So that of course should be as a worker process because the ratings and the movies, those might end up getting massive. Okay, cool. So now we have to uh, obviously update all of our scheduling things inside of our worker for training, for inference, for updating our movie IDs if possible, if need be, and also of course all of these exports. Let's do that now. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and schedule our machine learning training, the inference, the movie ID update if we need to use it even, as well as exporting our data sets. So this is pretty straightforward and I think at this point you have enough to do this on your own, but we'll go ahead and do it together with using schedules and crontab. Now, if you're not familiar with crontab, the documentation I think clarifies it really well, but the idea being that you want it to run at specific intervals during the day or during the week or the month, right? And so we could do all of those things and there's a lot that you could do with CronTab itself. And of course it's based off of Cron, which is a way to do scheduling on Linux machines as well. So that's kind of the idea here is using CronTab to make it run at specific times versus just having it run maybe every 30 minutes. You can use CronTab to have it run every 30 minutes as well, but I'm gonna use it so I can actually run these various things at specific times of the day. Okay, so what we've got here is I don't want the rating data set to run every hour. That's not necessary anymore. I will leave the rating average to be updated every half hour. I think that's reasonable. We might extend it out depending on how many ratings we're starting to get. We would um, be able to change that as we see fit there. Uh, but for now, what I wanna do is using CronTab, get every sort of schedule that I would end up using. So the first one is gonna be our daily movie IDX refresh, okay? And so that's just gonna be the name of it and it's gonna be the task. What we'll use for this task is of course, 
in movies. We've got tasks here and it's updated movie position embedding IDX. So we'll go ahead and use that one. And it's simply movies.tasks.update embedding position. And I'll give it a schedule. So these schedules, what I want them to be based off of is one after another. So cron tab is what we'll do. And we'll put this at one in the morning. So we'll do hour being one, minute being zero. So there's gonna be a 24 hour clock. So if you want it to be in the afternoon, you would use you know something like 19. Okay, so hour one, minute zero. This of course is gonna be based off of also the actual time zone that your Django project is using. Uh, that's absolutely what you're gonna be doing here for this particular schedule. Um, great, so it also could have an effect on the machine that you're running it on. So the server might actually have an effect here, but I believe it's based off of your Django project itself. Definitely something worth looking into. Not super relevant at this point. The relevancy here is the stacking that we want to do. So the first thing is updating all of my movie IDXs. Now, this should already be updated on a regular basis, but this is if I got rid of those signals for some reason that I created for this. Let's just make sure that those are now in there. So the IDX refresh, and then we want to actually get the ratings export. So daily rating data set export. Now this task itself is, if we go into our exports, of course, we can grab the task name itself. I'm actually gonna change this from uh, the, or well, we'll leave it in actually, just leave it like that. Rating export, and we'll go ahead and just call that task itself. This export probably doesn't have to happen at the same time. I'm gonna just change it to being about 30 minutes later. It's really not that necessary. They could probably run at the same time and be okay but the rating data set might end up getting really, really big. So we'll just go ahead and let that run on its own for like 45 minutes. So I'll go ahead and do two hours and 15 minutes later, I'll go ahead and run the movie export. This one should not take very long at all. And really how my current system is set up, these exports, we probably don't even need. To be honest, we might need them if we are wanting to do regular exporting and regular experimentation. Uh, but of course, we don't necessarily need to do this. We can do one-offs as well, which I'll show you shortly. Um, and then the next thing is, of course, after we've done those exports, then we want to train our model. So we'll go ahead and do our daily train surprise model. And let's get rid of this extra comma here. This one could take a little bit longer. So I'll go ahead and give it like, let's start at the 3 a.m. And let's go ahead and get what that surprise model training would end up being. So ML tasks, and there's our surprise model task right there. So I'll go ahead and grab that one and we'll just leave this open for now. So then here we'll do ml.tasks.surprise, you know, model train. And basically I wanna just see if there's any arguments. Of course there are none. Great, so the next one is definitely gonna be our batch users predictions. And that's gonna be pretty much the last one. And we just wanna do this basically well after my model is trained and ready. So we'll go ahead and do now daily and ML, or let's just say recent user preds, or maybe just daily uh, model inference. Okay. And we'll go ahead and grab that one, the name of it, bring it in here. And this is gonna be well after that. So I'll go ahead and just give it at, I don't know, 4.30. This one does require arguments though. So we'll go ahead and do keyword args and we'll pass in max pages of let's say 5,000, some ridiculously high number based off of how many users I might end up having. And the offset also some ridiculously high number. So the reason I have those ridiculously high numbers has to do with how I did the pagination here, right? So eventually the pagination is gonna run out. And basically if there are no more movie IDs, so in other words, I'll go ahead and say, if not movie IDs that exists, then I'll just go ahead and return that. Uh, because at some point they won't exist anymore. And instead of going through every single iteration, I can just stop it in its tracks. Great. Okay, so now that we've got that, let's go ahead and run Celery. I think I already have Python running, and sure enough, I do. Let's go ahead and make sure Celery is running correctly. So Celery dash 
a CFE home. We're going to go ahead and do worker and then dash dash beat. Just leave it in as one. I didn't actually do any of the info. So let's go ahead and I'll just close this out really quickly and then do dash L, the log level of info. Uh, that way I can make sure that all those tasks are in there. Uh, and sure enough, they are. Now, it's certainly possible that I'm getting uh, some old stuff. I got a broken pipe here. That's because I, I canceled it before it could really just do anything. Uh, but the other part of this is if I go into my Django admin, this is somewhere where you might actually have issues. And that's going into all my periodic tasks here. So if you have this fake review generator still in here, like I do, maybe you want to remove that because we don't need those fake reviews anymore. So we would remove that from the database. So what I just did was really just about making sure that my new stuff is in there, right? So this export data, data set one off, uh, I actually still want this one, but this is going to be my ratings data set one off. And then I'll just go ahead and make sure that I'm grabbing the correct one export ratings data set. And sure enough, it is that one, but I'll go ahead and delete it. And we'll go ahead and hit save. I didn't actually run it, but this of course would be how you would end up running it. We can add another periodic task, export movies one off. Actually, I don't need to underscore it like that. You can just say export movies one off and export movies enabled. And this is gonna be a one off task. I'll have it enabled so I can actually let it run and notice that it's grabbing. I need to set one of these things. Let's go ahead and just add the interval of 30 seconds and we'll go ahead and save it. And that, that should actually run right now uh, where all these other ones aren't necessarily running, but we could absolutely do these one-offs for all of these as well, um, which is great. So I've got my run rating every hour. This should be the one that I just created or actually no, this is the old one because I don't think I did that one anymore. So we want to search on here if see if it's in there. You could absolutely keep it, but it's not necessary. I just want to get rid of all of the ones that I'm definitely not using anymore, like run movie rating every 30. That is still in there. That's still relevant. And it's happening every 1800 seconds, uh, should, which should give us the correct uh, value. Um, great. Celery backend cleanup. That is something that I do want it to run on that schedule. That is completely fine. Uh, so there we go. So now I've got uh, a number of things related to the database changing and whatnot. Uh, so this mo export movies every 30 seconds still has not actually run. So let's see here. Uh, let's, it's kind of odd that it hasn't run yet. Oh, there it did. <laughs> I was spoke too soon, I suppose. Um, and if we go into our local CDN in our exports, we should now have an updated latest as well as additional exports in there too. Pretty fantastic. Okay, now, of course, we have our schedule vastly updated. Now, the reason I like to hard code this particular schedule is because I have it in a specific order, right? So it is in an order, it's in its own sort of workflow, but there's other tools that you can consider using to create this workflow. And what you also might think about is creating your own task that calls all of these other tasks in the worker process as well. That is something that I'm gonna leave for you to experiment with. Um, I like putting it this way so that I have the order that I want it to be in. And the order is even more clear by looking at the actual cron tab itself. And it's not something I'll have to continuously think about. It will just now run going forward. Um, and of course I could verify that order uh, inside of the Django admin itself and collapse this down we can see all of those order items here and how it's actually running. Uh, it's not necessarily that easy to read what's going on here, but it certainly is running on a somewhat predictable timeline and also in the order that it should be running, uh, which is, of course is based off of eventually doing inference at the very end. Now, one of the things I actually do wanna test prior to leaving is verifying that this prediction is actually still working. So, uh, cause I did change it slightly for the prediction tasks here, right there. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm gonna do all of those arguments in here and we'll do it in the shell. So Python manage.py shell and from ml.tasks, we'll import everything. And then we'll do this prediction with max pages being 5,000. Perhaps that's not enough. The offset being 200. Also, perhaps that's not enough. I'm just gonna go ahead and run it in line. 
and it looks like we had no issues there. Um, at least so I think. So let's go ahead and just uh, double check that these have been updated and we'll go into our admin and then in suggestions. And let's see here, the suggestion active and let's see, it was not showing up our timestamp, of course not, because I never added it. So read only fields, let's go ahead and add in that timestamp. And I assume that I added that as a model. Hopefully I did. Thankfully I did. And the timestamp, sure enough, was just now. That's accurate uh, as far as the date of this being recorded. Um, so pretty great. Now we have basically everything we might need to then use this with real users to start giving them predictions, to start hopefully collecting new ratings. Um, and then of course, we can start talking about what would be next in terms of improving it or using other kinds of models. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and take a look at an example notebook I created so you can get a sense as to what you will need to do to turn this into a neural network based collaborative filtering model. Using a neural network for this might yield better results, but it's significantly more complicated to implement into our entire ecosystem, let alone just understanding what's going on. So again, I'll talk about it at a high level so you can investigate more. This is not really meant to be an in-depth look at how to do it in a neural network, just really the high level discussion. So what you're gonna to wanna to do is jump over to the recommender GitHub repo. So go to cfe.sh slash GitHub and then find that recommender repo. You'll navigate into the notebooks and take a look for the example collaborative filtering with TensorFlow and Keras. Now, in order for this to run, we do need a GPU so we can actually train our model. So that means that you should actually have this notebook running on a service that has the GPU ready and also CUDA enabled. So here's a few examples of what you could do. I'm gonna go ahead and use CoLab only because it doesn't allow for persistent data at this time. Maybe in the future it will, and you'll see what I mean in just a moment. So once you have this open, go ahead and copy it to your drive or just hit Control S or uh, Command S, depending on what system you're on. And then we'll go ahead and do, uh, you know, rec example or rec AI or whatever you wanna call it um, as far as the notebook is concerned. Okay, so the first thing I need to do is I need to bring in my data. I'm gonna go ahead and cancel out uh, any existing running ones that I have. And the data I want to bring in are from my export rating dataset task and my export movies dataset task, right? So this notebook is completely designed for those two uh, datasets, the datasets that come as a result of those projects, right? So in order for me to do this, I have to run a recent one, of course. Now I already have, and it's in my local CDN exports here. And we've got it right here and right here. So I wanna bring this data over into my project here, okay? So to do this, of course, I'm just gonna run a few cells here. I don't need to install all of the uh, requirements or dependencies for this at this time. Of course, if there are any requirement issues or dependency issues, please go to the repo itself, start a discussion on it, um, and just let us know there so we can actually diagnose that. You can also fork and actually solve the issue if you want. Uh, but just go ahead and let us know if there's something wrong with these packages where this notebook no longer works. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and run this cell with shift enter. And now this is really the key part is getting our data uh, you know, folders in here. And so if I run this, what I've got is exists being false and false, right? So neither one of those data sets actually exists, which is no surprise. And the exports dir is actually not the one I wanna use. I'll go ahead and get rid of that and use this main one here, just a little bit more relative to this folder. And all I'm gonna do is say movies exports and make dir, and we'll go ahead and say parent or parents okay being true and exist okay being true as well. And actually this is gonna be dot parent as well. And then I'll go ahead and copy this and do the same thing for my movies, run that, and that should actually create the necessary folders in here uh, for this. And, oh, actually we don't need parents okay, but rather just parents. So used to writing exists okay. Um, and if I refresh in here, I should actually see that those two different folders now. 
Of course, they don't actually have the data set. So let's go ahead and bring that in as well. So in my local project with that exported data set, I'll go ahead and reveal this data here and I'll just drag it on over. And this is certainly one of the problems or challenges of using Colab is these data sets are gonna go away. On one hand, that's actually kind of good because that means that I should be aware of the export itself. So I should be using the actual latest one, uh, but it's also kind of annoying when you're experimenting with things. But anyways, with that in mind, let's go ahead and run everything on here. And we'll just talk about it as it's running. Just generally speaking, what's going on at a high level. First off, we load in our movie's data frame. I made a trending column just for, you know, looking at what are the top movies that I sort of recommended uh, in this like popular thing that we did on our, on our page here. Something similar to this, not exactly the same, but very similar. Uh, and, and that's essentially what's happening there. And we can see that data, right? And it has the movie IDX field. If you remember that one, that's just giving us that continuous order for the movie, which is going to be important in this particular um, notebook itself or this particular training. Um, next up, we take a look at the ratings data frame. This, of course, is our ratings. So these ratings are going to be from basically from one to five. There won't be zero. There won't be 0.5. It'll just be whole numbers there. Next, of course, we're going to go ahead and take that. And then we actually join these two data frames together with the ratings. So really what I'm doing here is just enriching the ratings data set for any given user. So it has all of that other stuff in there, as we see here. So we've got a bunch of users, the movie IDs, the ratings, and then the movie IDs that are corresponding here. Now, if you remember back to when we initially had to solve this problem, we had a bunch of movies missing. That's no different now. So if I actually take a look here, I still have a good amount of movies missing. Uh, it looks like I already dropped them, but uh, the point being that I can actually uh, come back in here and run that all over again. And we would actually see that there's almost 3,000 movies missing. And then from there, we have you know 68,000 movies total after the missing ones are gone. Like we get rid of the missing ones and now we have almost you know 70,000 movies of the original uh, let's see, 81,000 that we had in here as far as ratings are concerned. So I said movies, I meant ratings of movies, of course. And so we scroll down a little bit. This is where we actually encode uh, the user IDs. So the point of this is to make sure that the users have corresponding like index numbers that are continuous. So it starts at zero, one, two, three, and so on, just like we did with the movie IDX. We need the same thing with our users. Now, the reason we have the movie IDX one is so that I can actually store this in the database. Not, It doesn't so much matter where the user lies on this other than for the training purposes. So when it comes to training neural networks, it's better to have these continuous IDs essentially than discontinuous ones. So you have to have these as continuous. If the movie IDs weren't continuous, then you'd want to change that. And the reason I have movie IDX in here is so it's just really easy to update our database. That's kind of the point or look it up in our database as well versus having it all stuck here in, uh, you know, some sort of notebook that doesn't give us a whole lot of insight there. But if we scroll down, we've got 671 users, not very many users, but certainly enough to get some sort of value coming out of here. That value, of course, is, well, not great. It's not nearly as many data points that we might want, but it's certainly enough. We almost have 70,000 there. Anyways, so we've got our minimum rating and maximum rating like we already discussed. Next up, what we do is we actually um, normalize the data and then we split it up into a training data set and a validation data set. Now, what we're training is the user, the movie, and then what we're training those data points on are what they actually rated. Now, if you remember back to when we talked about the user and movie and more specifically collaborative filtering, we talked about these hidden features, these hidden features, like whether or not they're an actor or like a specific actors in it, or it's a specific genre like action or sci-fi. We talked about all of those features. So the purpose of this training is to actually figure out mathematically speaking, at least figure out what those features would be. Those are called latent features. And so what we end up doing is we break apart all of our data sets into a training data set and a validation data set. 
We use the training data set to find what those latent features are. Those latent features are then tested against the validation data set to see how we're doing essentially over time. Um, so it's actually pretty, pretty interesting as far as the details are concerned. But again, I'm not going to go into this too much here uh, other than this high level, like I just said. Uh, next up, we have the actual model itself. So, so the actual Keras model, this is going to be how we would end up doing this, which is first off the embedding size. This is that, you know, number of features that we think might be in here. So the number of features might be five. It might be five features for a user, five features for a movie. And those features, the hidden features or the latent features are what we're trying to figure out. If there was only five, then, you know, perhaps it would be really easy to predict what the user's um, actual rating is or what a movie might do with that user. So if we said 500, that means that there's basically 500 hidden attributes of each one of these things that we are trying to figure out with this model. Of course, you and I are doing it. The model is doing it for us, right? It's going to do all this complex math for us on the GPU to try and figure out what those features are to ultimately give us uh, those ratings. And in this case, it's normalized ratings, but to, to just basically guess what those ratings would be. And then over time, it's going to continue to do some math to just change them a little bit like like dials on a you know a big machine with a bunch of dials essentially um, is going to eventually find out the best sort of algorithm that we could have when we just put in a user id and we just put in a movie id it will then spit out the predicted rating based off of all of those latent features as well as what's trained in the neural network um, there's a lot more to it than that and a lot of examples to help clarify it uh, but that's essentially what's happening here there's also a little bit of bias involved just to make sure that it's not training too much to the specific data. Um, and then we compile it and we use the um, mean squared error as the loss metric, right? So we want to minimize that as much as possible. So mean squared error, there's other kinds of loss that you could try out. You can experiment with the learning rate as well. So the things that you might want to experiment with are the embedding size, the learning rate, and the loss. I would recommend sticking with the mean squared error loss itself. I think that's probably the better one. Um, you can also uh, experiment with the activation function at the end. So you can have the output being uh, ReLU or Sigmoid. I think Sigmoid overall performs better for collaborative filtering. But again, there's a lot of details that we're not going to talk about right now. Next up, here's the model summary. Um, so we've got a lot of data that's going on in here. And this basically just shows us what we just looked at essentially. But the main thing being there's almost 3 million parameters that we're going to be training or rather right here. And so that's pretty interesting. That means 3 million parameters we're training. We, you know, as human beings would never probably be able to train that many on our own. Next up, we actually do the split um, again. Looks like I looks like I did it twice, which was not necessary at all. <laughs> which is funny, but anyway, so we do the split down here and then we actually train the model and we do a number of epochs and also a batch size. So the batch size is sort of a function of the training size and you could absolutely do it as a function of the training size. So in this case, the training size is fairly large. So a batch size of 200 will take a little bit longer. If you do a batch size of 20, it'll take even longer than that. However, if you did a batch size of a thousand, this training would go a little bit faster. Uh, that, that, I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into how fast it ends up going. I would say the lower the batch size is, the more likely you'll start to see it converge on overfitting, making it too much close to the uh, the actual training data. That's not always true, of course. Uh, there's a number of reasons for that. But in any case, you want to experiment. That's another number that you could experiment with. Uh, you could also experiment with the number of epochs, as in number of training sessions, as it essentially does on the whole data set, the whole, like all of the batches and all that. And so what we see here in our training is we see the mean absolute error or the MAE, what we set or the MSE mean absolute squared error. Uh, we see the loss going down, right? That's this right here. Um, so the mean absolute error is also going down. So both of them are going down, but the validation loss and the validation mean absolute error are staying the same. Um, they don't really change from the previous one which likely shows us that we're actually overfitting to this data, even though the training seems to be improving quite a bit. So the loss started kind of high and then it went down kind of low. But the loss is already 
kind of low. So that's actually pretty interesting. Now, I think one of the ways we could solve or improve that would be to have just simply a lot more data that could absolutely help us with this so that our validation set is quite a bit bigger as well as our uh, training set too. I mean, there's another, uh, like I said, all those other things that I mentioned that you can play around with could also help with that training. But really going back to our service, how accurate does the recommendation need to be? Not really that accurate. I mean, it'd be nice if it was more and more accurate and that's something that you'd want to work towards. But right off the bat, our surprise ML, who knows how actually accurate it is, right? I don't think we even talked about those metrics, um, which would be important, of course, to improve it. But the idea is, we didn't spend a lot of time on that accuracy as much more about how do we get the users to be in here and actually rating stuff and all that. Anyways, so back to the model itself. This is a example of the predictions here, right? So what I can do now is actually run predictions. And what we do, what we have to do is we get all of those user index IDs, right? So not the actual, uh, not the actual uh, database ID itself, but rather the continuous ID here. We get a list of those. Now I just stuck it to one single user. So df.sample gives you a random number of uh, data sets that you set, or, or not random, but a somewhat random selection inside of our data frame. And then we could do that with our movies as well. And we could do it based off of a certain number. So this is the same user repeated a hundred times. This is a hundred different movies. And then we do a prediction based off of those two arrays. So those are the two inputs. And then the result of that gives us in um, a specific order, which I'll mention in a second, gives us a prediction for these. The specific order of the prediction is literally the order of the array as it comes in, which I think makes a lot of sense. Uh, it does also correspond to the order of the user, but those two kind of correspond together. And that's why I like using one single user because I know exactly what user it is then. And then also going out for the movies. So if I were to do this in production, I would go, you know, movie by movie or, or rather user by user with a list of movies uh, potentially, or like we did in the recommender with surprise ML, go by each movie and then have, have the users go in there as well. So a lot of different ways on how you could do this prediction efficiently in batch on production uh, in our project. So after it goes through those predictions, this is a little bit better of a look at what those predictions end up being in an actual data table. So what I do here is I get the actual stored database user ID based off of that user list. That stored ID is, you know, user ID as what we did with our data set. Um, and then I got a score based off the index value of any given movie. I'll explain that in a second. Uh, so I grab the movie's data frame for this to grab the user ID and the score, the rating that we give them. So this is the suggestions. This is very similar to the data frame we used to, to actually train everything, but now it's just specific to one, one user and this one single uh, you know, session or batch of movies that we're predicting. So what's happening here is we are actually enumerating through each one of the movies in here. Um, so this actual list of movies inside of this data frame, we're iterating through all of them, which is what's happening with this. And then we're using the index value or whatever value it is uh, to get what the prediction is. And so basically this right here is essentially this right here. It just happens to be setting it to an actual column itself. So if that's complicated, if this part right, right here is complicated, just think of it like this, where it's grabbing the prediction based off of the iteration that it's in. And then whatever that first value is, because it's only gonna be one thing, it gives us those predictions. And we can see this better visualized when I come down a little bit more. Uh, this is the visualization of that based off of the score itself. So the highest rated movie for this particular user, which will be the same user all throughout, is whatever this movie is. Never heard of it. I've heard of Legends of the Fall, and that's another high rated movie for this particular user, right? And so if we actually scroll up a little bit, the reason I have this is to see a spread as to what this user has rated already. So if they only if their mean value is like 4.5 and then I get a bunch of 1.2s in here, I'm going to go ahead and say that that's probably not a great model and I need to rethink how things are done. Um, and so that's pretty much it. That's like where we would leave it. I mean, there's a lot more analysis that we could do and talk about and uh, things that I'm not going to cover right now. There are resources on this post or rather this notebook itself 
at the very top. Here's some resources that you can learn more about improving this because there's definitely a lot to it. Um, and then of course, to actually use this in our Django project, we would save this model, use this model in on our CPU, which we probably could do, use the save model. And then we would have to do a prediction um, very similar to like what we did up here. It would actually have to predict things like this. So it's getting the a user list, just IDs of users encoded, right? Based off of all other users and then actually going uh, with the array of movies that we wanna run predictions on. Um, so I'll let you experiment with that. I think that's actually a really good challenge from here is to essentially take everything on this notebook, take it from a saved model and then run that. There's a lot of research on how to load in a Keras saved model. And I think it's a really good challenge if you've never done it. Okay, so that's it for this one. Now I breeze through this and I think there's a lot more we could talk about. And in fact, we go into a lot of detail here, including like just building a neural network from scratch so that we understand the embeddings and all the latent features and all that stuff, not necessarily in TensorFlow and Keras, but rather just in NumPy or, or, or some other sort of data analysis that doesn't require us to use a uh, framework that already exists for creating neural networks. That would be an interesting topic. And if you are interested in seeing that, go into the discussions here, let me know, start a new discussion, find another one, let me know if that's something that you'd be super interested in seeing on how we could build just the next level of this recommendation engine. Because as it stands right now, without the neural network, I still think this is actually pretty solid for recommendations. The one thing I would probably add to this would be content-based recommendations. So actually reading what's in any given content and sort of combining the collaborative filtering with the content-based recommendation engine. Um, but that of course is definitely outside the scope of this series. So if you are interested in that as well, let me know. Otherwise, thanks for watching. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Hopefully you got a lot out of this one. I wanna leave you with a massive challenge and that is getting this into production. Now, the way I recommend you put it into production is by using Kubernetes. And Kubernetes is, well, a bit challenging because there's several layers to getting it going there. Now, the reason I think Kubernetes is because you'll have to learn several technologies that are really important. Number one is Docker and actually containerizing your application. Number two is likely Git or version control. Number three is gonna be GitHub Actions that kind of glues together using Git to store your code on a repository a remote repository on a website, and then also Docker to actually build containers. So GitHub Actions can do both things, uh, which is fantastic. And then once you are able to understand those things, then you're gonna move into actually deploying on Kubernetes. Now, the reason we learn how to do this is because we have at least two processes that need to run at varying scales, right? So we have our Django web application that perhaps that needs to get really, really big really quickly. Then we have our Celery application, which might need to run in small batches all the time. Remember all that inference that we had. So we might have to have 10 different versions of Celery working on the different batches. Now coordinating a system like that is no small challenge. So getting to that point is gonna be an excellent undertaking of really building up your skills. Now on the other side of this is, is more things with machine learning and maybe looking for third party APIs that can actually provide recommendations based off of completely different criteria than what we did with collaborative filtering. That also might be a really interesting challenge to take as well. Thanks again for watching. I hope to see you again in the future. Let me know if there's something that you wished that would have been in this course that wasn't because extensions to this course probably should happen as in like little side quests for the recommender course. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.